President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as shown on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals to meet as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, further consideration in committee of the whole of a message from the House of Representatives in relation to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 3, Bill 2019. So the committee is considering that message and the motion is that the committee not insist on its amendments. I'm going to put that motion. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Cormann, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the aye. ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Thank you. 
stop the bells. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order, there being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'm now looking for a motion that the resolution be reported. Senator Cormann? I move that uh, the motion be reported. Okay. So the question is that the resolution be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered message number 218 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 3 Bill of 2019 and has resolved to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Senator Cormann. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we're up to the next item of business. Uh, call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two. Treasury laws amendment, your superannuation, your choice bill, 2019, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the superannuation laws amendment, your superannuation, your choice bill, 2019, on behalf of the opposition. Labor governments established universal compulsory superannuation, creating a world-class retirement income system for Australia. There is now over $2.5 trillion in our national saving pool, a direct consequence of the success of this system. The system gives working Australians the opportunity to maintain their living standards in retirement. It takes pressure off pension payments and, critically, critical to remember at this time, the national savings pool is an incredibly important source of financial stability. It was an important factor in ensuring that Australia's banking system was well capitalised during the global financial crisis. And now, again, the nation's industry superannuation funds are ready to deploy more than $28 billion to worthy infrastructure and property product projects as the economy starts to emerge from the COVID-19 lockdown. 
You wouldn't know it from the behaviour of the government, their continued petty ideological attacks on the system continue unabated, despite the evidence of the significance of the system at this critical economic time for Australia. Unlike the coalition, Labor is unequivocally committed to the success of Australia's superannuation system, and we are committed to supporting changes that will make it stronger and fairer. As presently presented to the Senate, this bill does not yet meet that test. This is a bill with a long history. The government have been attempting to make these changes for a long time, but the changes are still no more appealing than they were five years ago. This is a measure that was first announced on 20 October 2015 in the government's response to the financial systems inquiry. And the bill reintroduces amendments to the Act that were previously introduced last parliament in 2017. That bill, shed, uh, the Treasury Laws Amendment Improving Accountability and Member Outcomes in Superannuation Measures No. 2 bill, was not brought on for debate in the Senate prior to the 2019 election. The bill before us today amends the Superannuation Guarantee Administration Act 1992 to require that employees under workplace determinations or enterprise agreements have an opportunity to choose the superannuation fund for their compulsory employer contributions. And the measure applies to new workplace determinations or enterprise agreements made on or after July 1, 2020. I understand that the government considered and rejected applying these same provisions retrospectively on the grounds that such a change would go too far. Well, Labor says that the changes in this bill still go too far. In part, our position is a response to the evidence that was placed before the Senate Economic Committee when the bill was referred uh, to that committee for inquiry and report in November 2019. The committee finished its work and reported in March this year. Most of the evidence focused on whether or not the bill would have a positive or a negative impact on members by allowing individual choice of superannuation fund. In general, unsurprisingly, submitters supported the broad principle of choice. However, the submissions raised important questions about the practical effects of the legislation on choice and on the overall effectiveness of the system. At the start of any policy process, it's important to ask the question, what problem are we trying to solve? Unfortunately, that basic impulse is not reflected in much of the legislation that is brought before this chamber by the government when it comes to superannuation. Once you've asked that question, it's always good to actually try and clearly define the problem. But in the case of the legislation before us, as with so many previous interventions by this ideological government, it's not exactly clear what problem the government is trying to solve. Industry Super brought it to the committee's attention that most workers do in fact currently have a choice of fund, citing its 2017 analysis of a sample of enterprise agreements ratified by the Fair Work Commission. They found that 82 per cent of all employees covered by agreements had no restriction on choice of fund and that only 1.9 per cent of the workforce had some form of restriction. The government is yet to clearly explain how changing this system will materially improve the results for individual members or the system overall. The second issue arises uh, from concern. Uh, uh, sorry, the second issue concerns the way in which workers make choices about their interests within workplaces. The McHale Institute made the argument that if passed, the bill would effectively inhibit one form of choice, collective or group choice, in favour of another, individual choice without clear evidence that the latter is more effective in driving better outcomes. The McKell Institute also argued that it will put more Australians at risk of ending up in an underperforming fund and limit mechanisms for ensuring ongoing accountability of and improved performance by superannuation funds. They are reflecting on the practical experience, which is that the industry superannuation funds have performed very strongly over the history of superannuation. And in this regard, collective choice in the real world has been connected to positive performance. It's a reality the government doesn't like to acknowledge because of their highly ideological approach, which prioritises their hostility to worker representation on boards 
over the empirical evidence about performance. But I don't think they should ignore it in this case. The Australian Council of Trade Unions also opposes the bill on similar grounds. In the committee process, it argued that the bill is an attack on workers' rights to collectively bargain for a superannuation fund in their interests. And it abolishes the ability for workers and their employers to agree to specific benefits only available with single fund workplaces. Industry Super also argued for the role of the Fair Work Commission in the system uh, to ensure the quality and appropriateness of funds to receive, that receive superannuation choices uh, contributions on behalf of employees who do not exercise an individual choice. Latest dissenting report to the committee's report affirmed our broad commitment to principles around choice, and it made two substantive recommendations for amendments, along with a third recommendation concerning the bill as a whole. The first of these relates to the issue of defined benefit superannuation schemes. And that recommendation arises most directly from the evidence presented by Unisuper. Unisuper believes it is one of the only open private sector defined benefit funds, and certainly I'm not aware of any other. Their scheme is essentially entirely dependent on maintaining a very broad take-up across multiple employers within a sector defined by relatively high levels of continuity of employment for staff. Now, these are relatively unique circumstances for employees in higher education. Uh, in the world of academic research and teaching, uh, these staff frequently spend a career transferring between institutions, undertaking broadly similar, similar roles and experiencing broadly similar working conditions. And that membership profile gives Unisuper the ability and the stability that allows them to actuarially underwrite a defined benefit scheme. There is no government or employer guarantee to provide protection for members. So the effect of this bill is to move arrangements for new employees from opt-out to opt-in, and this presents particular risks to Unisuper's product. Unisuper described the risk as being grounded in the impact on the salary growth profile of new members and the way in which skewing the average age of new defined benefit scheme members might occur, and that in turn could jeopardise their ability to provide the product. As a consequence, Labor recommended uh, in the committee process and has proposed amendments here to ensure the current exemption from the choice of fund requirements for existing defined benefit, bem defined benefit members continues and an exemption for those who are newly eligible to become defined benefit members is provided for in the legislation. The second recommendation contained in Labor's dissenting report goes to the heart of the topic of this bill, choice. Our amendment is about ensuring that workers retain the choice to bargain for a single fund or set of funds where it is determined by the Fair Work Commission that it is in their interest to do so. This is about protecting workers and the rights of workers to collectively determine what is in their best interests. The amendments drafted in response to this recommendation will ensure that if an enterprise agreement includes a restriction on the choice of superannuation fund or funds available to employees, the Fair Work Commission must be satisfied that the restriction is in the interests of the employees who will be covered by the agreement. This enables consideration of the factors that are essential to the proper functioning of our superannuation system and the protection of workers and members, including safeguards against underpayment and uh, features of proposed default superannuation funds, including matters such as insurance. The final recommendation in the dissenting report is that the bill be passed subject to Labor's proposed amendments. That remains our position. At the beginning of my contribution, I spoke of Labor's proud history in building the modern system of superannuation in Australia. This is not a history that we share with many of those opposite. For decades now, the coalition in opposition and in government has worked to undermine and dismantle a system that has helped bring security and dignity to Australians in retirement. It has reduced the burden on the social security system and it has supported our national prosperity. Prior to the reforms of the Hawke and Keating government, superannuation was not something that was widely enjoyed across the community. It was reserved for those who were privileged by their circumstances, usually only highly paid white collar workers. Very few women were included in the superannuation system. And our reforms changed all this. They opened up superannuation to many more people. And they also opened up the capacity for this sector to invest. 
Yet those opposite consistently seek to oppose and undermine this system. On this occasion, Labor is suggesting sensible amendments, sensible amendments to address the real-world challenges presented to the committee during our deliberations. With the support of the Senate, these amendments can substantially improve the legislation. Without them, the only option is to oppose the bill. Thank you, Senator McAllison. Those are amendments to be moved in committee. They're not second reading. Thank you. Senator Bragg. Well, I start this contribution by reflecting upon the last contribution, and there are a lot of smart people in this parliament, including occasionally across the aisle. But this is one of the places where the Labor Party has absolute decay, decay of the brain. I mean, some of the, uh, the suggestions made here around reducing you know, public costs, I mean, the, the super system costs so much more than, than it saves. I'm not sure how you can even begin to pretend that it, it is a, a net save to the government. In fact, the last intergenerational report said that super uh, would effectively you know, not really make any difference on pension reliance ever. I mean, you've got 70 per cent of people taking a pension today, and that's the same in 2050. So uh, this, there's a lot of mythology here uh, in this space. And being lectured about ide ideological, I'm not sure, carries much weight in this space. Um, I mean, coming in here and re reciting what the unions say, what the industry super funds say, and what, what Mikel says, I mean, they're all the same people. Uh, and they're all effectively benefiting from this scheme, uh, which has enriched their organisations. So, uh, I mean, the main point here about super is it is a very good idea. The idea of uh, over the long run people taking more responsibility and having savings uh, to rely on in retirement to improve their standard of living, uh, something which is universal, that is a great idea. The, the, the problem with the scheme is it has been run to benefit the vested interests and it doesn't actually work. So, um, in terms of any reasonable judgment you can make here, uh, is it going to reduce the, uh, the burden on the public purse going forward? No. I mean, in this year alone, the scheme costs $36 billion. Uh, the last time the industry uh, said we're going to put a number on how much we're saving, uh, that's, they said it would, it would save $9 billion. So you're $25 billion out, um, noting that's an imprecise uh, comparison. But I mean, the idea is good. The execution has been so poor. And why would we be surprised when you go back and you look at the history of this scheme? It was designed by the unions for the unions. I mean, Peter Walsh, who was the Labor Finance Minister, said this scheme will be a pot of gold for the unions who will get their feet into, into funds management. I mean, that is exactly what it's done. And it has been a, uh, a significant uh, failure so far. So, enterprise agreements is a place where the decay is really on show. Now, effectively, the way this works is big business and big unions get into bed together and they say, OK, we're going to take away the workers' rights to choose their own fund. Now, if you go back to uh, the middle of the Howard government, when super fund choice was passed by the Senate after protracted negotiations, the, I think it was the assistant treasurer then, Mal Bruff, said, well, this is a deal that will give uh, all working Australians choice of fund. The problem is, of course, uh, we're back here again 15 years later talking about the same issue. You know why? Because that bill had a loophole in it which has been ruthlessly exploited by big business and big unions. Now, one of the things I did before I came into this place was work for the Business Council of Australia, and that gave me a, a fair, fair proximity to big business. So this is not about saying that all the union guys are bad and the big business people are great. Uh, this is a deal where big business and big unions get into bed together uh, to rort workers. Uh, and obviously, you know, Mr Shorten was good at this um, on penalty rates, but equally, I mean, taking away workers' right to choose their own fund um, can only be for a devious purpose. I mean, why on earth would we, in 2020, say, OK, you, you're not allowed to choose your own super fund? It is just bizarre. And the fact that the Labor Party will defend this uh, anachronism really shows the, the, the huge decay on, sh on show here. I mean, I'm sure that if most Labor members and senators looked at this on its merits, without the vested interests polluting their policy discussions, they would say, of course we want to give every Australian the right to choose their own super fund, because we want to uh, allow them to determine their own destiny. 
So the way this works is the big businesses and the big unions get into bed together, they do these secret deals, um, and then all of a sudden you find that workers have no, no ability to choose their own super fund. So, so the government passes a law and says, you, the workers of Australia, must save 10% you know, of your wages in a super fund, uh, but uh, most of you can choose your own fund, except for people that are covered by enterprise agreements which steal your right to choose your own fund. Now, I mentioned this was an anachronism, but in fact I've got here three agreements from this year, 2020. One for the uh, Warrnambool Bus and Roadways Company, another one for the Super Benefits Administration Company, and one here for Smart Metering Services. Now, all these examples have stolen these workers' rights to choose their own funds. So the Warrnambool Bus EBA says TWU Super and Aussie Super are the only funds that are uh, permissible. The, the Super Benefits Administration Company uh, say the first super fund is the only fund it can go to, that's a CFMEU fund. And then this other one, Smart Metering Energy, uh, they're saying Energy Super is the only fund, that's the only fund that these workers are legally allowed to contribute to. They can't choose any other fund. It is not possible. So you've got to ask yourself why. Why, why would these organisations, why would the IR Club be trying to steal workers' rights to choose their own super fund? After all, it is their money. And of course, uh, we are suspicious on this side of uh, the reason. Now, there have been several independent inquiries into this issue. Now, this is not some ideological journey. I mean, the, the Royal Commission into Trade Unions, the Murray Financial Inquiry, and even the Senate inquiries have said there is no basis. There is no basis for workers to be banned from choosing their own fund. Worse, there is no basis for people to have their, their super fund choices stolen. So, as I say, you have to ask why. Now, there's been, helpfully, some whistleblowers who have come out and have tried to choose their own funds. So there is a fellow called Paul Bracegirdle who was a toll truck driver and he wanted to choose his own super fund. He didn't want to be with the TWU super fund. And he told the, uh, the Royal Commission uh, that uh, he was legally denied and told by the union official to fuck off. No one cares, Paul. Go um, away. Senator Bragg, you need to withdraw that. There is a decision of the Senate that you cannot quote offensive It's language. from a Royal Commission. I, I'm, don't argue with me. I've asked you to withdraw. I, I withdraw. Thank you. Uh, go away, he was told. So there you go. Now, um, so he wasn't able to pursue that any, any further. Um, now then, there's another fellow here who is a uh, Unisuper uh, member, and he has said, this, his name is uh, Luke, Luke Zhao, and he, he said, due to provisions in the New South Wales, uh, University of New South Wales Enterprise Agreement, Casual staff employed by the university are unable to exercise choice of fund, being compelled to contribute to Unisuper. This is highly detrimental to my peers as they are often confused as to why they are defaulted into two super funds which automatically deduct two sets of fees and insurance premiums." End quote. Now, Mr. Mr Zhu and Mr Bracegirdle are rare beasts. They are whistleblowers. They have sought to try and break the monopoly on these ridiculous uh, anti-choice provisions, but they haven't really had any success because the, uh, the system, the IR system, has been against them for, it's now effectively 30 years we've had this system. So this is now an opportunity to right these wrongs. Now, now the returns in a lot, of these, a lot of these funds, which are compulsory for workers, have often been, been uh, you know, far less good than some of the uh, more widely used funds. So the TWU super fund, uh, which has been uh, ruthlessly put into these enterprise agreements, as we saw in the case of, of Toll and Miss, Mr. Uh, Bracegirdle, I mean that that has uh, you know, returned uh, far less than the average uh, industry super fund, like Australian super. So again, you've got to ask yourself why are they trying to stop people from choosing their own funds? Now the payments to the unions from these uh, large industry super funds are significant. TWU Super has paid TWU $8.6 million over the last 10 years, and the CBUS Fund has paid $14 million to the CFMEU over the last 10 years. So very significant contributions. 
Now, the, the super funds are on track to pay $31 million a year by 2030 to the unions, which is just an extraordinary sum of money. So you've got to uh, come to the conclusion that this is all about money and power and patronage. It can't be about anything else, because if unions are there for workers uh, and the super funds are there for workers, then why are they letting them choose their own fund? So it's got to be about the cash. It has to be. Now, the Labor Party's positions on this have been you know, absolute you know, intellectual rust bucket stuff. Uh, now, Andrew Lee here has said, who's one of the, the shadow uh, Treasury spokesmen, uh, Labor will reserve our position on these proposed choice of fund changes until the Senate committee has reported. Okay? Senate committee has reported. Um, and the Labor senators said in their report, this is a great quote, Quote, superannuation remains an evolving industry, and Labor senators believe that careful consideration should be given to how opening up choice of fund might preclude other innovative product <laughs> offerings if the risk pooling of membership cannot be achieved. So we're going to have less competition and then we're going to have more innovation. That sounds great, doesn't it? So the, the Soviet <coughs> Union is back, back in business and they are writing the economic policies of the Labor Party. In fact, if only it were you know, a, a fair comparison. I mean, the, the fact is this is all about money and ideology. And to come in here and to listen to these absurd contributions from the other side saying that we are being ideological, we just want to give people their choices. We want to let people choose their own fund. We think that it's 2020 and that it, the whole idea of being able to choose a consumer product has been well and truly made. And in fact, across the board, our government is prosecuting open, openness and competition, open banking, open energy, open telecommunications. We want people to choose to get a better deal because that is, that is, the, that is, that is the way that the market needs to go because we don't think that people have been getting a great deal from the super funds. Uh, we've had the same view about banking, we've had the same view about telco, we've had the same view about energy. So we are moving into open super, open banking. Open telco. Now, the idea that a compulsory product like super, which is compulsory, would be a product where people have their choice of fund rights stolen by big unions and big businesses working in the shadows is absolutely absurd. And uh, you know, if people—I mean, people don't understand super very well. It, it is an op opaque and darkened industry. Um, it is worked on the basis that people. Uh, don't have the time or don't have the energy to understand all, the, all its intricacies. And that is a sickness. It is a real sickness. And that is why, uh, you know, when you think about the, the amount of money at stake here, yes, we spend $36 billion a year in foregone tax revenue, right? Which is a cost to bomb this system and gets basically no one off the pension. But the, perhaps the most insidious numbers are the fees charged. I mean, $32 billion a year in fees. People, pe people in this country spend more on super fees than they do on power bills. I mean, it is, it is just ridiculous. So I just wanted to conclude on this, this point that, uh, I mean, if only people understood super better, then I don't think Labor would be arguing against people choosing. I think they're using the cover of people not really engaging with super to argue this ridiculous position that, um, for some reason, people should not be allowed to choose their own fund. So I, I urge the Labor Party to reconsider your ridiculous and unsustainable position on this issue. Now, the, uh, the, the John Berger uh, example I wanted to just finish on, which is the TWU fellow, Now he, he went uh, before the Royal Commission and it was put to him that he, um, he had charged the TWU super fund 50% uh, of his $190 thousand dollar salary for five days of consulting work, five days. And he was questioned about this by the commission and he said, well, that's the maths. So $93,000 for five days work. So this is a great scheme if you can get into it. And Labor are running a racket for their mates in the unions so they can charge high fees, they can lock in the workers and they can rot the system and pay people like Mr Berger 93 grand for five days work, right? It is just ridiculous. So. Uh, you know, one of the things that our government is trying to do is to encourage all parties to work in the na national interest, which is why we've invited the ACTU to come round the table and look at some of the intractable changes in the industrial system. Now, this is the same thing I, I would you know, ask the Labor Party and urge the Labor Party to look at this in the same spirit that we are looking to engage 
the ACTU in, that if you look beyond your own narrow self-interest and the interests of the Mikel and the unions and industry super, all the people that Senator McAllister mentioned before, and you look at the national interest, you will see very clearly that there is no, there is no possible reason for you to de deny the workers of Australia their own choices. There is no possible basis for that, so I commend this bill to the House. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, yet another highly ideo ideological contribution from the anti-superannuation ideologue himself, Senator Bragg. Um, it's interesting watching some of the newer senators in this chamber, how they seek to make their mark on the chamber and in the wider debate. At one end of the spectrum, you have Senator Stoker out there making appalling comments, uh, likening the Queensland Premier's actions to the death of George Floyd. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got Senator Bragg out there waging his ideological war on superannuation. It seems that with every year and every intake of senators in this chamber, uh, the drift of the Liberal Party to the right just continues on so many fronts. Uh, and we've seen it again from Senator Bragg now. Uh, and shortly I'll mention some of the other contributions, if you, can call, if you can call it that, from Liberal Party senators on the debate regarding superannuation. Uh, superannuation is a great Australian achievement. It is a great Labor achievement. From the very beginning, Labor has pushed for superannuation with the sole purpose of giving working <laughs> Australians a dignified retirement. And in contrast, from the very beginning, we have seen the Liberal Party and the National Party fight tooth and nail to stop superannuation, to whittle it away and to abolish it. And there can be no other reason for them wanting to continue that ideological war than they want to deny working Australians the dignified retirement that many people who are wealthier in our community get to enjoy. Well, I don't support that, and nor does anyone on the Labor side. We believe that no matter what your circumstances in life, you are entitled to a dignified retirement, and superannuation has become a core way of guaranteeing that all Australians, no matter what walk of life they are from, get that dignified retirement that they are entitled to. A dignified retirement should not be the sole preserve of people who live in Potts Point or Mossman or some of the wealthier suburbs of our capital cities. A dignified reti retirement should be the entitlement of every single Australian, whether you live in the inner city of our capital cities, whether you live in the outer suburbs or whether you live in our regions. No matter who you are, no matter what work you do, no matter what circumstances you come from, you should be able to enjoy a dignified retirement. And that's why Labor will always stand for superannuation and why we will always stand against the ideological attacks of people like Senator Bragg as they seek to undermine superannuation and as they seek to undermine Australians' entitlement to a dignified retirement. Now, I am supportive of this bill and Labor is supportive of this bill. It will bring forward the rule for non-concessional superannuation contributions and allow those at ages 65 and 66 to make up three years of non-concessional superannuation contributions, rather than stopping at age 64, which is inconsistent with the pension age. Labor has a very proud track record when it comes to superannuation. As I said, Labor delivered superannuation, and we will always support and fight for policy that enables Australian workers to have a stronger superannuation balance and to have security and dignity in their retirement. Now, in contrast, those opposite have shown they hold no respect for our superannuation system and have repeatedly attempted to undermine it. As I said, they opposed it at the beginning. They have opposed increases to it. They have sought every possible measure to try to undermine it and take it away from people. And The net result of that is that only the wealthy in our community get a dignified retirement, and that is something that we are not about whatsoever on this side of the chamber. Now, let's refresh people's memories about some of the other things that, we, that Liberal senators have had to say about superannuation just in recent times. In July last year, in his first uh, attempt to make a name for himself in this chamber, Senator Bragg, in his first speech, uh, made the point that superannuation should be voluntary. 
uh, and that by doing so it would save the government money. I think I just heard Senator uh, Canavan uh, yell out, here, here. So it seems that even people who claim to represent people from Rockhampton think that superannuation should be voluntary as well. Well, Senator Canavan, I can tell you that any of the people I've met in the manufacturing sheds in Rockhampton, who you pretend to represent, they don't want to see their superannuation made voluntary. They want to see their superannuation increased, not taken away, not making voluntary. But you know, that's just another hollow attempt from Senator Canavan, who likes to dress up as a worker, but in the meantime comes down here and rips their entitlements away from them. Now, Senator Bragg said, as I say, that making superannuation voluntary would save the government money. So that tells you all you need to know about Senator Bragg's priorities and about the priorities of the Liberal Party, aided and abetted by Senator Canavan and the National Party. They are clearly more worried about the bottom line of the Australian budget and pennies and cents than about the retirement savings of millions of Australians. And again, we say on this side of the achievement we are for working Australians. We don't have to dress up in, in outfits like Senator Canavan does and try and pretend that he never worked for the Productivity Commission uh, uh, with a big free market ideology. We don't need to disown our past. We know that from day one we have always been for superannuation. We don't need to put out silly memes that pretend that we look like a manufacturing worker because we actually act in the interests of manufacturing workers by making sure they have fair paying conditions while they are in the workforce and making sure that they get the dignified retirement that they're entitled to through superannuation. Now, Senator Bragg, along with other coalition MPs, Mr Tim Wilson, uh, Mr Craig Kelly, Mr Jason Polinski and Mr Andrew Hastie, and of course our old friends in this chamber, Queensland Liberal Senators Amanda Stoker and Gerard Rennick, have also argued against increasing compulsory employer superannuation contributions from 9.5% to 12% between 2021 and 2025. Now, the spurious argument that they always put up for this is that this would somehow reduce wage increases that Australian workers need. Well, it's the first time I've ever heard anyone on the coalition side of this chamber actually care whatsoever about wage rises for Australian workers. Every time we see a minimum wage case before the Fair Work Commission, what do we see? We see the Liberal Party and the National Party come out with their allies in big business and say why pay rises can't be granted to working people. But if all of a sudden, when it comes to superannuation, they want to say that they care about pay rises. Need I remind government senators that over the entire period that this government has been in office under their stewardship, we have seen wage rises in this country stagnate. We have seen the lowest wage rises that this country has ever seen. Um, so don't try and come in here and pretend that increasing people's superannuation is going to take away their wage rises. You're already doing it. This government is already presiding over the fact over the lowest wage rises that this country has ever seen. Now, what is it about Australians retiring with more money in their bank accounts that the Liberals and the Nationals don't like? I mean, it only gets worse from here. In November last year, Queensland Liberal Senator Gerard Rennick described superannuation as a cancer. I mean, did you have to take some sort of—it's not funny, Senator Bragg. It's not funny. You and I both know people who are dying of cancer. So to liken superannuation to a cancer is yet another grossly insensitive remark that we are seeing from Queensland Liberal senators in this chamber. Uh, Senator Rennick also um, uh, said, in fact, Senator Rennick accused his own side of politics of having selling out on personal responsibility by allowing superannuation to continue. And again, in February this year, and I think this in, occurred on one of the Sky News interviews that I sometimes do with Mr. Senator Rennick, which you know is my you know amusement and shock for the week. Uh, Senator Rennick said in that interview that he reasoned that as Australia had survived 200 years without super, uh, assuming for a moment that Australia has only survived for 200 years, uh, but that Australia had survived for 200 years without super, and that's why we didn't need to worry about making superannuation compulsory right now. What absolute garbage! What absolute rot! From Senator Rennick. Well, you know, to that I say, well, we survived nearly 200 years without Medicare. We survived over 200 years of white occupation of this country without paid parental leave. Do you think we'd actually want to get rid of those kind of things as well? We survive without the NDIS. I mean, we survive without iPhones, but they're kind of handy to have in life these days, just like superannuation is kind of handy for if you want to have a dignified retirement. So if it's good enough to get rid of superannuation because we apparently survived 200 years without, without it, 
Does that mean that the coalition also wants to get rid of Medicare, get rid of the NDIS, get rid of paid parental leave, get rid of all sorts of other benefits that Labor governments have brought into this country to actually ensure that working people, the kind of people that Senator Canavan dresses up to try and pretend he cares about, um, to make sure that they actually get a decent standard of living? Um, I don't think that the government is going to get rid of any of those things, and nor should they get rid of superannuation in the way that so many of their extreme right senators seem to be committed to doing. Even more recently, during the terrible COVID outbreak, we've seen again uh, this government uh, uh, make uh, decisions and interfere with people's retirement savings in a way that will, that will make their, them having a dignified retirement that much harder. We've seen this government allow superannuation to be used as an alternative to the government actually doing its job and making sure that working Australians and people who've lost their jobs have the support that they need to survive the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and in addition, we've also seen government action, uh, which has opened the door to people having their superannuation accounts defrauded by criminals. Thanks very much. Yet again, that's how much you care about working people. You set up a scheme uh, 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 instead of providing the support that they require, and you set up the scheme in a way that allows criminals to get in there and defraud people of their retirement savings. From the 20th of April this year, this government allowed Australians who were suffering financial hardship as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic to apply for early access to their superannuation. This scheme would allow people to access up to $20,000 over two years. Now, so far already, we've had over 2 million Australians have accessed this scheme, with over $13 billion in personal retirement savings being withdrawn. Now, I want to make clear, I make absolutely no judgment whatsoever of the individual Australians who have just made the decision to uh, access their superannuation early. But I do make a judgment of this government for forcing Australians into the position where they had so little support from this government that they were left with no choice but to go and raid their own retirement savings. I've forgotten the exact number, but there are many, many, many superannuation accounts which have actually been emptied. So people now have no, super, no retirement savings whatsoever uh, because they were forced into a position of having to access their superannuation early because this government refused to provide the support that those people needed. Now we've gone on a lot in this chamber about the fact that the government excluded well over a million casuals, short-term casuals. They excluded. Uh, Donata workers, they excluded university workers, they excluded arts and entertainment workers, they excluded migrant workers, they excluded all sorts of categories of working people from receiving the JobKeeper payment. Well, these sort of decisions have a consequence. And one of the consequences is that people are therefore left with no choice but to go and access their, early, their superannuation savings early, meaning that they have very few funds for their future retirement. And for those bean counters on the other side who are more obsessed with government budgets than about actually looking after their fellow Australians, you might want to think about that that might have some impact on the age pension down the track. If, you, if all of a sudden you're going to have all sorts of Australians without sufficient retirement savings because they've been forced to actually access their savings early, what do you think they're going to do when it comes to retirement? They're going to require the age pension. So well done. More economic illiteracy from this government that says it has economic credibility. Now, um, as, and let's not even go into JobKeeper and the bungles uh, that have been caused there that have had consequences for Australians as well. Uh, it is an absolute disgrace that the figures that we received at the COVID committee hearing uh, uh, as of the 21st of May indicated that the government had paid out $8.1 billion in JobKeeper payments, but in contrast, Australians had, had had to access over $13 billion in their own superannuation funds. So again, deliberate decisions of this government to exclude a whole, cate whole categories of workers from receiving the JobKeeper payment. Uh, have meant the government has kept its bill down, its JobKeeper bill down, and actually transferred the cost of surviving, of putting food on the table, into the hands of Australians having to, having to raid their superannuation funds early. Uh, now, this is going to impact on people's retirement. It will increase the cost of the public longer term in the form of more aged care pensions, uh, and that is a direct result of, of decisions this government has made, which have in the end been directed by its ongoing ideological war to tear down our superannuation system, a system that is the envy of the world. So many other countries around this world just wish 
that they had the sort of far-sighted Labor government that we had back in the 80s and 90s that introduced and enhanced superannuation to make sure that people did have a dignified retirement. But that's not what the Liberals want. It's not what the Nationals want. They say they care about working people. They say they care about middle Australia. But every time they come down here, they slip in more and more measures to try and take away people's superannuation rights along with their pay and conditions. Now, the, uh, we've also learned through the COVID inquiry um, that there's been wide-scale fraud committed on the early superannuation scheme. I don't have time to go into that in detail, so that might have to wait till another day. But in conclusion, compulsory superannuation created by Labor is a national achievement which sits alongside Medicare and the NDIS. These are initiatives that have made our nation stronger and our society fairer. Too many Australians still retire without adequate retirement savings and are forced to rely on sometimes uh, inadequate government pensions, which is why our superannuation system needs to be supported, strengthened and protected, not undermined. We will resist every attempt by the government Senator to do so. Watt, your time has expired. Senator Canavan. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, when I, when I came into the chamber to, to make my contribution to this bill, I did a bit of a double take because I was coming in and, and, and I thought I heard Senator Watt say that he is supportive, or the government or the Labor Party, sorry, is supportive of this bill. They're supportive of this bill. And I thought, well, that's news, that's news, because we have been trying to provide more choice uh, for Australians, more choice uh, to determine how their own money is invested for basically five years now. For five years. And the Labor Party have fought tooth and nail, tooth and nail for those five years those workers' rights to choose where their money is invested. It's a pretty simple choice to have for people to be able to choose that it's their money they've worked hard for, uh, they've accumulated. They should have some choice, you would think, over where that money is invested. Now, I thought, I thought hearing Senator Watt, that well, maybe, maybe the Labor Party have seen a light. They've, 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 they've realised five years later, after losing two elections since, that maybe, maybe if they did want to represent workers' rights, they might actually make some decisions in favour of workers, in favour of an individual worker's choice and right to decide where their money is invested and goes. Maybe they'd had that epiphany. But apparently, under, after checking with the minister's office here, I'm completely wrong. Uh, Senator Watt was trying to pull the wool over all of our eyes. The Labor Party is not supportive of this bill. They're not supportive of workers' choice. They're not supportive of individuals being able to invest the money they would like, how they would like to do it. What they're really doing, what they're really doing, is they're going to amend the bill in the committee stage, so it doesn't actually provide that choice. Uh, they can they can have a fig leaf of saying they support choice, but they're really going to try once again to deny workers their right to, to invest their own money and try to stymie this bill once again. As I said, Madam Acting Deputy President, this has been a long road. It has been a long road. Uh, trying for five years to provide something as simple as provide workers' choices. Uh, this this. This bill, this bill uh, came from uh, recommendations way back, way back that were made by the Financial System Inquiry in 2015. This was an inquiry that was established by the incoming coalition government when it was elected in 2013. Uh, a root and branch inquiry of the financial sector, I think the largest inquiry into the financial industry or sector since uh, the Campbell inquiry in the early 1980s, which was uh, presaged the financial sector reforms of that era. That report came back in late 2015. It recommended that there be greater choice given uh, to workers in how they choose uh, to where their super is invested, particularly where uh, uh, currently, currently that choice might be taken away from them through an enterprise agreement. That, that recommendation by the Financial System Inquiry was supported by the government, uh, hence this legislation. It was also, subsequent to the 2015 Financial System Inquiry report, it was also supported by the Productivity Commission in their 2018 report. They also highlighted issues with uh, a lack of choice uh, among, among uh, uh, members that existed in enterprise agreements and particularly some practical things too, practical things that Senator Watt wouldn't realise because he never goes to a factory or a mine or talks to real workers. Uh, I'll come back to uh, the Labor Party and what they really think and why they're really passionate against this bill, but, but uh, 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 what the practical things of this, the practical things of this, is that a lot of people end up locked in to multiple superannuation accounts because they don't have choice, because they're told uh, through the employment contract they have where they will invest. An account is established for them without their choice, 
And if they happen to change jobs, if they happen to have a few jobs over their working life, they can end up uh, uh, with, a, with a, a variety of different superannuation accounts that they've had no choice over, uh, but, they, but they are left with and anchored with through to their retirement. The issue here with that is not just the complexity for them. The issue with that is it often leads them uh, to pay much, much more in fees to the financial industry than they would otherwise have to if they just had a consolidated one or two or only a few accounts. By, by making workers accumulate multiple accounts, the winners here, the winners, are the financial industry. They're the bankers. Uh, uh, they're, the, they're the people in the big buildings in Sydney that go up 40 or 50 uh, fly, flights of stairs now. They don't use lifts so much. Go up right up to have bit nice views of, uh, the, of the city. They're the people who benefit from that complexity, not your average worker, not your average person just trying to earn a wage every week and putting a little bit away each side for their retirement. They don't benefit from that complexity. Uh, the banking industry does. And by opposing these changes here today, the Labor Party show their true colours that they're really on the side of the bankers, not the workers. That is the position of the Labor Party on this bill, because the people that benefit from a lack of choice for the workers are the financial industry, who through complexity can charge more fees and more accounts and more bonuses for themselves every year when those fees accrue. So something as practical as that, as simple as that. Surely we could agree on that we should reduce complexity, help workers out, uh, uh, ensure that they don't get saddled uh, with uh, excessive and unnecessary fees through their working life. Surely we could all agree with that. We could all agree with that. But we can't. We can't. We can't. We can't because uh, uh, the Labor Party uh, cannot bring themselves to provide that choice. In part because they're supporting this big financial industry. Uh, but that, that, that wouldn't give you the really the reason for why they'd be so passionately, and it was a passionate speech from Senator Watt there before, why would they passionately fight against such complexity? Why would they be passionately in favour of the once proud Workers' Party, the Labor Party? Why would they be passionately in favour of bankers and the banking industry? The reason is they're part of that industry now. That's the reason. They're part of it. They, well, they used to be. They used to fight against banks. They used to want to nationalise the banks. They used to hate the banks. They used to hate the financial industry. But now the modern Labor Party is a sold-up subsidiary of the Australian financial industry. That's why they're passionately against it, because they're part of it. They're part of it. They, they, get, they get board positions on superannuation funds. Uh, they, 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 they get a little bit of the clip of the fees. We all know how the financial industry works. You just want a little bit of the crumbs, right? You just want to have lots of transactions. You get a few of the crumbs that come off the table. You make a lot of money. You make a lot of money. Uh, and now the Labor Party are all part of that. They're all part sitting at the bottom of the table, eating those crumbs that come off the uh, contributions that the average Australian worker makes. That's why Senator Watt and the Labor Party so passionately defend this industry, because they benefit from the industry. Uh, uh, they are now uh, it's like mother's milk for the Labor Party. Superannuation fees, uh, uh, banking fees, the whole banking industry is mother's milk for the Labor Party because they suck on that tea time and time again. It helps all their mates out, and we've seen how they look after their mates in the Labor Party. So, so you put aside all the ideology about super. We had this large speech from Senator Watt about whether we you know the super system and retirement savings are at risk. Apparently, if we pass this legislation, all this legislation does is allow a, a worker, uh, an individual worker, uh, to say that look, uh, whatever my EBA says, whatever has been agreed between the trade union and uh, the business, I'd like my funds to go somewhere else. I'd like to, uh, to have a uh, self-managed superation fund, perhaps, or I'd like to, to have a different uh, wealth accumulation strategy. That's all it does. That's all it does. Uh, but apparently, apparently, according to the contribution to the other side, that puts at risk, puts at risk billions of retirement savings in the very, the very future of Australians' uh, retirement uh, uh, in old age. Uh, what a load of absolute tosh. How could you draw those conclusions from this bill? You just can't. They don't stand up. They stand to no scrutiny. It is an excuse, an excuse being put here uh, to provide that protection for the Labor Party to this, this broader industry. And, and, and at the, the, the heart of that protection that the Labor Party is engaged in here uh, is, uh, is a complete lack of respect uh, for an individual and his or her own choices. Uh, it's a lack of respect uh, for an individual and his or her own uh, fruits of their labour. That is the difference between uh, the approach that the coalition government is taking here 
through this bill and more generally to issues of superannuation and the position and stance of the, the modern Labor Party on these issues. It does go to a heart of a philosophical difference almost between the two sides here because, generally speaking, generally speaking when we're talking about uh, taxes, spending and now hear people's savings, uh, it's quite often you hear it inherently in the contributions made from people in the Labor Party. They don't really believe that money is other people's. They don't really believe uh, that the taxes people pay comes from their labour, comes from their uh, work. They don't really believe the money we spend here, whether it's on JobKeeper, uh, whether it's on uh, the variety of assistance packages we provided through this crisis, they don't believe that that's other people's money. They get confused and they start to believe that it's actually their money. It's their money. Almost all money should stay at the start of the governments and we just give some of it back to you every now and again. Well, that's the fundamental difference between the Labor Party and ourselves here in the Liberal National Parties. We believe that people have an inherent right to the money and work that they do. We believe there should be an appropriate tax system to fund public services, but that should always be done with the knowledge and the, 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 the care that we are managing other people's money, not theirs. So that when this crisis hit, when a few months ago it became clear that our economy would almost certainly end in recession, although officially and formally that hasn't been delivered yet, almost uh, certainly it will, that we were going into recession, that people were going to come under great hardship, uh, especially those directly affected, sectors directly affected by this crisis. When that occurred, when that occurred, of course, naturally, you know, we felt that people should have access to their own resources to help them respond to such a crisis. Uh, that, that, <clears throat> that if you've uh, accumulated and saved an amount of money through your super, and, and rightly you're trying to do your best to save for your retirement, if you're hit by a, an unexpected, uh, uh, out-of-the-blue shock like we have been through the coronavirus, you should have some ability to draw those resources down that you've accumulated for that risk. Because that's exactly what you're doing for retirement anyway. It's just more foreseeable than, and predictable than these other risks and eventualities that have occurred through the coronavirus uh, crisis. What you're doing for your retirement, as you know, at some stage you're not going to earn as much as you do today. So you put money aside for that time. And putting those money aside, those, that money aside for times where you don't have as much resources is not particularly different from what we've experienced here today. As I said, it's just more unexpected. So what we've experienced in the last few months <clears throat> has been an unexpected income and wealth shock for many people. It makes absolute and abundant sense to allow people to draw down their own resources to help them in that situation. It's also fair, too. It's also fair, because I picked up from Senator Watts' um, contribution before that what he thinks should have happened is, well, no, don't, don't, don't allow people to draw down their own resources. Let's just the government can just pay people. The government can just hold, hand out money uh, to people uh, in those circumstances. How fair would that be, though, if someone is sitting? on hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars of superannuation in their accounts, why should the government—remember, it's other people's money, it's not the government's money—other people then help bail that person out? Why shouldn't someone in that search be allowed to first look at their own resources and how they can respond to such a situation before uh, seeking assistance from uh, others to do so? And keep in mind, we have provided that assistance. We, we do help and support those in the circumstances that can't and don't have their own resources to do so. But if you do have those resources, if you do, it is actually fair uh, to require that to occur first, and that's what's happened in this instance. And we've seen the popularity of this. We've seen that people do actually want to have control of their own money. Surprise, surprise, shocking finding that people have some, uh, some uh, inherent uh, want and desire to look, look, if I'm in bad circumstances, you know, I can draw down a bit of super right now, might be able to catch it up later. Uh, we trust people to be able to manage their affairs over time. They don't need to be led. Uh, and at times like this, it's right and proper that we help them. It's right and proper that we have a superannuation system that's actually designed for workers and their needs at an individual level, not uh, the needs of the bankers in the modern-day Labor Party. They are full, full of bankers. Not many workers in their ranks, but lots of people in the banking industry, and they are tied to that industry now, and that's why they are passionately opposing opposing these changes that would invest workers with choice, that would allow an individual to decide how their own money is invested, that would provide a little bit of scope uh, for people to manage and, and, and control their own futures and affairs. And that's why we passionately support these changes. They are simple changes, common sense changes 
that we'll keep trying to chip away at, and hopefully, hopefully, eventually, this place, this Senate, will seek to invest individuals with their own choice and their own rights, not big corporations and banks. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Sheldon, at the podium. Well, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about the government's Your Super, Your Choice legislation 2019 in its current form. Well, false facts, lies and stooges for the banks. Well, we're here we are, the middle of a global health epidemic. Unemployment is up 6 per cent, possibly on its way to 10 per cent. More than one in 10 workers are underemployed. Our first quarter of negative growth in nine years at the beginnings of our first recession in almost 30 years, the media, through the Prime Minister, thought the, sorry, the media thought the Prime Minister might be on the right track. He called for a new compact, a new accord with workers and employers. He asked for all parties to lay down their arms. He proposed a dialogue between workers and employers on proposals to improve our industrial relations scheme. He proposed cooperation to foster prosperity and recover for Australia. But instead, his government has continued an agenda of ideological charged hand grenades thrown to the industrial relations landscape to blow away workers' people's voices, working people's voices. The provision in this bill are wrapped up in the rhetoric of choice and may sound harmless enough, but they are just the latest attempts by the government to block by block undermine the most successful worker retirement scheme in the world. The establishment of award-based superannuation by the Hawke government was one of the most profound and important economic reforms of the last 30 years. It created a new system for income for workers in retirement, reduced the pressure of an ageing population on the federal budget, all while creating a huge new pool of capital available to be invested in Australian businesses and infrastructure and has never been so important as it is now. Prior to the development of industry separation, most working people only had the pension to rely on. Up until the mid-1980s, less than 40 per cent of working pop the pop working population had superannuation. That figure was even less for blue-collar workers and women at around 25 per cent. The introduction of the superannuation guarantee charge meant for the first time many workers would be getting ongoing regular contributions for their retirement incomes. Since the time industry super funds have become the leading providers of superannuation for two Australian workers, more than five million Australians are members of industry super funds with over $224 billion in funds under management. Unlike the superannuation schemes run by the big banks and finance businesses, these funds are only to benefit members. They are governed by trustee boards specifically representing employees and employers and do not pay sales commissions to financial planners. They have sound investment strategies which include long-term investment in Australian infrastructure. The returns from industry super funds have consistently outperformed private sector funds over many years. Over the last 15 years, the average retail fund has delivered around $36,000 less to their members than the average industry super fund. The creation of universal superannuation was a signature component of the wages and incomes accord between the millions of working people and the Commonwealth Government. It represents the collective decision of workers to set aside a portion of their wage increases at the time to set up a better retirement for them and their children. And yet the coalition have a history of opposition to this landmark reform. This is what the Honourable David Conley, Liberal Shadow Minister, said when the superannuation guarantee charge was introduced in 1992. From Hansard, it is clear that there was no economic, financial or social justification for the government's proposal, which if, which if implemented, it would cause even higher unemployment reduce rural wages, add to inflation and do nothing to provide genuine retirement income for the majority of Australians. Was he right? No, he wasn't, and of course he isn't, and as they aren't right now. Instead, the complete opposite has happened, and the performance of industry funds established at the time have been nothing short of spectacular. 
The benefits for individuals and community have been enormous. The genesis of award-based super is critical in understanding why these provisions put forward by the government should be opposed in the current form. It is clear who is behind this attack, who sets the priorities for this government. It's the big banks, the big players in the financial advice industry and their stooges in the, on the Liberal backbench. It's not a first order issue we should be debating as we recover from COVID-19. It is a petty point scoring against people coming together to collectively manage people's retirements better than the big banks ever could. Acting Deputy President, this debate has, prom has promoted, by the, as promoted by the government, on the basis that it will give workers choice. The word choice is bandied about by the government like it should end all discussion on this matter. Choice takes many forms in enterprise agreements. It is not either or a proposition. Some enterprise agreements provide default funds for those who do not nominate one. That is not removing someone's choice. Other enterprise agreements bargained for and voted by working people might limit choice only to select funds that cater the special needs of that industry, such as insurance or different investment strategies. That is not removing choice. There is also the question of choice for who. Is it the real choice for the workers or is it imposed choice of the employer? Is it choice informed in a hypothetical world of perfect information? Or is it choice pushed onto people by predatory retail funds offering too good to be to do returns and benefits? Or is it choice when dodgy employers exercise their choice to force their employees in the fund of their bank's choice? Research from McKell Institute submission to previous inquiries set out the real facts about the impact of choice through enterprise agreements. They inspected a random sample of 3,483 enterprise agreements from 2014 to 19, as well as 144 awards, which had clauses determining fund selection. They then tracked how many workers were being defaulted into poor funds. The results of this analysis are their analysis as follows. Critically, it shows that employers and employees unions who collectively bargain for a fund are most likely to select a high-performing fund. The award process is the second most likely. That is to be clear. When choice is made through enterprise agreements, more workers go into better-performing funds. That's the research. That's the facts. This is in stark contrast to the shoddy research the government is attempting to justify this bill. Documents obtained by my office through the Freedom of Information have revealed the lengths that has, the government has gone in order to build a case for the legislation. From the onset, the government intended to attack and slander industry funds with no justification. They provided no performance basis or rationale when selecting several funds for the Attorney General's department to investigate. The FOI documents confirm that their sample analysis was never intended as a representative sample, but rather a select reading of enterprise agreements tied to the funds that want the government wanted to go after. And when the government leaked this report to the AFR for a story that appeared in December the 6th of last year, the department contacted the minister's office to clarify that their research could hardly be considered a report. That is was purely a layman's interpretation and they do not have confirmed any of the details of the agreements they investigated with employers at all. Layman's interpretation, not talking to employers, and confirmed that the details failed. When the minister gave his second reading speech in the House, he said, at least 14,000 employees are forced to contribute to one of seven funds identified by Super Consumers Australia as the worst performing funds as a result of the restrictions. Instead, we found that this is not quite correct. It is unclear when super consumers had named those seven funds. Indeed, two of them, according to the government department, weren't low performers at all. What's more, super consumers went on to confirm in the same AFR article that they didn't consider one of them, TW Super, to be poorly performing fund at all. Then the minister's office ignored the advice of the department when it came to define 
what constituted forced choice. They ignored the department's advice about the superannuation fund provisions in an agreement between the TWU and t and from 2017 in order to justify their 14,000 figure. So why did the minister tell the House that 14,000 workers were trapped in these funds? Instead of policy of transparency, this government has attempted to slander industry super funds with accusations that do not hold up. They have twisted figures and ignored the department in order to inflate numbers to justify the bill. And they have chosen to pin this bill on research that even the department couldn't characterise as rigorous or as a report. For those on the crossbench who care about transparency, if this does not give you pause for concern, I don't know what will. Now more than ever, we need secure to ensure we stick with a system that served us so well. Collective choice agreements that would, out, would be outlawed by this bill can lead to positive outcomes. They are the result unions and employers negotiating in good faith arrangements for the choice of funds available to workers. It helps to ensure genuine choice, not the development of a sales culture where bank employees are under pressure to meet targets to sell superannuation products. This collective choice making is a legitimate and democratic form of choice. The whole workforce benefits and therefore you as an individual worker benefits. Finally, Acting Deputy President, we must consider the role of retail funds in the Australian superannuation industry. We know from many, the many years of evidence of financial returns that directing workers to retail funds will leave them poorer in retirement. The track record of the banks and the performance of retail funds must be put under the microscope. They are driving the debate and the biggest beneficiaries of these proposed changes. In its regular rating of superannuation funds, super ratings, ranked the top 25 super funds over the last decade for a balanced investment option. It does not include a single fund run by a major bank, insurer or master trust. The banks, of course, have been shown to be incredibly self-interested and Australia has lost count of the number of scandals they have been caught in over the last few years. It is a timely to remind the Senate of just some of the headlines describing the behaviour of the banks and for-profit financial institutions. CBA agrees it is a gold medalist of fees of no service. Banking Royal Commission told 90 per cent of financial advisers ignored clients' best interests. AMP executive says company put profits before the law. The unconscionable behaviour of the banks should not be rewarded by carving into their demands on the issue covered in this legislation. The wolf is at the door and the government wants to kick it open and let them in rather than protect Australian workers and the retirement incomes. Acting Deputy President, the big banks through their behaviour should not be allowed to continue to provide superannuation products to Australian consumers. They ripped off so many workers and been caught out by regulators too many times. It's time to end their second, third, fourth and fifth chances when it comes to super. It's time to end their involvement in this sector. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, acting, acting Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, quite an entertaining speech there from Senator Sheldon, but of course what comes around goes around. So uh, I thought I'd do a little bit of Googling myself with in industry funds and a, a particular industry fund by the name of Host Plus. Now, according to the Banking Royal Commission, it heard that uh, Host Plus spent $267,000 on entertainment for clients and staff and another $220,000 on accommodation in the year to June 2017. And the fund also spent another $260,000 on tickets to the Australian Open Tennis, where Host Plus CEO David Elias said his wife and two children were among his guests. Another $40,000 was spent on football tickets at Melbourne's Etihad Stadium, with some of the sports-related uh, spending covered by the fund's marketing budget. And I actually found that on a website known as The New Daily, which happens to be funded by industry super funds. Now, you've got to ask yourself what industry super funds are doing 
uh, in the media? Are they actually making money here? Because to me, this looks like a clear breach of the sole purpose test. Now, the sole purpose test is all about making sure that money invested is for the benefit of the members, not for the benefit of the union funds or the Australian Labor Party. So, but one thing we did hear from the speech before was that there is a clear choice in this chamber. This side of the chamber is all about choice, and that side of the chamber is all about control. And that matters because superannuation costs the Australian worker $35 billion a year in fees. Now, I'm not going to be you know, judgmental as to whether it's the banks or the industry funds. That's a lot of money. Now, when you think that that actually also comes at a cost of $40 billion in tax concessions, that's a whopping $80 billion cost to the economy. Now, compare that to the pension, which covers the bottom 70 per cent of the earners. That costs $50 billion a year and only costs $6 billion to run. Now, how is it that the um, Department of Social Security can run the pension for $6 billion, and yet the private industry, whether it's industry funds or banks, it takes costs $35 billion? And that's just the start. Then, of that superannuation, $600 billion is actually invested offshore. Now, what's interesting about that is, is in 1990, Bob Hawke came out and said that the money raised by superannuation would be vest invested right here in Australia. Well, according to the, according to the latest numbers, uh, and, that, and, that's, and I should qualify that, that's pre-COVID, um, over 20 per cent of the money invested in superannuation is actually invested offshore. Imagine the number of jobs we could create here. Imagine the number of dams, the, number of, you know, the amount of high-speed rail we could build. But wait, that's not all. The number of people actually retiring with a mortgage has increased from 40 per cent to 70 per cent. Now, the whole purpose of superannuation was so that people could live well in their retirement. But how can you live well in your retirement if you've got a mortgage? It's counterproductive. It's counterproductive. And the other thing, of course, is, and we can see this, we saw this in Greece and we're seeing this with the defined benefit schemes in the, in the US now, is that it's actually a Ponzi scheme. And I'll explain why. Because for people like myself, my generation, we'll be the first generation with 40 years of superannuation. When 2030, 2035 comes around, we'll be able to pull out 40 years in one hit. Did you know what that means? We're going to need another 40 people coming behind my generation. For every person that takes out 40 years worth of super, you're going to need 40 people putting in one year's of super worth of super, you know, assuming that you know, the contributions and withdrawals are the same per person, and I realise they're not, um, or otherwise withdrawals are going to start exceeding co contributions. And you know what that's going to cause? That's going to cause a crash on the stock market. And that was actually discussed in COVID. They were jumping up and down about how if we allowed young people to access super, it would actually uh, cause stock market prices to fall. Well, wait until you get the people from 1970 onwards with a full 40 years of superannuation savings ripping out that lump sum in superannuation. So anyway, um, I'm glad to speak on this amendment, uh, Law, because at the end of the day, it's important to give people choice. Personally, if it was left to me, I'd make superannuation voluntary, because I think there's a lot of people out there right now who are doing it tough. And we have this wonderful thing in Australia, uh, introduced by the Protectionist Party, which is the forefather of the Liberal Party, called the pension. And that is what I'm happy to pay my taxes for. But I'm not happy to pay for my taxes for the government to tell me how I must invest my money. So, anyway, uh, the practice of forcing workers into a predetermined super fund is perverse, as it only encourages negative outcomes that include excessive fees, limited choice, and perhaps even a loss of retirement income. Which then brings another thing into question, too, by the way, because in the Constitution, it says the Commonwealth can't take property from people without compensation. So what happens if you get to 60 and you've lost your money in super? I mean, tell me this. When Paul Keating brought in super in 1992, he never took this to an election. Do you think if he took to an election, I'm going to take 10 per cent of your money, I'm going to give it to someone you've never met, and you may or, not, may, or may not get it back when you're 60, do you think people would have voted for it? I mean, if I said to Senator McKim here, Nick, I'll take 10 you know, per cent of your earnings and I'm going to give it to some white-collar blowhard in the banks 
and I'm not going to promise that I'm going to give it back to you. Would you vote for that? I don't think so. I don't think so. And that's the thing about superannuation. It's been like one of those. What's the figure of speech I won't say? But you know, um, the boiling water, the hot is, the water's getting hotter, and it's slowly creeping up and up and up. It started off at two percent, didn't seem that bad. Then it came three. Then it became four. Then it became five. And now it's nine and a half percent of earnings, and it's actually legislated to go to 12 per cent of earnings. But whilst it's 12 per cent of earnings, it may actually be the entire amount of money that someone has left over to meet daily necessities. So, for example, if you earn $100 a week and you pay $30 in tax, it might cost you $50 in food and uh, accommodation. You may only have $20 left. A lot of people haven't even got that much left. They've got nothing left. And yet the government forces those people to give up that last 10 per cent of their money and give it to someone they've got left. Uh, give it to someone who gets to manage it until they're 60. And meanwhile, so many young people who'd like to be able to pay off their houses can't do that. And they're getting clipped. The, their, their, their tickets being clipped twice: once by the banks with bank fees and, and interest and mortgage charges on the loan, and at another time with their superannuation savings. So they're actually getting uh, charged twice for what very often actually turns out to be no productive income. So anyway, uh, the, um, so I, I'm, I'm delighted to be uh, introducing this bill into the Senate. Uh, many young Australians often get their first job at a supermarket, fast food outlet or a department store. Many Australians go on to have rewarding careers in the retail and hospitality sectors seeking not only financial reward in the pursuit of excellence, but also enjoying the social aspect of such work. I imagine that my own children may one day get their first job stacking shelves, flipping burgers or serving coffee. These jobs teach responsibility, financial management and help teenagers to establish greater financial independence. They are critical in helping young Australians to mature as adults, to learn new skills, find careers and contribute to the workforce in different ways. It is unfortunate that many of these vulnerable young workers often find themselves on the front line when it comes to experiencing workplace intimidation and bullying. Quite often in these cases, it is the Union for Retail, Fast Food and Warehousing Workers, the SDA, that exploits the vulnerability of young workers by insisting that they not only join that union, but that they also sign up with a union back industry super fund that donates back to the union. And after passing through union coffers, these rivers of gold flow on to fund campaigns to elect Labor Party candidates at state and federal elections. In this day and age, it astounds me that any organisation, especially a trade union, which purports to protect workers' rights, would seek to deny workers their choice. Remember, this side of the chamber is all about choice not control. This is freedom. That's totalitarianism. Very stark contrast. Would seek to deny workers their choice of superannuation fund and instead drive them to join a super fund effectively owned by SDA, namely Rest Industry Super. Only an anti-choice, anti-worker, corporatist bully would defend such piracy. After it all, it is workers' hard-earned money we're talking about, not government, not employer or union largesse. That money, the money that goes into super, belongs to the working men and women of Australia. Adding insult to injury, rest industry super significantly underperformed many other funds. They ranked just 44 out of 64 comparable funds over five years. Yet despite the fund's poor performance, the SDA was happy to lock young, casual and low-paid workers into that fund. This is nothing short of corporate robbery as far as I am concerned. As a further kick in the guts to low-paid workers, the actions of their union also meant that workers who were really struggling to make ends meet and working a second job are forced to either shift that job superannuation contributions to rest or be ripped off by two sets of fees. Unsurprisingly, the SDA directly benefits from REST, with employee representatives on the REST board handling more than $300,000 handing more than $300,000 in directors' fees to the union in recent years. 
Wow. Let's be clear about this. There is virtually no evidence that the SDA in any way, shape or form exists to represent the best interests of its hard working members. But rather, the SDA exists to manipulate votes on Labor Party matters. And it does that by bullying young retail workers into SDA membership and signing them up to commitments that they don't understand, want or even need. The SDA uses its workplace dominance and position of trust to extort funds and funnel those funds into political campaigns while they leverage high membership numbers as powerful voting blocks at Labor Party conferences and pre-selections. Hmm, that's got a certain flavour to it at the moment, hasn't it? This is the SDA's business model, pure and simple. It is a model that is rife across the union movement, a model where the tendrils of trade union power reach out and to entangle and thereby compromise the operational integrity of many industry super funds. Surely any Labor member or senator who may be aligned with the SDA should take a serious look at themselves. Compulsory superannuation was originally conceived to provide a fair and affordable retirement savings schemes for all Australians, a scheme that would boost the income and financial security of retirees and make the age pension more sustainable, while offering con contributing members a degree of flexibility and choice. It is a sad indictment that, in the main, Compulsory Super has done none of these things. Gee, I'm enjoying this speech. I can't say how much I'm enjoying this. It is fair to say that Compulsory Super was never intended to shackle low-paid workers to the likes of Rest Industry Super, simply because they worked a part-time job at a supermarket or fast food outlet when they were 16. Why should those in the retail and hospitality sector, many who enjoy otherwise rewarding careers, be denied options available to workers in other sectors, simply because their chosen industry is dominated by a dud union in cahoots with an underperforming super fund? Superannuation is workers' money. It is not the employer's money. It is not the fund manager's money. And it certainly isn't the union's money. It's the workers' money. And it should be their choice and theirs alone as to where it is invested. This bill is straightforward. It's about standing up for the little guy. It is about ensuring that casual and part-time workers in our shops and restaurants are, giving the, are given the same opportunities to save and invest and get ahead. This bill does not stop enterprise agreements from nominating a fund as a default. It simply allows workers to choose an alternative fund if they wish. I implore those opposite, for once, to look beyond narrow self-interest and ignore trade union instructions. <coughs> This bill should rightly be supported by any sensible, fair-minded person. After all, what reasonable individual has serious issue with allow work allowing workers to choose their preferred superannuation fund? Thank you. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the government uh, would like us to believe that this bill is all about choice, uh, but from the co contributions that uh, we're hearing today, and particularly that contribution uh, from Senator Rennick, I think we know that this bill is all about the government's choice to attack unions. It's all about the government's choice to attack collective bargaining, uh, and it's all about the government's choice to attack the retirement savings of Australian workers and their families. So the government says that this bill is all about choice, the choice to have your own superannuation fund. Uh, but what we all need to understand is that this bill actually removes the choice, removes the choice and the right of workers to collectively choose their super fund as part of their enterprise bargaining agreement. 
And what we also know is that reports have shown that these collectively chosen super funds uh, are, really, are really good. They're industry leaders and they can have big benefits when it comes to providing extra protections uh, for workers and their families, protections like industry insurance, like uh, compliance uh, and doing the right thing with super payments, um, above superannuation guarantee contributions and also above benchmark returns. Um, so this bill is actually less about uh, real choice, as the government would have us believe, um, and more about the government's priorities, priorities of attacks on union members uh, and their right to collectively bargain and collectively bargain for their own superannuation funds, uh, and attacks on our superannuation system, um, one of the best retirement systems in the world, uh, and a system that we've heard uh, today from uh, the backbench, from Senator Rennick, uh, that some Liberals believe should be made entirely voluntary. Entirely voluntary. We've heard be before from Senator Bragg uh, that, the si that the superannuation system should be made voluntary for people on low and moderate incomes. Well, today we've heard from Senator Rennick uh, that superannuation should be made entirely voluntary, uh, and that perhaps people who um, have worked hard their whole life uh, should just retire only on the pension, according to Senator Rennick today. Well, that's not our view. Our view is that we should have a strong superannuation system uh, and that people should be able to retire with dignity, with a strong superannuation balance, and that they should be able to collectively bargain for a fund of their choice when that works for them. Uh, now, this government uh, has failed to deliver on some of the key challenges that are really confronting the superannuation system. Um, issues like superannuation theft, for example, um, something that this government has not been able to address or attack. Uh, and they continue to dither and delay when it comes to implementing the recommendations of the Banking Royal Commission, uh, which submitted its final report back in February 2019. Uh, and I don't need to uh, explain that that was over 15 months ago. Uh, but while the government continues to waste time on those critical issues, uh, it has no problem whatsoever keeping up its attacks on the rights of workers in Australia. Uh, and we know that workers are better off when they're able to bargain collectively. Um, now, choice is a good thing, and I support choice. Um, but choice needs to include the option for workers to collectively choose their superannuation funds. Surely the whole point of choice is to make sure that Australian workers are choosing the best super funds for them, the funds that deliver the best performance, the funds that deliver the best benefits. And often, for many workers, that fund is one that has been bargained for that has been collectively chosen. Now, in its 2018 review, uh, Superannuation Assessing Efficiency and Competitiveness, the Productivity Commission concluded that the default funds chosen by workers uh, to be included in their enterprise agreements had performed very well. 85% um, of those superannuation funds achieved above benchmark returns in the 10 years preceding 2018. Uh, and particularly for those working in high-risk industries like electricians and construction workers, collective bargaining allows them to reach agreements with their employers um, to do things like pay insurance, um, critical insurance that protects their incomes through their super funds. Now, these workers would lose the ability to negotiate for this, for these protections, if this bill passes without amendment. And this bill, without change, could have unforeseen consequences. Uh, it could actually put workers at higher risk of super theft or of being put on lower performing funds. The Banking Royal Commission, um, which I'll remind those opposite handed down its uh, report some time ago, um, showed us that a lot of wrong can be done in the name of consumer choice. We've seen how financial institutions used choice to take advantage of Australians, leaving them worse off 
Uh, and in its current form, there's little protection in this bill for workers who could get pushed onto poorly performing funds by uh, unscrupulous employers. So we need to be making sure that workers are not forced onto funds uh, without fully understanding the consequences or forced onto a fund that works in their employer's interest rather than in the interests of the workers who are being paid that superannuation. Uh, and additionally, over the last few years, we've seen just how much of a problem wage theft uh, and the theft of superannuation has become in this country. Uh, there have been countless high-profile examples of workers being ripped off. And in the absence of any uh, real action from the government to address these issues, collectively chosen funds make it easier for workers and their unions to track compliance. Uh, because right now it's unions who are doing a lot more than the government when it comes to tackling wage theft and super theft, an issue that has serious consequences for so many workers. Every year, almost three million Australian workers will experience theft of their superannuation through underpayment or non-payment. There was a calculation uh, done in, uh, for the year 2015-16 that the amount of unpaid super was estimated to be almost $6 billion—$6 billion. And those affected workers are going to be facing real hardship in their retirement due to this theft. So while the government is concerned about a perceived lack of choice, what working people are concerned about is getting paid what they're owed. And this, this is where the government should be focusing its priorities, because the consequences of employers being allowed to get away with not paying super are extreme for everyday Australians. Workers will face lower living standards in their retirement if the government doesn't set its priorities on this problem instead of on attacking the collective bargaining rights of workers and their unions to bargain for a fund which they believe gives them the best protection. And often it is those in lower paid jobs in industries like agriculture, cleaning and hospitality who are most likely to fall victims of wage theft and superannuation theft. The theft of superannuation is all part of a larger problem that Australian workers are facing, uh, that of wage theft. And much like the underpayment of super, this is an issue that the government says they care about, says that they will act on, but in reality uh, just give us empty rhetoric uh, and something with no real action. We have seen countless stories of wage and superannuation theft in this country. Um, this is what the priority should be for this government. Uh, and workers show a huge amount of courage when they come forward and tell their stories. Um, and each of these workers really wants to know what is the government's plan to do something about wage theft and superannuation theft. Um, because so far the government has been entirely unwilling and unable to be the tough cop on the beat that we need to address the real issue that Australians are facing with their superannuation, that of super, superannuation theft, not of collectively bargaining for funds that perform well uh, and that perform well for those workers who vote for them, who vote for them collectively. In some industries like hospitality, the theft of wages and superannuation has become a business model. Uh, and in 2018, the Fair Work Ombudsman found that almost three out of four hospitality venues were non-compliant with the award. This is the problem that is out of control, um, not the problem of unions collectively bargaining for good superannuation funds. This is the problem that is out of control. And this is the problem that the community wants to see tougher action on against corporate wage uh, and superannuation thieves. Working people shouldn't have to work for their wages and for their superannuation twice. Um, once when they go to work and do their job on their shifts and again when they have to fight to be paid uh, what they earned. And while the government pretends to take action on these issues, uh, their real priorities are, are, are placed elsewhere. 
Um, and their priority in this bill is really about, as we heard from Senator Rennick just before, uh, who, who made it very clear, uh, the government's priority is attacking the organisations that actually fight on these issues every day, trade unions. Um, the government's priority is attacking the organisations that are focused on the real issue that people care about, which is the theft of their superannuation, uh, not on uh, this government's constructed problem of workers combining together and joining together to make decisions collectively about what fund they believe uh, best suits their interests. Unions, like Labor, have a proud history of fighting for a stronger and fairer superannuation system. Uh, and I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the contribution that the Australian trade union movement has made, together with Labor, in establishing our modern superannuation system. It was through worker-led campaigns that superannuation, once um, the preserve of public servants, senior managers, politicians, executives, became a universal workplace right uh, and one that everyday Australians rely on to have a dignified retirement. And of course, we are committed to any changes that continue to strengthen the superannuation system. Um, the union movement uh, is rightfully concerned about this bill uh, and about what is another move against workers' right to collectively bargain, to make the choice collectively that best suits their interests. The Prime Minister, well, he called on unions to put down their weapons uh, and to work with the government to help ensure a strong economic recovery post the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, well, perhaps it's time that the government did the same. They may have shelved their ensuring integrity bill uh, for the moment, um, but it needs to shelve its obsession with chipping away at the bargaining rights of Australian workers and chipping away at our strong superannuation system built by Labor um, and built by the campaigns of working people in this country. So it is disingenuous of the government to bring on an attack uh, that is about collectively organising um, for the superannuation fund that you want during uh, a time when they are attempting to put forward a view that they want to enter into accord-like negotiations with the ACTU uh, and the union movement. Now, if this government really cared about superannuation, they would stop their attacks on bargaining and start to address some of the issues, such as super theft, that I've spoken about today. But the question is whether they really care about superannuation. Um, we've heard from government MPs and senators, uh, including very notably today from Senator Rennick, that they want to cut super, en super entitlements and make super um, purely voluntary. Uh, and we don't need to think too hard to figure out what that would be like. Voluntary super would leave workers who are in desperate situations paying more tax on the income they divert away from their super contributions and end up with less super when they go into retirement. Those on the lowest incomes and with the lowest super balances would be hit the hardest. With those sorts of ideas uh, floating around the Liberal Party room, um, it's really not surprising that they haven't tackled the real issues in the superannuation uh, system, the number one issue being the theft of superannuation um, out of people's pay packets, out of their retirement balances. So, Unlike many on the, on the other side of the chamber, Labor is committed to a strong and fair superannuation system. Superannuation is a great Australian tradition, and while we support uh, the principle of choice, that choice cannot be at the expense of workers' rights to collectively choose their super funds. This can all be fixed with Labor's amendment, uh, and I call on the government to drop their campaign against bargaining rights and to focus on the real issues in the superannuation system. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rather like Senator Walsh, and I think she's one of the, um, one of the, one of the brighter and more capable ones um, I have got to know on the other side. But I don't find it logical when she stands up in this chamber and says that this is a bill that is about dismantling the ability to collectively bargain. How on earth could it be? It doesn't take away the rights of employees to engage in enterprise bargaining processes. They still have all of those rights. 
All it does is provide individual employees with the chance to choose their own super fund, even whilst they participate in enterprise bargaining negotiations or continue to work underneath one. If an employee wants to bargain um, as part of a group, that's entirely their right. But so too is it their right to put their super where they would like to put their super. And you know what? If the fund that is being recommended by their chosen union is the wonderful choice that those opposite say that it is, then it will be the obvious choice for all of the people under that agreement. So why do you need to take away the rights of individuals to choose? It just doesn't make sense to me. One of the things that really stuck out from Senator Walsh's presentation a moment ago is that she described the Labor Party position as being about supporting the choice of workers to be able to do what they want with their super, but in a collective way. And that reflects a fundamental misunderstanding about what choice is. Choice is something we exercise as individuals. It's not a choice when some people who are conducting negotiations on behalf of the union for the people in your workplace decide it for you. That is not choice. That's subjugation. They're very different things. And to suggest that this is anything other than an opportunity to give working people more power, more opportunity, more choice and control over their own financial future. Well, as I say, I really like Senator Walsh, but this is not a speech that made an awful lot of sense. Now, let me explain it with an example. There's, there is such a simple Senator example Phil. we could use here. Sarah is a young working person. She's studying to be a teacher. But while she's studying, Sarah holds some part-time jobs. One of them's at Kmart, and she gets forced into having um, her superannuation at the fund that has been chosen by um, the union that has negotiated with Kmart employees. Fine. She also has a part-time job as a waitress, and she's got to have another fund reflecting the agreements of that workplace. Then, as she moves towards the end of her studies and, and into the market in her chosen long-term profession, she has to get another fund, again, not of her choosing. And I can't help but think that at some point in her career, Sarah should get some choice about what happens to her money. Because that seems to be what's getting lost in this debate. This superannuation money is important, but it doesn't belong to industry super funds. It doesn't belong to retail funds. It doesn't belong to employers. It doesn't belong to unions. No. That money, in this example, belongs to Sarah. And every day of the week, it belongs to each individual working person. And they must, if we are to live up to our beliefs, no matter what side of the chamber we sit on, it must be something about which employees are given control. It must be employees that get to choose what they do with their superannuation money. Now, those opposite have tried to cast this bill as some grand conspiracy to attack unions. It couldn't be further from the truth. This change was announced as a response to the financial system inquiry. And that inquiry recommended that all employees be provided with the ability to choose a fund into which their superannuation guarantee contributions are paid. Now, that recommendation was echoed by the Productivity Commission's 2018 report, in which they assessed the efficiency and competitiveness of superannuation. Now, these changes really matter. 
They matter in a philosophical sense because it has to be right that individuals should have the right to choose what they do with their own money and that just because they choose to bargain collectively they don't cede the right to choose what they do with their own money any more than they should cede to someone else the right to choose what they do with their weekly wages. But the knock-on effect of denying this choice to working people is that we get reduced productivity, reduced performance and reduced efficiency from our superannuation sector. And you know who bears the brunt of that lower efficiency? Working people. So on this side of the chamber, we make no apologies for standing up for the double benefit that comes from standing up for the right of individuals to choose what they do with their own money, the double benefit that comes first when they get to choose a fund that works for them with fees that reflect their interests, with investment plans that reflect their choices, and then the second benefit that comes when superannuation funds across the market perform at a higher level because they are getting the benefits of a properly competitive market, not being hampered by these uncompetitive arrangements. This government has taken action through the Protecting Your Superannuation package. It has addressed the existing stock of multiple accounts that people like Sarah have faced over the years so that they don't cop duplicate fees. They don't cop stealth insurance policies that they don't even realise they've got being deducted out of their superannuation funds every year, often eroding those smaller balances down to nothing in circumstances where um, it may not even have been a product that they wanted or needed. And this change is the next step in undoing the damage that unwanted multiple superannuation accounts cause. It delivers real choice for individuals that would otherwise be forced to continue to go on this merry-go-round of unwanted and duplicated accounts for which they pay multiple fees, for which they get lower returns and for which fundamentally they are denied their right, which is the right to choose to do with their super just as they should be able to choose what they do with their weekly wage. And that's a principle we on this side of the chamber are happy to fight for every day of the week. Senator Ayres. Well, we've heard from Senator Stoker and we've heard from Senator Rennick. Senator Rennick, who is uh, a sort of the hallucinogen for the LNP over there. He's the truth drug. He's the truth drug that says he's the guy who's prepared to say what you're really thinking. Senator Stoker, on the other hand, apparently she says what's in the air around her. Well, what a hateful, vile environment she must operate in if that's the kind of thing that she thinks it's OK to say to Indigenous Australians, to people around the world struggling over that issue. You should be ashamed of yourself. The only thing that you should come into this chamber and do is apologise. Now the legislation, the legislation, it was a mealy mouthed apology. It was the most pathetic apology. She didn't mean it. She never does. She's she's very fond of saying the things. She's very fond of saying the things that are hurtful. She's very fond of overstepping the mark, but she's not ever prepared to apologise. Senator Betts on a point of order. Point of order, uh, Mr. President. This is clearly a reflection on the senator. Goes to motives as well, and uh, chances are it is irrelevant to boot. Um, I was actually turning to the clerk at the point uh, I, when attributes are assigned to senators individually. That comes particularly close to reflections when uh, they are assigned to. Uh, behaviour or an event that is less so, or when they are signed collectively. I'd urge the senator to refer to senators by their title or through the chair. Senator Ayres. I'm continue. very happy to be oh, guided. It's uh, now 2 p.m. I'm you. afraid. Sorry about that, Senator Ayres. You'll be in continuation. Senator Wong. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, Mr. Morrison said, and I quote, The challenge of JobKeeper is that businesses will form views about those employees who they will able to be able to keep on longer term and those who they will not. How many Australians does the Prime Minister expect will lose their jobs and be left behind when he withdraws JobKeeper at the end of September? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, the, the government doesn't want any Australian to be left behind, but it is also true that we will not be able to provide crisis-level temporary support through a program like JobKeeper uh, forever and ever. Forever and ever. I mean, the, uh, the uh, focus uh, for, the, for the country surely must be, the commitment uh, for the country surely must be for us to get back into a situation as soon as possible where businesses around Australia are able to pay the wages of their employees out of their income uh, rather than on the basis of uh, crisis level temporary fiscal support. Now, uh, Mr. President, you know, clearly we, we've been hit with a one in a hundred year uh, global pandemic that has had devastating impacts on our economy and on jobs. Uh, and, you know, we provided crisis level support. Uh, the next important decision is how we most appropriately transition uh, into the strongest possible recovery on the other side. And the government will continue to make responsible decisions order. in Senator that Wong context. A point of order. Point of order. The Prime Minister made a statement yesterday, and the question went to how many people he thinks will lose their jobs, as he contemplates in his statement. I'll ask the Minister to be directly relevant to the question. On the point of order? Well, the, the question directly uh, asked uh, actually how many uh, Australians uh, the government uh, intends to leave behind, and I directly answered that by making, by, uh, by making the point that the government doesn't want any Australian to be left behind and will continue um, to provide. I'll, I'll take so I was it, directly relevant. On the point of order, I do consider the Minister to be directly Directly relevant. There's an opportunity to debate the merits of answers after question time. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. The Australian people know that we uh, made uh, the best possible decisions in a set of very difficult circumstances to provide uh, transitional support to keep as many businesses in business, as many Australians in jobs as possible, and to provide enhanced support to those Australians who, through no fault of their own, lost their job. Uh, and and that, is, that is indeed what we've done. It was always clear that this would be a temporary arrangement, and the Australian people would, would expect us to help facilitate the strongest possible recovery as soon as possible so that all Australians, all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. And if they cannot continue uh, in uh, their job that they had before COVID, in their current uh, business that they work for, then we've got to make sure we create the uh, conditions where they can find a new and better job in another business. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. There are already 140,000 more people on Job Seeker than the government predicted for the month of June. How many more Australians does the government believe will join the 1.65 million already on Job Seeker when Mr. Morrison snaps back Job Keeper in September? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know, firstly, I reject the premise of the question. Um, what, I, what, I, what, I would, what I what I would say, what I what I what I would say is the government will continue to work. Uh, to maximise the strength of the recovery on the other side. The government will continue to make responsible uh, decisions and the government will continue to ensure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity uh, to get back into work if they've lost their jobs or to ensure that they can have uh, I, uh, to ensure that they can um, have a job in a business that is viable over the long term uh, if that business indeed is not able to recover post-COVID. Senator Wong, a final supplementary Thank question. You. Digital Finance Analytics has warned that as many as 100,000 Australian households will default on their mortgages when JobKeeper is removed in September, with more than 5 million Australians and their families currently relying on direct government support. Why is Mr Morrison continuing to insist on a flawed snapback strategy which will leave millions of Australians behind during the country's first recession in 29 years? Senator uh, th thank you very much, Mr uh, President. Uh, you know, Senator Wong can repeat false assertions uh, to scare people as often as she wants. It doesn't make them come true. What the government has said is that JobKeeper will remain in place for six months and that we will continue to make responsible decisions on how to most appropriately transition uh, into the strongest possible economic recovery on the other side. There is a review currently underway, uh, which uh, is uh, well publicised by Treasury. Uh, Treasury uh, will be putting advice and recommendations to the government, and the government will continue to make responsible decisions as we have uh, over the last few months, as we've been dealing with, an un with, a, with a one in a hundred year uh, global pandemic and devastating impacts on the Australian economy. Senator McGrath. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Minister, can you outline for the Senate how the Morrison government's plan for a stronger economy is guaranteeing essential services, including by maintaining and improving capacity in our health system throughout the course of the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McGrath for his question. Mr. President, in what has been one of the most intense periods in Australia's history, our health system has performed remarkably well. It has been, by all assessments, the envy of the world with the way it has been able to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. The way that our primary care system has responded to COVID-19 has been outstanding. Our doctors, our nurses, our pharmacists, supported of course now by telehealth. Our hospitals, where our hospital workers, our carers, our cleaners, our administrators, they have worked tirelessly to manage the cases that have arisen and increase our capacity to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak. And Mr President, I'm pleased to advise that in relation to our aged care network, as of yesterday, there are no active cases of COVID-19 in any aged care facilities in Australia. As of yesterday, we have now reduced the number of people in hospital because of COVID-19 to 17, and the number in ICU is now at four. Australians have also seen the positive results of our testing regime and our collective success in flattening the curve. Our testing regime has now seen over 1.8 million tests conducted across Australia. Of those, 7,335 Australians approximately have been diagnosed with COVID-19, and sadly, as we know, 102 have lost their lives. The rate of positive returns has now dropped to 0.4 per cent across the 1.8 million tests, and of those, 62 per cent of cases have come from overseas. Mr President, as a result of Australians working together to suppress COVID-19, our health system and those Order. who work tirelessly in it— Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. As the government has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, how has the government continued to invest in our health system to ensure it is resourced and ready for future challenges? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, throughout the course of COVID-19, uh, the Morrison government has continued to ensure that Australia's health system capacity will meet future challenges. We have reached a new hospital, national hospital reform agreement with the states and territories. Under this new agreement, the Commonwealth will increase its investment from $100 billion to $131 billion. At the same time, we are delivering a new five-year community pharmacy agreement that expands remuneration for the dispensing of subsidised PBS medicines, community pharmacy medication management programs and services to $18.349 billion over the five years of the agreement. Mr President, this is up $1.5 billion compared to the sixth community pharmacy agreement. Again, Australians can be assured that throughout the COVID-19 crisis, the Morrison government continues to invest Order. in the Senator health Cash. system. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate how this work has improved access to medicines? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, I think this is one of the great success stories of the Morrison government. That is, of course, as a government, we continue to make more medicines available for patients on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Since 2013, because of our strong economic management, our government has approved now more than 2,400 new or amended listings on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. This represents an average of around 30 medicine listings or amendments per month or one each day, at an overall investment by the government of $11.6 billion. Mr. President, Australians with asthma and multiple myeloma will have broader access to life-changing medicines as a result of expanded medicines listings on the PBS scheme from 1 June 2020. Our government, the Morrison government, we are committed to ensuring that Australians that 
need to access affordable medicines Order. Senator are Cash, able time to, to the do so. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Does the government remain committed to withdrawing the coronavirus supplement in September? And what is the minister's advice to the 2.3 million Australians who will be $550 per fortnight worse off? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Senator Gallagher, for her question about what has been an extraordinarily important issue uh, over the last three months and a very important supplement that has been in place to help those people who find themselves without a job during a time when the job market is effectively closed. Um, we have supercharged our safety net to assist people who find themselves unemployed uh, because and during a time of completely unprecedented unemployment uh, pressure on our market. But we said at the time, and we remain committed, to temporary, targeted, time-limited measures to help Australians to get through the crisis that is before us. We always said that our measures that we put in place, not just the coronavirus supplement, but many other measures that this government put in place to make sure that we could assist Australians who were immediately impacted um, and, and um, with a, an impact that came about um, in the most extraordinary circumstances, that we've supported them through this time. We remain committed to supporting Australians uh, during the coronavirus crisis, but we also remain um, committed to making sure that we put our economy back on track. Um, but, uh, so in answer to your question, uh, the time limit determined measures, uh, um, uh, measures have been put in place to meet the extraordinary circumstances of the coronavirus pandemic. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. The 2.3 million Australians include hundreds of thousands of students, widows, farmers and parents. How many of the 2.3 million does the government th think are lifters and how many are leaners? Senator Rustin. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr President. What I can tell the senator uh, in response to her question is that this government is absolutely committed, always has been from the day that we became aware that we were faced with this absolutely enormous crisis that was before us that became very evident in February, is that we were going to work with the Australian public, we were going to work with the Australian community. In fact, we were even working with the, uh, the Australian federal opposition and the oppositions and the governments in the states and territories around Australia so that we could all work together so we could support all Australians through this crisis. And in doing so, in doing so, one of the most important things that we can do as a government is to make sure that our economy is supported so that jobs are recreated, so that we can get people who are currently unemployed back into employment as quickly as possible. And that's exactly what the focus of this government has been right the way through. Support people during the time when there was unemployment, but to make sure the jobs are recreated so they can get back to work as soon as possible. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr President. Department Department of Social Services figures show that the coronavirus um, supplement will be providing at least $2.6 billion per month in direct fiscal support in September. Why is the government insisting on a $2.6 billion per month hit to the economy during Australia's first recession in 29 years? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the Australian government, the Morrison government, the coalition government is absolutely committed to putting the right measures into our economy to make sure two very clear things happen. One is that we support Australians who need our support during this time, and the other one is to make sure that we get the economy kick started on the other side of this so that we can actually have the jobs so people can go back. Um, those opposite would know, uh, those opposite seem to think that they have got to, uh, some some sort of claim on monetary and fiscal policy within the economy. If they'd like to have a look at Economics 101, you'd actually realise there are many ways that you can stimulate an economy, whether it's through fiscal or monetary policy. Um, and, and as uh, Senator Smith behind Order. me said, reducing the tax burden. I mean, for some reason, you seem absolutely fixated on particular things that you might think are the only way to stimulate the economy. Well, we on this side know that you have to have a suite of measures, a full package, to make sure that you Order. are taking a holistic approach to looking after all Australians. Order. Order. I will call the next question. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Environment Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced plans to cut environmental laws to fast track assessments of developments and mining projects. This plan cuts corners and removes vital checks 
on the impact projects will have on our environment. Why is your government weakening protection for the environment that will put Australia's forests, our beaches, our native animals and our ancient historical sites at further risk? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for her question. Although I do reject uh, many of the claims that Senator Hanson Young has made in that, uh, in that question, Mr. President. Now, what our government takes pride in doing is upholding environmental laws, but making sure that we don't strangle economic activity in a morass of green tape and indecision and lack of progress in terms of analysing and assessing the applications that come before us. So, our government. Minister for the Environment President, has worked hard to make sure that decision-making is more efficient and effective. That is something that should be applauded around this place. Now, rather than projects sitting there waiting, not knowing whether they are approved or not approved, we actually are backing them to get through the pipeline. Where conditions need to be applied, they are applied. Where they need to be rejections, they are rejected. But, Mr President, what the Prime Minister announced yesterday was a $25 million investment in specialist project teams, new approaches to information sharing between the Commonwealth and states to reduce backlogs, to reduce the time taken for assessments, to make sure that there is less duplication of assessments between the Commonwealth and the states. This is simply about making our environmental regulation more efficient, more effective, so that it can serve its purpose of protecting our environment and our biodiversity and our conservation needs but that it does not strangle economic development, and particularly at a point of time in our nation when we want to make sure that those investments that can go ahead do go ahead. We want to make sure that those who are willing to put money on the table and to make projects happen that will generate jobs for Australians, that that goes ahead wherever possible, wherever it is not in breach of our environmental laws, not that it sits somewhere in the backdrop for years just waiting for somebody to make a decision. We're not afraid to make decisions, but we will make sure we make the right decisions for our environment and for the jobs of Australians. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you. Australia has already lost one million hectares of koala habitat because of the weak environmental laws in place. Koalas in some areas are now endangered. Minister, you have pledged to uphold environmental laws. Will you guarantee that not one more hectare of koala habitat will be destroyed under your plans. Senator Birmingham. Well, thank you. Well, thanks, Mr. President. I'm sure, I'm sure Senator Hanson Young does actually know that across different parts of Australia uh, there are indeed uh, different areas of habitat for koala species uh, and quite different population trends in, uh, in those different parts of Australia as well. So Senator Hanson Young invites me to come in here and give some blanket guarantee about koalas overall and not one more hectare, without acknowledging the fact that in different parts of the country there are absolutely strong, vibrant populations of koalas that we want to see continue to be strong and vibrant populations. But that's not to say that there can't be complementary developments, particularly of a tourism nature or the like, that can ensure sustainable activity in those communities and continue to preserve uh, koala populations and habitat as is necessary. And that's the careful balancing act that we commit to undertaking to make sure we preserve uh, those most important species for Australians, but also that we ensure Australians have jobs as well. Order. Senator Patrick, oh, sorry, Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister guarantee that fast-tracking approvals for mines and projects will not result in any more blasting of ancient historical sites, such as the destruction of a 46,000-year-old sacred site in WA last month by Rio Tinto. Will you fix the laws to guarantee that this type of environmental vandalism will never, ever occur again? Senator Birmingham. Thank, th thanks, Mr President. I know it suits the agenda for the Australian Greens to come in and to, of course, make everything you know, the fault of uh, the government standing here to ignore completely the reality of decision making that might be the responsibility of state or territory governments uh, to figure that the EPBC Act is somehow a one stop shop for every form of protection to occur. Uh, but the truth lies elsewhere. It certainly doesn't lie in the picture painted uh, by the Australian Greens. Uh, now, Mr. President, uh, I in no way 
uh, condone uh, unnecessary destruction of heritage, particularly of Indigenous heritage, uh, which has a crucial role to play uh, in sectors such as our tourism industry uh, and, of course, uh, is so important in terms of preserving the culture uh, of our first Australians. But, Mr President, um, I won't take uh, lectures from the Australian Greens or suggestions that somehow the policies of this government uh, are to fault or are to blame uh, for actions or decisions of state or territory Order, governments Senator and their Birmingham. regulatory authorities. Senator Patrick. To do what you don't is to Order. Leave. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Concerns Government Procurement and Expenditure. Austender shows that since 2016, the construction giant Lendlease has won federal contracts worth more than $661 million, the overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly for Defence Department construction. In addition, the Defence Minister announced in April this year the award of further contracts valued at $365 million, bringing Lendlease's total haul to over $1 billion. Is it not the case that the tax officer's uh, tax transparency reports show that the five years from 2013-14 to 2017-18, Lendlease generated $43 billion in revenue, generated a, pro a profit before tax of more than $5 billion, but didn't pay a cent in corporate income tax. Are you aware that the company's own reports further show that they paid no income tax in 1819 and don't expect to pay some for any uh, some any time yet? How do you reconcile awarding billions of dollars of contracts to corporate giants that pay no Order. corporate tax? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, every business in Australia that makes uh, taxable income uh, has to comply with uh, Australian uh, tax laws and pay and pay uh, income tax according to our laws. I'm not going to discuss the tax affairs of individual uh, taxpayers. That wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, furthermore, I mean, you do know, of course, that tender decisions are not made uh, by uh, the government of the day. They're made following a proper, rigorous uh, tender process, uh, appropriately at arm's length from uh, the government of the day. I think you would expect that to happen, uh, based on a proper assessment of the relative merits of uh, specific uh, proposals in Australia. Uh, we, you know, in, businesses are not taxed on their revenue, they're taxed based on their taxable income and uh, you know, on that basis, of course, every business must comply with our tax laws. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The government's own figures and announcements show that Lendlease has been awarded more, nearly $800 million in contracts this year, 2020, and it's only June. In these circumstances, why is Lendlease allowed to access the JobKeeper program to pay some 15% nearly 1,400 members of its 9,200 Australian workforce when it seems flush with contracts. contracts. Um, how do you justify uh, this company milking taxpayers' money when they pay no corporate tax? Order. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, I, I don't accept the premise of the question. I mean, the uh, terms and conditions on which uh, businesses can access uh, support through the JobKeeper program are well known for businesses with a turnover of less than a billion dollars. It uh, requires a 30 per cent drop uh, in, in turnover. For businesses uh, with a turnover of more than a billion, it has, you know, there is a uh, bigger test, a higher test, a more difficult test. Indeed, they've got to demonstrate a 50 per cent drop uh, in turnover. So, uh, again, I'm not going to talk about the specific affairs of individual businesses or individual taxpayers. That would be inappropriate. But, uh, but in the broad, uh, the um, terms and conditions on which uh, individual businesses can access uh, that program, which has supported uh, you know, more than three million Australian workers, uh, are of course uh, the same for everyone. Yeah. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, to the Finance Minister, uh, the information I'm talking about uh, in relation to income tax comes from tax transparency data published by the ATO on Lendlease. Why is the government comfortable in awarding billions of dollars of, of contracts to a company, Lendlease? That has not paid a brass razu in corporate tax for well over five years. Senator Cormann. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I refer uh, Senator Patrick to my first answer to the primary question. Uh, we expect uh, all uh, Australian businesses to comply with our tax laws and uh, to pay um, corporate tax or relevant taxes. You know, corporate tax in this uh, instance in relation to their taxable income. Now, if, you, uh, have a, uh, if, if the suggestion in your question is uh, that somehow this business that you're referencing has broken the law, uh, then I would uh, encourage you to make relevant uh, reports 
uh, to uh, compliance authorities, to law enforcement authorities. Uh, you know, if a business that complies with the law, laws and uh, employs many, many Australians, complies with the laws and provides, of course, uh, you know, important services uh, to Australia, of course, if they win on merit, a tender. I don't think that you would suggest that we should politically interfere in preventing a business from uh, taking on a tender that they've won uh, based on a proper competition and assessment at arm's length from government. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the minister said that Home Builder would be, and I quote, directly supporting 140,000 tradies and a further up to one million jobs indirectly in the residential construction sector. ASIC estimates there are 1,183,000 people employed in the entire construction sector last year. Does the minister stand by his claim that every single construction job in the country will be supported by Home Builder? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Thank you Corbyn. very much, Mr President. I, I, would, I would encourage Senator Gallagher to reflect on the words directly and indirectly, uh, and indeed I stand by my answer. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Order. Thank you, Mr President. My uh, supplementary question is, what is the total value of private investment that the government expects to generate through the home builder Program. Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think I've gone through all this uh, in some uh, detail uh, yesterday. Um, <laughs> I've, I've gone through this uh, in some detail yesterday. We expect uh, that about uh, 27,000 projects will be supported through this program. Uh, the terms and conditions of this program uh, are well known, and uh, you know we'll report on it on the other side of uh, this period uh, that has been in place. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, does the government believe that Home Builder will fully offset the projected decline in the residential construction sector employment? Senator uh, th Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, it, this is not a program that operates on its own. I mean, this is a program that will make an important contribution to supporting workers in the residential construction sector, and of course, in a number of states, uh, and, and uh, in a number of states, state jurisdictions will be complementing this scheme. Uh, and and I, I can see, I can see that the Labor Party clearly doesn't like uh, supporting. Uh, supporting workers in the residential construction sector doesn't doesn't like doesn't like uh, supporting workers in the residential uh, construction order. sector. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order. What we don't like is ministers misleading That's about their numbers. Necessary. That's Senator what we don't Wong, like. You know better than well, that on a point of order. I didn't hear a reflection or imputation there. I must say, I'll call Senator Cormann to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. You know, we will continue to do uh, what we have been doing. We will continue to make decisions to support working families around Australia. We let the Labor Party continue to do what they are doing. We let you continue to throw verbal rocks, verbal rocks at the government. We will just get on with the job. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister outline some of the support measures the Morrison government is implementing to support the tourism industry in response to the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Molan for, uh, for his question. Uh, as was clear from the release of yesterday's overseas arrivals and departures data, uh, there's no industry in Australia that would be suffering any more or, frankly, has been suffering for any longer period of time this year than our tourism industry. And tourism operators right across the country deserve uh, the thanks of everyone for the sacrifices they, along with so many others, uh, are making uh, to help ensure our country stays safe at present, uh, particularly given the burden that is falling upon them as a result of the necessary uh, closure of international travel uh, borders uh, into Australia. Uh, as senators know and, uh, and indeed debate and contest, uh, the $260 billion package of economic support measures we've got in place uh, is playing a crucial role in supporting many of those tourism industry businesses and their employees at present. Now, those assistance measures range across the small business payments uh, that we are making uh, to those many businesses, particularly family-owned small and medium-sized businesses in the tourism space. Uh, we've provided as well 
aviation industry support, financing solutions and, of course, JobKeeper payments and that are supporting so many different parts of the tourism sector. We've also stepped in where there are additional fixed and specific costs in businesses that, were they to go under, it could threaten the viability of a tourism region or ecosystem. In particular, I give the example of our $94 million package for exhibiting zoos and aquariums. Uh, this is an important package that acknowledges that in those businesses, whilst JobKeeper uh, measures may be helping with staff costs, whilst rent relief may be helping with other costs, uh, whilst the small business payments may be helping with other normal ongoing costs, there are high fixed additional costs uh, that we've provided support for in terms of the care and treatment of animals and ensuring the welfare of those animals uh, within those, uh, those important tourism attractions uh, across our many regions and cities of Australia. Senator Moll on a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government's plan for a stronger economy, including record and growing infrastructure investment, continues to support the tourism industry? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, while these are dark days for our tourism operators, we are determined to support our tourist regions in particular to be ready to capitalise as states and territories reopen travel within and across uh, their states and ultimately uh, for when we do get back to hosting many millions of international visitors to our country again. In the 2019-20 budget, our government announced a further $200 million towards a fourth round of the Building Better Regions Fund, uh, which has brought that fund and program to an excess of $800 million of investment. It's in addition to programs like our $50 million Tourism Icons program. And just a fortnight ago, uh, our government announced 163 successful projects under round four of the BBRF, and many of those support crucial tourism infrastructure in the regions across Australia. In my home state of South Australia, for example, the Silver to Seaway, uh, finishing in Port Pirie, a crucial development in Senator Molan's in New South Wales, the Condoblin Tourism Precinct, offering uh, the banks of Lachlan Border, River Senator in Western Birmingham, New South Wales enhanced tourism. Expired. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. How, how is the government encouraging Australians to visit and support bushfire impacted regions in my home state of New South Wales? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, no, uh, no senator in this place I think has greater appreciation and understanding of the impact the bushfires had in, uh, in parts of New South Wales than Senator Molan. Uh, and, uh, and I thank you for your advocacy for many regions in, uh, in those parts of New South Wales. Uh, we, of course, uh, initiated various tourism campaigns before COVID-19 hit to try to encourage travel across those regions, and we stand ready to recommence those as uh, border restrictions and travel advisories allows. Now, such campaigns showed off the stunning Glasshouse Rocks in Naruma, uh, alongside an interview with, uh, with zookeeper Chad from the Featherside Sydney Wildlife Park and the Mogo Zoo. Uh, we've made sure that we've promoted 10 country towns near Sydney that people should take a day trip to this winter, uh, which featured the southern highlands, Berrima and Barrel, and the south coast, Jamboree and Kiama. Uh, the best spots for beach camping in New South Wales, which showcased Eurobedella's Mystery Bay and Mamusa Rocks National Park's Picnic Point. Uh, the Snowy Mountains also featured in our Live Order, from Australia Senator campaign. Birmingham. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. On the 19th of March 2020, the Minister confirmed that at least one incident of alleged war crimes from Afghanistan has been referred to the AFP. The Inspector General ADF confirmed in his annual report that George Brereton is investigating 55 separate incidents, many of which may also lead to referral to the AFP. In the interim, families of affected ADF or former ADF members have told me they are being provided internal ADF legal support through Defence Council Services for the IGADF inquiry. But what terrifies them is the uncertainty surrounding funding available to pay for expensive criminal trials flowing from that inquiry. If provided, this funding would be made pursuant to a policy known as legal assistance at Commonwealth expense, which is discretionary. Members have no certainty that they will get the legal representation that they need for a fair trial. Is the minister aware that, because of this uncertainty, many of those under investigation are now contemplating mortgaging their family homes or commencing public GoFundMe pages to fund their criminal defence teams? Order. Senator Reynolds, the Minister for Defence. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Lambie for raising this very important issue. And before coming to the specifics of this question and uh, the letter I provided you in response to this, uh, to this issue, can I just say to all in this chamber that it is well known that this inquiry is underway. 
It is an extensive and a very complex inquiry involving incredibly serious subject matters, and many witnesses and lines of inquiry have occurred. Now, in the course of uh, this inquiry, um, I, I did table the Inspector General ADF's uh, annual report uh, a few months ago, which did uh, make very clear the serious nature of uh, the inquiries uh, under, uh, under review by him. The Chief of Defence Force has advised me that the inquiry report will be handed to him uh, in coming months. He will then consider its findings and, with my close oversight, will determine the actions uh, required in consultation with the IGADF. Now, where there are serious rumours and allegations raised about the conduct of our ADF members, Australians would rightly expect that they are thoroughly examined according to the rigorous and well-established processes that are in place. Australians would, of course, also expect all ADF members to be treated with the utmost fairness throughout these processes and also, of course, their family members. Now, in relation to the specific issue that Senator Lambie has raised with me, uh, I can confirm that uh, legal support will be provided, and I'm currently discussing that with the Chief of Defence Force and also the Attorney General on how that uh, will occur. But at all times during the conduct of the inquiry and through its conclusion to the next phases, a range of legal, psychological, medical, pastoral and social work support services continue to be made available to inquiry witnesses and other individuals impacted. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When Australian ADF personnel last faced similar prosecutions in 2010, the then Chief of Defence Force, Angus Hewson, told this Senate that no expense will be spared to fund the defence of soldiers facing prosecution. Will the minister, like she just hasn't then, give a commitment and confirm that it is her expectation that legal assistance at Commonwealth expense will be afforded to any ADF or former ADF member facing criminal prosecutions from their service in Afghanistan, including funding lawyers of their choice? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, as I said, Senator Lambie uh, has uh, Senator Lambie, you'd have raised this previously with me, and I have also confirmed uh, these matters with you in writing. Uh, but for the benefit of all senators, I want to be very clear that throughout the inquiry, the IGADF has worked well in establishing the processes to ensure that witnesses are provided with access to legal support. And I, as I confirmed in writing to Senator Lambie, it is a long-standing position that current and former serving ADF members can apply for Commonwealth financial assistance for civil or criminal legal proceedings that they are involved in. And if the proceedings arise out of an incident relating to their service with defence and that they have acted responsibly and reasonably, uh, then this will be provided. Uh, Senator Lambie, and as I have just uh, restated, is it is absolutely my intent to ensure, and it is the CDF's intent to ensure, that those who are caught up in this Order. process Senator Reynolds, uh, do, do, get the, do continue to get the expired. support. Thank Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The word discretionary. Let's go again. The IGADF state on their website that defence cares about the welfare of all personnel involved in the Afghanistan inquiry. We know the AFP investigating now, and the Commonwealth has already appointed a prosecutor. What I'm hearing is that many ADF members strongly feel that this commitment to their welfare is nothing more than lip service. And if the minister is refusing to guarantee legal assistance, then what is the minister going to do to ensure that ADF members are placed on an even footing and get a fair bloody trial like they deserve? I urge senators to watch their language in the chamber about what is parliamentary, Senator Lambie. One can be passionate and we might use parliamentary language. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And as I've said, I've already stated twice uh, the support that is being required, uh, that is being provided, and will continue to be required. But Senator Lambie has raised a prior precedent in relation to this matter. And can I emphasise to all in this place that this earlier matter that Senator Lambie uh, quotes is not a precedent in the current circumstances. And the IGADF annual report makes it very clear that the Afghanistan inquiry is not focused on conduct that occurred in the heat of battle. Uh, and so that is a very important uh, differentiator in this circumstance. But as has been provided throughout this process, uh, all legal, psychological uh, and family support has been provided and will continue to be provided. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. 
Last month, the Prime Minister promised that all bushfire-affected properties in New South Wales will be cleared of debris by the end of June. Will Mr Morrison keep his promise? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As I'm sure uh, Senator Watt would know, uh, it is actually the New South Wales state government that is doing uh, the uh, job on the ground, supported by the federal government, which is, which is uh, providing 50 per cent uh, of the uh, funding for, to uh, pay for the cost of the uh, cleanup. I, I am uh, happy to inform uh, Senator um, Watt, that as of um, 11 May, uh, I, I believe that about 2,500 out of 3,700 uh, houses had their the debris cleared. About 130 crew across New South Wales are working as we speak uh, with about uh, 300 um, uh, houses uh, cleared of debris a week. Um, of course, we, I mean, state authorities, the relevant authorities in New South Wales will continue to work as fast as they can. My advice is that most, most debris will be Order. cleared by the end of June and all uh, is expected to be completed by 31 July. In all of the circumstances, including the impact of COVID-19, uh, I would have thought that the Labor Party would understand that we are dealing in a particular circumstance that is more challenging than we envisaged uh, uh, you know, back, in, back in January. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Government figures show that in Snowy Monero, not one out of 119 bushfire-affected properties had been cleared of debris. In Queen Bee and Palarang, just one in 13 bushfire-affected properties has been cleared of debris. And in New South Wales, fewer than one in three bushfire-affected properties have been cleared of debris. Why has Mr Morrison failed to live up to his promise to clear New South Wales of bushfire debris by the 30th of June? Senator Cormann. And, and, and here we go. Here, here we, here, here we see what it's all about. Here, here we see what it's about. Here we can see what it's about. I mean, look, our, our government will continue to do what we can to support New South Wales in working Order. as fast as possible in providing support to bushfire Order. affected communities and in relation, in relation to, um, in relation to uh, cleaning of debris across uh, bushfire affected uh, areas and include in particular in the electorate that uh, Senator Watt uh, has mentioned, uh, I'm advised that by 20 June about 208 um, uh, properties are expected to be cleared, 188 now. Uh, in Snowy Mon Monero, 31 will be cleared by 20 June, 11 today. Um, by in uh, Queen Bee and uh, Palarang, 64 will be cleared by 20 June, 48 today. Um, and in Vega Valley, 431 uh, will be cleared by 20 June, 375 as, you know, as of today. And uh, Euro Bodella, uh, 600 will be cleared by 20 June and uh, 570 by, by today. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Why, when the promised clearing of bushfire debris hasn't happened, small businesses are struggling and bushfire survivors are still living in caravans, is the Prime Minister spending nearly $300,000 on market research on bushfires instead of providing survivors with the immediate support he has promised? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I completely reject the premise of the question. About $1.4 billion worth of funding out of $2 billion uh, is already hitting the ground as we speak. In, in communities and supporting individuals, and that is on top. That is on top of a. That is on top of a whole series of funding already available through existing Order. disaster recovery measures. Uh, you know, like uh, our, 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 the prime minister works tirelessly every single day, tirelessly every single day, to ensure that communities across Eden Monero and indeed all around Australia uh, receive the support. Uh, that they deserve and that they need through this difficult period. Uh, we have, I mean, certainly the communities in the communities in Monero have been uh, hit hard with bushfires, and of course are also feeling the impact of uh, the coronavirus crisis. And I know that in the Liberal National uh, Morrison McCormack government, uh, they they are getting they are getting uh, order. They are getting a lot of that. They are getting our absolute best support that we can possibly that order, we can possibly Senator deploy. Foreman. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Australian community has been doing a lot of heavy lifting to ensure they stop the spread of COVID-19. This coalition government has been the envy of the world with the swift measures it took to protect the health of Australians. Can the Minister update the Senate on what the government's plan is for opening our state and territory borders? 
And if we do not, what are the implications for our economy? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator uh, Thank Ford. you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for that important question. Uh, our government has been working closely with state and territory governments through the national government process to lift restrictions across the nation in a way which is COVID safe, but as uh, swiftly as possible. Uh, as the Federal Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Chief Medical Officer have made clear on a number of occasions, there is no medical reason for any state borders to remain closed. In fact, there is no health advice in front of us that state or territory borders need to be closed. The closure of state borders is having a significant negative impact on our economy. With international borders closed, tourism operators will need to rely on domestic holiday makers to fill the void from international tourists. Tourism is worth around 3.1 per cent of our GDP or around $60 billion last financial year. In fact, tourism, the tourism sector, employs around 670,000 Australians or 5.2 per cent of all workers. That is why the longer the state and territory borders stay closed, the bigger the impact on our national economy. The clear three-stage plan to lift restrictions included borders being opened in July. The Prime Minister said that there was a very open and constructive discussion at National Cabinet last Friday about reopening borders, and we're also proposing to work closely with states on a pilot basis to enable international students uh, to come to Australia in a very controlled setting. But clearly, and this is an important point, and I think it's an important point for uh, the uh, people in the Territory, uh, while travel to a state or a territory is not allowed from other parts of Australia, we cannot consider travel to that jurisdiction from overseas. Uh, and if we want to ensure that uh, tourism operators and businesses around Australia have the best possible opportunity to be successful again and to hire uh, more Australians and more Territorians, uh, we need to see those borders come down as swiftly as possible. Senator McMahon, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate if the Commonwealth is aware of when the states and territories, like my Northern Territory, are going to reopen their borders? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. It was agreed at National Cabinet on Friday that all states except WI would look at uh, reopening their borders in July. Uh, this was in line with uh, National Cabinet reconfirming its commitment to the three-step framework for COVID safe Australia to be completed in July 2020. South Australia is committed to reopening uh, their borders from July 20. Queensland was expected to be on track for July reopening, although media reporting is now putting some doubt over that based on comments from Queensland Premier uh, Palushai in their parliament today, Order. where she said that the borders will remain closed, and I'm quoting, Order. while there is active transmission. The Chief Minister of the Northern Territory has indicated he will make an announcement by the end of this week. Tasmania has no date for reopening, and my home state of Western Australia has indicated it will not be reopening its borders in July. The Australian Government is intervening in three High Court cases that challenge the closure of the WA and Queensland state borders. Uh, the Commonwealth Attorney General is intervening to my constitutional arguments in support of opening Order. our state Senator borders. Solman. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline the coalition government's plan to assist rural and regional economies to return to prosperity post-COVID-19 restrictions? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McMahon for another very good question. Uh, the coalition government understands the COVID-19 pandemic is having a disproportionate impact on some sectors, regions and communities, including those heavily reliant on industries such as tourism and agriculture. This is why we are providing a $1 billion relief and recovery fund to support regions, communities and industry sectors that have been disproportionately affected. That is why yesterday we announced further infrastructure investments which included $1.5 billion for roads. These roads, this, these roads packages include key investments that help rural and regional Australia such as the beef roads in northern Queensland and the Bustle Highway in Western Australia, roads which will form vital linkage points to ports and to our key markets. Uh, there's still a long way to go in recovering from this once in a hundred year global pandemic, but we are heading in the right direction and we will continue to do all that is necessary to ensure Australians and our rural and regional economies have the best possible opportunity to return Order. to prosperity. Senator Coleman, uh, time has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Oh, no. I refer to the Minister's statements regarding the retention bonus for aged care workers. 
Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, we never said at any point in time that these support bonuses would be tax-free. That was never said. Does the minister concede that his media release of 20 March 2020 described the payments as after tax? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, uh, and at no point in any of those statements that uh, Senator Walsh has just read, I thank her for the question, uh, uh, particularly in my press release, did I say that the uh, bonus would be tax-free? <laughs> Never said that it would be tax-free. Uh, and, uh, and that's exactly what I said yesterday. We never, at any point in time, Mr. President, indicated that this bonus would be tax-free. We said, uh, at all times, we said at all times that these bonuses would be uh, up to $800 and up to $600. But we never Senator, said at Senator any point Colbert, in time. That a point of order, Senator Wong. Uh, direct relevance. It was a very specific question. Does the minister concede that his media release described the payments as after tax? I have um, asked the minister, ask you, to remind the minister of this question. The, the, the minister, at the point you interrupted him, Senator Wong, I believe was actually directly addressing, albeit challenging, the assertion contained in the question. Now that is a matter for debate after question time. It's not a matter for me to direct the minister how to answer the question, but. I believe he was being directly relevant, and opposition senators can say something after question time in the appropriate slot. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, thanks, Senator Wong. Uh, at no point, at no point in time, did the government say that these bonuses would be tax-free. At no point. Senator, Senator did Wong, we say they were on, on, on a point of order. Thank you. Yep. Point of order. Um, I seek leave to table the minister's statement, which says clearly the words "after tax per quarter" on two occasions. I mean, this is becoming a Senator, farce. Senator Question Wong. time should Senator have Wong. some accountability order. associated order. with it. Order. He simply Senator lied. Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that particular accusation directed at an individual. Right. He, Senator. he is simply not telling the truth, Mr. President. I, I need to. Uh, oh, I need sorry, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Cormann, on the point of order. There are some basic courtesies when it comes to tabling of documents. Senator Wong has been here long enough to know. <laughs> on the order. Order. On the point of order. Opposition senators who wish to challenge the minister's answer have an opportunity to do so after question time. This, the, the, the point of I, um, Senator Wong, he is directly addressing the terms of the question, and you have an opportunity to debate it. I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. I've allowed you to do so, Senator Wong, on two occasions. Um, and, and Senator Wong, the, question, the question, answer can be debated after question time. But as long as the minister is addressing the terms of the question, and he is directly addressing the terms of the question, I do not have the authority to direct him how to answer a question. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, the, the statement in my press release does not mean tax-free, which is the implication Order. that the Labor Party are trying to make. And so the, the two statements are completely and utterly uh, compatible. I, the government at no point indicated that these bonuses would be tax-free, uh, and because that is not the way income bonuses work. They are clearly subject to tax, because at no point in time did we say they would be tax-free. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, can the minister assist the Senate by telling us what he thinks the words "after tax" mean? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. President, the words "after tax" do not mean tax-free. Clearly, do not mean tax-free. And, Mr. President, we, at no point in time, the government, at no point in time, said that these bonuses would be tax-free. Mr. President. And quite frankly, I am very proud of the fact that this government recognised a Senator particular Pratt. sector of the Australian workforce to provide them with Senator, additional. Me. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Point of order is relevance. We just want to know what after tax means. Sorry, Senator um, Watt. I, I believe 
the minister is here is being directly relevant. I will listen carefully. He's 27 seconds in. Um, he was asked about what a term means, and he is actually directly addressing in that particular part of the question, which was the only part of the question. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, only the Labor Party could make a full glass sound as though it's empty. This government made a very deliberate decision to provide support to aged care workers during the COVID-19 pandemic because of the circumstance they found them in, themselves in. And we said we, that they were important to the government, they were important to the community, and so we made a decision to provide up to $800 and up to $600 for residential aged care workers and home care workers to support them through the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Why did the minister's press release use the phrase after tax if not to suggest that these bonuses would be tax free? Why does the minister find it so hard to own up to his mistakes? Senator Colbert. Mr. President, as I said, uh, thanks, Senator uh, Walsh, for the supplementary question. Uh, as I said in my previous answer, after tax does not mean tax free. It's a very, very simple statement. It's a very, very Senator simple, Pratt. It's a very simple statement, Mr. President, and I'm very proud of the fact that this government provided support to residential aged care workers and home care workers. In fact, this group of workers is the only group of workers in the Australian economy that was provided with direct support to recognise the work that they do through the, pand the coronavirus can pandemic, in recognition, Mr. President, of the fact that their work is so important in, in the care of senior Australians. A very specific decision, Mr. President, to support residential and home care workers to, to look after senior Australians through the pandemic because of the importance of the work that they do. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Family and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister advise the Senate what the Morrison government is doing to support Australia's oldest Australians and guaranteeing essential services for our seniors, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister for um, Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much to Senator Smith for his question. Uh, and also, can I um, thank him for the recognition of the commitment that we all have to making sure that we support older Australians uh, within our communities, particularly uh, recognising the significant contribution that older Australians make to our economy and to our society, and recognising also the impact that the COVID uh, pandemic has had on all Australians, particularly our older Australians. So it was with uh, we were, were pleased to be able to uh, to put into place for all eligible pensioners and uh, seniors two payments of $750 in addition uh, to any other payments that they were receiving to help them with the economic and the costs associated with the pandemic. So on the, as of the 31st of uh, March 2020, the first round of these payments went out uh, and were success successfully delivered um, to 3.4 million Australian pensioners, uh, as well as 170,000 carers who were on carer allowance. 230,000 uh, veterans payments and Commonwealth gold card holders, as well as 375,000 uh, Commonwealth seniors health, ca health care card holders. The second payment will be made in July and will be made to those people who have not been in receipt of the coronavirus supplement. Um, additionally, we have also recognised that, that with very low interest rates, um, that deeming rates needed to be reduced. So around 900,000 Australians who were living on incomes, who were income support, uh, recipients who also had uh, uh, amounts of uh, liquid assets in excess of the, uh, the uh, acceptable levels or the, the uh, threshold levels also received a drop in their deeming rates. And these reflected the lower uh, interest rates in the economy. Uh, equally, we have been very keen to make sure that our pension and loan scheme is available to older Australians so that they can, in effect, reverse mortgage their properties to make sure they can Order have the Senator additional Rustin. money. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on what initiatives the government has implemented to support our senior Australians? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, we know that about a third of our senior Australians live alone, and with social distancing and the measures that we've had to put in place over the coronavirus uh, pandemic, has mean, meant that many of them are relying on different ways to become connected. So, connecting online or on the phone is especially important at this time for our older Australians, and that's why we have put additional funds in to two particular initiatives to help prevent loneliness and social isolation for older Australians. The first is a $5 million package to significantly expand the Friends Line, which is a telephone line. It's free and it's anonymous, and it allows older Australians to chat with a friendly volunteer about whatever issue may be concerning them. Um, and the funding will boost the line to allow an extra 15,000 calls to be answered uh, um, in the period. Uh, in addition, we've put another million dollars uh, into a program called Be Connected, where older Australians who find themselves with technology that may not be able to, to be used or they don't have any a mobile phone or, or a Order, computer— Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Smith, final supplementary. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government is supporting our volunteers, especially our senior volunteers? Senator, Rust Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, senior volunteers make up a very significant proportion of Australian volunteers. Uh, and we know that during the COVID pandemic, many of our older Australians have chosen not to continue to volunteer um, because of health risks or accessibility. Um, and that saw a significant decline uh, in the number of people that were volunteering. And we understand the significant impact this makes on our economy. Um, and for that reason, we have made sure that we've continued to be able to put measures in place, including awarding uh, a number of 2,698 grants um, across uh, an, an, a number of areas, but across an, um, a lot of organisations, between $1,000 and $5,000 to be able to help them. Um, and we'd like to particularly thank Volunteers Australia and acknowledge all of Australia's volunteers and the amazing job that they do, because we know that the, uh, the economic benefits and the yield that all Australians and Australia receives from volunteering is absolutely immense, and we thank them. Order. Senator Rustin. Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. I ask senators to pause for a moment. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Crimes Legislation Amendment Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019 and informing the Senate that the House has agreed to amendment numbers one and three and disagreed to amendment number two made by the Senate. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I move that the message be considered in committee of the whole immediately. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Oh, Senator McKim, sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, well, thank you, President. Are you, um, are you speaking to the consideration of the of the to the consideration whether we should go into committee to consider in, it? Indeed. Yes, indeed. Senator McKim. Um, well, it's quite unusual for um, the government to make uh, this suggestion in a motion uh, immediately after the minute before uh, the Senate has had uh, an opportunity um, to consider at any length at all. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the position of the House and uh, the request um, from the House. Now, uh, what we do know is that in the other place today, Labor uh, backflipped uh, and has abandoned its opposition to mandatory sentencing. And uh, you know, I can hear some uh, some interjections from. Uh, coalition senators here that, uh, that say that that's exactly what the Labor Party um, should do. And I'll, I'll address this in, uh, in more detail when, uh, when we get into the committee. But I do want to uh, simply make the point here that this is an unseemly haste from the government, and I expect that the Labor Party, in fact, is going to support this motion because it's embarrassed at its backflip. And so it should be embarrassed uh, at its backflip because, in fact, um, the backflip that Labor uh, is engaged in here today, uh, firstly, is in direct contravention to its own policy. Labor's policy says this, Labor opposes mandatory sentencing, and so Labor should oppose mandatory sentencing. And so Labor did oppose mandatory sentencing yesterday in this parliament, when in fact they joined with the Australian Greens and members of the crossbench 
to reject the mandatory sentencing provisions of this legislation. Yet here we are today, with Labor having backflipped in the House and supported the mandatory sentencing provisions uh, of this legislation, and now I have no doubt helping the government ram this legislation through the parliament today. Now, let's be very clear about what this legislation does. Should it be successful, which it now will, thanks to this appalling backflip and walk away from its own policy by the Labor Party, is placed at significant risk teenagers in Australia engaging in what over human history has been quite normal teenage behaviour. And I'll take that interjection. I don't know whether Hansard picked it up. I'll take that interjection from Senator, Senator McKim. Platt. Senator McKim, just while we're on that interjection, I just remind you: you really need to be debating the substance of whether we go into committee or not. Thank you. Thank you, uh, um, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. And I will address these matters um, uh, once we go. Uh, once we go into the committee, but I'm making the point that the sooner this legislation goes through the parliament, which it now will, thanks to the Labor Party, the higher the risk that teenage people in Australia will be sentenced to four, five, six or in some cases seven years imprisonment for engaging in uh, what through human history has been relatively normal um, teenage behaviour. And uh, the only rebuttal that the government has to this allegation is that we can all relax because there is prosecutorial discretion and that prosecutors will not prosecute if it is not in the public interest to do so. And I say to the government and I say to the Labor Party, tell that to Mr Bernard Caleri. Tell that to Witness Kay. Tell Senator, that Senator to the McKim, innumerable whistleblowers McKim, that have been prosecuted in this place. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Just put the question. Uh, I move that the question be put. So the question is, uh, so we're debating uh, whether or not to go into committee. So the question to be, uh, yes, the question is that now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that the closure motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt as teller for the noes. Order, there being 41 ayes and eight noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So the next motion is that the message be considered in committee of the whole immediately. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I move that the committee does not insist uh, on its amendments to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. And in uh, doing so, I uh, urge the Senate not to insist on its amendment. This amendment, if insisted upon, uh, would remove Schedule 6 of the bill, which provides for mandatory minimum sentences for child sex offences that attract the highest penalties and to recidivist child sex offenders who have previously been convicted of a child sex offence. Current sentencing practices for Commonwealth child sex offences are resulting in manifestly inadequate sentences that do not sufficiently recognize the harm suffered by victims of child sex offenses or provide for adequate rehabilitation time in custody. Between 1 February 2014 and 31 January 2019, approximately 40 per cent of Commonwealth child sex offenders were not sentenced to spend a single day in prison. In the last five years, the most common length of imprisonment for Commonwealth child sex offense was 18 months, with the most common non-parole period or fixed term period being six months or less. Many sentences for Commonwealth child sex offenders are applied on the basis of being manifestly inadequate. The mandatory minimum provisions provided for in Schedule 6 are necessary to achieve the Bill's intent of ensuring sentencing for child sex offences are in line with community expectations. To, to reiterate, the provisions do not impose mandatory non-parole periods. Judicial discretion is maintained on setting the minimum period in custody and minimum penalties can be reduced where an offender pleads guilty and cooperates with law enforcement agencies. The mandatory sentencing provisions of this bill do not apply to offenders who are under 18 when they commit an offence. I repeat this. The mandatory sentencing provisions of this bill do not apply to offenders who are under 18 when they commit an offence. I urge the Senate to not insist on its amendment to remove Schedule 6. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As I outlined in my second reading speech uh, on the original debate on this bill, there is a lot that this bill gets right, and Labor will always work with MPs and senators from all sides of politics to strengthen our laws to protect our children. Nothing should get in the way of this objective. There is nothing more sickening than child sexual abuse. Children are the most precious and vulnerable members of our community and Labor will always support strong and effective laws to protect children from abuse and to punish their abusers. From the very beginning, 
Labor has signalled our strong support for the key measures in this bill, including significant increases to maximum penalties, the introduction of a presumption against bail for serious Commonwealth child sex offences, the replacement of the existing definition of child pornography material with a broader definition of child abuse material in various acts, and the introduction of new grooming offences. And, given our support for those measures, Labor has also made it clear that, whether our amendments succeeded or failed, we would support this bill. That is what Labor did in the Senate last night. Labor supported the bill. For that reason, while we maintain our opposition to mandatory sentencing because it doesn't work and makes it harder to catch, prosecute and convict criminals, we will not insist on our amendments. Protecting the welfare of children will always be Labor's overriding priority and concerns. Given some of the commentary over the last 12 hours, I'd like to conclude by reading a statement from Sonia Ryan, the founder and CEO of the Carly Ryan Foundation. This statement was issued this morning, and it is something that all of us in this place and the other place should reflect on carefully. The statement reads as follows. This bill will genuinely help so many people and so many victims of crime. There is no question that we want child sex offenders put away for a long time and off the streets. This is an absolute given. As a mother who has lost a child through the actions of a heinous child sex offender, I implore all sides of government work together, compromise and pass this bill as soon as possible with or without mandatory sentencing. Victims of crime, innocent children, the Australian community are looking for leaders who will stand up for those who cannot defend themselves, who put political battles aside for the greater good of humanity, who are able to push their egos aside and do what's right. As we see it, there are two practical options. One, pass this legislation with mandatory sentencing and a review in three years. Two, pass this legislation without mandatory sentencing and work with the judiciary to increase sentencing overall and make sure adequate sentences are being applied with a review in three years. Either way, our children win. This is a huge step in the fight against those who wish to harm families. On that basis, I commend the bill to the Senate. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Deputy President. If I could just first uh, address a matter that I've spoken to Senator Cormann about, and that is to acknowledge that the government did uh, inform uh, our team that, in fact, this matter would be proceeded with now, uh, except that message did not receive, uh, did not make its way to us in the chamber due to a technical issue. So uh, that's the reason we um, voted against. Uh, the previous motion put by Senator Cormann, and we don't want in the Australian Greens this bill to be unnecessarily held up because we uh, share the view, just espoused uh, by Senator Watt, that there is a lot in this bill, as I said in my second reading contributions yesterday, which is meritorious uh, and which is supported by the Australian Greens. Um, now that the government has uh, shifted its position and, uh, and uh, accepted the necess necessity of a three-year review into that legislation. That took care of one of the concerns uh, that the Greens uh, articulated yesterday and that was encapsulated uh, in one of the amendments that we put yesterday. Uh, however, unlike the Labor Party, we still believe and stand to our position that uh, mandatory sentencing should not be in this legislation, and that's because it creates the very real potential for miscarriages of justice. And I accept uh, the assurance Senator Cormann has just given, which was also given by the government yesterday, that this bill, uh, the mandatory sentencing provisions of this bill, do not uh, uh, people under the age of 18 will not be caught by those provisions. However. You can still be a teenager and be over the age of 18, and if there is a teenager just over the age of 18 who engages uh, in various um, behaviours that are caught by this legislation with a partner who is under the age of 16, even by one day, then that person, who could just be one or two days over the age of 18, will be caught by the mandatory sentencing provisions of this legislation.
It is absolutely critical to the Australian Greens that judges be left to impose sentences based on their consideration of the merits of each individual case which come before those judges. That's why we pay them the big dollars. That's why we have an independent judiciary, so that justice can be done and we retain the concerns that we articulated yesterday that this will create the very real possibility of significant miscarriages of justice and result in teenage year old Australians being imprisoned for, uh, in some circumstances, seven years, seven years, with the judges being given um, no real discretion to reduce those sentences, except in the case of the guilty plea, which can only reduce the sentence by 25 per cent under the provisions of this legislation. So we do not believe um, that uh, the Senate uh, should not insist on its amendments. We believe that the Senate should assist, insist on its amendments. The government could then accept that in the lower house and have the rest of this bill passed today if the government was so minded. So this is not delaying um, the enactment of this bill or the royal assent to this bill in any way whatsoever if the government would simply remove its ideological commitment to mandatory sentencing. This matter could proceed. We could remove the only elements of this bill now that are not supported by the Australian Greens, which are the mandatory sentencing provisions, and the rest of this legislation, which has the full support of the Australian Greens, could pass through the parliament today. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is, as moved by the minister that the committee does not insist on its amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Okay. I didn't hear any opposition, so I'm happy to put the motion again. So the question is that the committee does not insist on its amendments. The motion is moved by the minister is that the committee does not insist on its amendments. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Um, before I put the motion, I am assuming that all senators standing are participating in the vote. So the question is that the committee does not insist on its amendments. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Seward as teller for the noes. Order, there being 44 ayes and eight noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Oh, sorry. Minister. Thank you very much. I move that the resolution of the committee be reported. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered message number 220 from the House of Representatives relating to the crimes legislation amendment, sexual crimes against children and community protection measures bill 2019 has and has resolved not to insist on the amendments made by the Senate to which the House has disagreed. Minister. Okay. Okay, so we've finished with that matter. We're going to move to motions to take note. I'll just let those who are leaving the chamber depart and others to return to their correct sides. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the, of the answers given by Senators Cormann and Rustin to the questions asked by Senators uh, Wong and Gallagher. For anyone that was uh, hoping to be able to get some answers or clarity um, from the government today, they would have been sorely disappointed from the answers that we've received in question time. What we see uh, again is um, the government um, not providing that clarity, the government having no detail around what they call their snap back strategy, which is, is becoming clearer that it is indeed a flawed snap back strategy. More Australians than were expected have been forced onto job seeker. 140,000 Australians, to be exact, and the government um, may refuse to acknowledge this, but of course it is unfortunately true. 
And I know um, many senators and members have been receiving a number of calls, emails, asking what is going to happen, what will happen post September, because they're so concerned, and we can't, we're unable to give them any clarity as to what this government is going to do. You must know this. The government senators must know this. They must be receiving these calls. They must be receiving emails from people that are desperate to be understand exactly what is going to happen post-September. We didn't receive any clarity from the Prime Minister and we certainly didn't receive any clarity from Senator Cormann here today. You know, we've got an a, a extra, well, unfortunately, 140,000 um, more Australians being forced onto JobSeeker, but it's also <coughs> true that a high number of people on JobSeeker is a result, is a result of the bungled handling of the job keeper program. Now the government thought that 1.5 million would, would be on job seeker by June this year. But figures released to the COVID committee revealed that there's 1.64 million people currently receiving job seeker payment. Now why more Australians have been forced onto unemployment benefits, local employees, industries that may need help from the government to stay afloat aren't getting the help. And they're, again, they're not even getting any clarity. So they're not getting the help they need from the government. Local go governments that operate regional airports aren't allowed to claim JobKeeper. Our tertiary education sector are not allowed to claim JobKeeper. And our childcare and early education sectors have been told by the government that they will be the first industry to snap back. Hard working Australians that have worked for the same company for 20 years, 20 years have been told that they aren't eligible for JobKeeper either, despite the fact that they've been doing the same job at the same place for decades. Along the way, the company they worked for was sold to an overseas company. For this reason, and for this reason alone, the government has chosen to punish these hard-working Australians and deny them and their employer access to JobKeeper. This is a real blow to these workers, a real blow. This really is a shocking way Madam Deputy President, to treat our fellow Australians. The government's blunders and decision to make our childcare uh, and, ch child care and childhood education sector snap back will be particularly hard on women. 96 per cent of the workforce in that sector are female. Women have been at the forefront of tackling the pa uh, pandemic. They've cared for Australians that are ill. They've worked hard to keep our workplaces, our schools, our public spaces safe and clean. They have looked after us older Australians and cared for and educated our young people. So what do we have from this government? We have had a bungled uh, implementation of the JobKeeper. We have had— uh, Thank you, Senator Brown. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mac Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, President sorry. Uh, uh, part of me feels a little sorry uh, for the opposition at the moment. I, I know it's their job. It's their job to come into this place and hold the government to account. It's their job to uh, be a critic, effectively, of uh, what's happening. But, but they are really, really clutching at straws uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, they are struggling a little uh, uh, to be uh, a critic. Uh, uh, through this uh, crisis, you can you can tell they're struggling a little bit. You can you can tell uh, their desperation uh, by the fact that they're complaining about things not that we have done, but that we might do. 
Uh, most of Senator Brown's contribution there was not about what the government has done, the decisions it's made to help and assist uh, Australians that have uh, been affected by the coronavirus pandemic and its uh, associated economic downturn. Most of the criticisms there that were put by Senator Brown were about things we might do in a few months' time uh, if and when conditions improve, improve and hopefully they improve, and we no longer need uh, this assistance. Uh, uh, it's a relatively, it's a pretty weak argument to be putting here that uh, they might do something bad to you in the future, so be very, very worried. Well, I think Australians actually know uh, that the best, best way uh, to judge uh, somebody, a best way to judge uh, a horse in a race or, 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 or uh, a business that you're frequenting or a government that you're looking to, uh, to assess and judge, the best way to judge people is on their form, on their record, what they have done, uh, not what they uh, might do, uh, not what they, you might fear them to do. It's uh, the record of what they've actually done. And what the government has actually done over these last three months has respond, uh, has, to, has to been to respond uh, quickly uh, and generously uh, to the conditions that some Australians find themselves in through no fault of their own. Through no fault of their own. Uh, it is true, as Senator Brown has uh, highlighted, that millions of Australians have been put out of work. Millions of Australians uh, have seen their incomes reduced. Thousands of Australian businesses have seen uh, their futures been thrown into great uncertainty or, in the worst case, uh, cases have their businesses closed and shut because of this coronavirus. Uh, uh, and every step of the way, the government has been there to uh, increase uh, assistance and support uh, to those who are suffering. We, of course, can't make everybody whole. Uh, we, of course, uh, cannot uh, uh, replace uh, uh, or completely make up for the loss and suffering that some have suffered uh, through these past few months. But we have done everything a government can do uh, to help and assist those in need. Uh, it has required, of course, uh, uh, decisions, tough decisions at times to balance things up, like those we recently made around the childcare sector, where uh, our initial support was tailored towards what we thought would be a significant reduction in childcare numbers, a significant reduction in the utilisation of childcare services. Uh, uh, but, of course, in fact, that did not occur, uh, with childcare places, I think, uh, uh, being north of 70 per cent or so, uh, even through coronavirus. And therefore, we've changed tack. We've changed tack and adjusted the assistance to the circumstances which have eventuated here uh, in that sector, and that's been welcomed by the sector. And that's the only real criticism the, the, the opposition has of the government is, well, you've, things, have, things haven't always turned out as planned, that, that not as many people are on JobKeeper as you predicted, it's not costing as much as you thought, that more people are on JobSeeker than was predicted, uh, that we've had to change our policies on childcare. But, of course, that is a function. Those change circumstances. Things change quickly, of course, as a function of a crisis like this. A crisis like this, a global pandemic, is not going to be a predictable one. A global pandemic like this will have fast-changing aspects to it that no one could predict because a few months ago there was so much uncertainty about how this pandemic would eventuate, how bad the health impacts would be, how many people would be infected, etc. etc. Uh, all of the policies we've designed have been designed in a way uh, to respond to those changing circumstances. All of them, uh, we have stated, will be uh, temporary. We can't keep spending over $10 billion a month on, on JobKeeper. We can't keep providing the same level of assistance forever and put it on the credit card. So all of them have been decided in this responsive way and that's what we will continue to do for the Australian people. And the Australian people can trust us, as we have in the last few months, to stand with them, alleviate suffering where we can, and do so in a responsible and common sense way. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Sewell. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. Just stick around, Senator Canavan, because I'll tell you something that you've done. Don't worry about that. You should really stick around if you absolutely care Senator about Sturl, Australian workers. Senator Sewell, I remind you to not reflect on whether senators are in the chamber or not. Thank you. And? As I was saying, Senator Canavan should stick around and listen quite clearly, because I'm going to talk about a group of workers, five and a half thousand in this nation, that have been absolutely treated appalling by the government. And they're not blue collar, steel cap, booted union, big men with loud voices. 
The majority of them are women and they're the donato workers. And for those senators sitting opposite, and I know you don't have to say, you're not in the cabinet, I understand that. But these are the people that clean the aircraft that you and I fly on every week. That's right. These are the same people. And we see them when we're getting off the plane, whether it's midnight, whether it's five o'clock in the morning we're getting on, the ones with the buckets, the ones with the gloves, the ones with the plastic bins, all waiting to come on the aircraft to clean the aircraft that we've been sitting on there and we've had a pretty comfortable flight. These are also the same workers who put together the food or the nibbles or the drinks that are served on our planes throughout Australia every flight. They're the same ones who make sure that the trays have got water in them. They're the same ones that are there to make sure there's colouring in pencils and there's books for the poor kids down the back that are screaming and not enjoying the flight. These are five and a half thousand Australian workers who work in the in the catering kitchens, the former Qantas flight catering. There's the same people that prepare the food. There's the chefs, there's the cooks, there's the pot washers, there's the cutlery bench, every single bit going day in, day out, making sure that Australia's aviation industry is not only effective but it's also viable and it's comfortable and it's enjoyable. They're also the same ones that do it on all the international flights. Not a different bunch of workers, it's the same workers. These are the same workers and predominantly women who all at one stage worked for Qantas or Alpha Catering. Remember that proud Australian airline Qantas? The one that couldn't wait to come off and sell it off to Donata. And I appeal to my colleagues across the bench. These are not foreign workers. They're Australians. They bought, most of them were born here. Or they, they made their home here. They, their kids go to the same shopping centres as we go to. They, they go to, sorry, the same shopping centres. Their kids go to the same schools. They pay their taxes here in Australia. It's just because the government actually allowed at Qantas's request to have their employer go from the proud Australian, who at many times has tried to water down the 51 per cent Australian ownership to suit their, their, their very high paid officials at the top of the tree. Australians. And they're not being told they can't have JobKeeper, nor can they get JobSeeker, because they're in an industry that's not worthy. They're being told they can't have it by the government because their employer is a foreign entity. How do you think they feel? And I have, no, I have absolutely no doubt that you've seen the protests, you've seen their submissions, you've seen their approaches. And here's one of the worst things. I actually attended. I attended two rallies in Perth for the Donata workers. And one of the rallies was at the Attorney General's office. All they wanted to do was present a letter to the Attorney General to say, Dear Attorney General, when you're next in Cabinet, can you please consider us Aussies who aren't getting this money? We're not, foreigner, uh, we're not foreigners. It's just our company was sold to a foreign entity. The sad part is Minister Porter wasn't there. Christian Porter, Minister Porter, he wasn't there. And they walked in, they knocked on the door, they walked into the office, they presented the letter saying, please, can we put our case to you? And the lady in Mr Porter's office, I'm told, was very, very, very well-mannered and very accommodating, and they walked out. Ten minutes later, I'm sitting there and I said to the Secretary of the Transport Workers' Union, I said, mate, you might want to go out there and say hello. I said, but I've just seen four police cars, two police cars turned up, four, four uh, policemen, two Australian Federal Police. And I said, and I know the two detectives sitting here because I've seen them before. I've called the coppers and said there's a violent demonstration. Most of the people there, the Donata workers, were women who stand about five foot two high. I couldn't believe it. And they're still, I asked uh, Timmy Dawson the other day as he got a response, to this day, still not even the decency of a response from Christian Porter. Thank you, Senator Stirl. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Madam uh, Deputy President, uh, first uh, I acknowledge uh, Senator Stirl's contribution to the debate and um, place on the record my sympathies for the Donata workers. The unfortunate issue is that um, not only are they owned by a foreign entity, but they're owned by a foreign, a foreign entity which is controlled 100 per cent by a foreign government. And uh, as Senator Steele knows, the legislation we passed in this place some time ago 
to deal with uh, the JobKeeper payments. It excluded payments to wholly owned foreign entities owned by foreign government. But uh, I do uh, acknowledge the comments he made. With respect to Senator Brown's contribution, I must say uh, it perplexes me how Senator Brown can think that uh, there was any confusion whatsoever with respect to what was going to happen with JobKeeper and JobSeeker. When we passed the legislation here in this chamber some months ago, it was clear that both measures were intended to last for six months. That was absolutely clear. So I'm not sure why there's some confusion when the government has simply stated that it intends to maintain that course. I'm, I'm not sure where the confusion is coming from. The government has been absolutely clear in that respect. Let me also say that I have the absolute sympathy, absolute sympathy for all of those workers at the moment who are on either JobKeeper or JobSeeker, because uh, that reflects that the businesses for whom they work are not in a position to trade as they were trading before the coronavirus pandemic. And I'd say to Senator Brown, if she's concerned about those workers, if she's concerned about those workers, if they're located in Queensland, please pick up the phone and talk to the Premier of my home state, Premier Palaszczuk. Talk to Premier Palaszczuk and give her three messages. I'll even write the messages for you. Give her three messages. First, open the borders. Open the borders so the tourism industry can get back on its feet again. Open the borders. Just today, Premier Palaszczuk appears to be backsliding, backsliding on the July 10 date. Backsliding. The tourism industry doesn't want to hear that. The tourist, tourism industry in my home state of Queensland wants to get up and running again. It wants to take advantage of that winter tourism season. And Premier Palaszczuk again is making comments in the Queensland Parliament during question time that she's concerned that. Oh, yes, uh, just a moment. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator point, of, point of order, Madam Deputy President. Could I remind the member? That we're taking note on the questions that were asked by Senator Cormann, oh, se sorry, Senator Wong to Senator Cormann and um, Senator Rustin. Those were the points. We're not talking about the Queensland government and borders. We're actually talking about the questions that were asked in question time. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. It is a it is a wide-ranging debate, and Senator Scar started off on that footing, and I'm listening very carefully. I expect he'll go back to uh, those taking note responses. Thank he you, Senator He will, Scott. absolutely. And he'll go back on the basis that we could have more certainty. We could have more certainty that was sought from those sitting opposite with respect to JobKeeper and JobSeeker if we had more certainty as to when the borders were going to open. The two are linked. The two are linked because employment prospects, employment prospects of both people coming off JobKeeper and, and coming off JobSeeker are linked to the opening of the borders. The two are entwined. The two are absolutely entwined. They're connected. They're related to each other. It's relevant. It's absolutely relevant. Absolutely relevant. Absolutely relevant. This, this government could not have done a better job in terms of dealing with this one in 100 year event than it has. And the facts demonstrate that. This country, Australia, is in the bottom three of countries across the whole world, the bottom three in terms of the lowest rate in terms of GDP for. The bottom three. That's how well we've done. That's how well we've done as a country. That's how well we've done. No government anywhere has done a better job than this government in terms of protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. Protecting lives and protecting livelihoods. And just this week, We've heard how the government is going to be fast-tracking a number of infrastructure projects. And that's all about getting people off JobKeeper, back their companies back running in accordance with normal trading conditions, and getting people off JobSeeker. That's how you provide the certainty. That's how you provide the certainty and get people off JobKeeper and their companies' normal trading conditions and get people off job, JobSeeker and back into work. We're on common ground in that respect. We all want to see that happen. We all want to see that happen. But the reality is there are things that in my home state of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk, Premier Palaszczuk, 
is backsliding on opening the borders, and that has a negative impact, a negative impact on people coming off JobSeeker. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And I rise this afternoon also to take note of the answers that, you know, as Senator Urquhart uh, mentioned earlier, by uh, Senator Wong to Senator Cormann and Senator Rustin uh, today, with respect to the topics of JobKeeper and JobSeeker. And it is sad to say that the answers that we've received from government, front bench and back bench, today were simply not good enough. Not good enough for Australians, not good enough for those who are living paycheck to paycheck, and in some cases those that are simply running out of money in their bank accounts. And in homes right across our country, people are feeling confused and uncertain about their future. But that's hardly a surprise, given that they get this and have been receiving this uncertainty now for seven years under the coalition government. Labor did support the JobKeeper and JobSeeker legislation, but we did so on the understanding that government would also come to the table in good faith, that they would also review elements as things progressed and as the situation with respect to coronavirus changed. And that simply has not been the case. This program so far has been poorly implemented, and it's left millions, millions of people, Australian workers, taxpayers, without any support. Casual workers, people who work in retail, in hospitality, fast food, warehousing, and many others, and as we heard from Senator Stirl earlier, those workers in Donata. And all they want is the same support that their fellow Australians are receiving right now. They're not after much. They just want help. They need help so that they too can pay for their bills, put food on the table, have the heater on at home. But now millions of Australians with just a few pay packets away, are losing that's, um, their support. And for tens of thousands of others, in particular those in the childhood education sector, the end of JobKeeper is now just less than one month away. And this is despite the government promising on multiple occasions that they would look after them. Simply not the case. Now we've got 2.3 million more Australians who are on support payments offered by government. But this government is still proposing to slash these payments in half, leaving them around $550 a fortnight worse off. Ripping back the support of JobKeeper and JobSeeker will do untold damage, not to just many Australians at home, but to our economy, and it just does not make any sense. Austerity it does not work, but yet this government seems to be hell-bent on making sure that the fiscal bottom line of the budget is in order, rather than the homes and the household budgets of Australian families. Yesterday, in the other place, the Prime Minister acknowledged that winding back JobKeeper will see more job losses. Support for Australians and Australian jobs is what will make our economy continue to tick over and function and get recovery back on track. I'm deeply concerned about what will happen to my home state in Victoria after September. There are enormous numbers of people who will be left behind by this government. And Senator Wong just simply wanted a very straight answer from Senator Cormann. What is the government's plan post-September? so we can give Australians certainty, certainty so when they plan for their household budgets, it's not just something that gets switched on or off as like a, a flick of a switch. We need to give people the notice and the respect that they deserve so they can start planning for their futures. Do they need to start looking for other work, increasing their hours, making the tough decisions so that they can support their families post-September? We don't need more announcements or press conferences or media doorstops. 
We just need the government to come to the table and say that they will do the right thing and support Australians and Australian jobs. Uh, thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given to my question to uh, Senator Birmingham, who is representing the Environment Minister. Of course, this government has always had it in for the environment. This government has always wanted to find a way to weaken environmental protections. And you've got a question, really, how much weaker can they get? We've got a situation where one million hectares of koala habitat in this country has been destroyed. We have koalas in this country in some parts that are endangered. We have mines that are given approval only then to contaminate water catchment areas. And of course, we have the devastating and shocking destruction of 46,000-year-old ancient Aboriginal heritage. And this has happened under this government's watch. This has happened under the laws that are currently in place. And what we've seen from the Prime Minister this week, the subject of my question to Senator Birmingham, was that the Prime Minister wants to weaken these laws even more. He wants to fast-track projects, developments, mining operations so that they can get going faster and bypass environmental regulation cut corners. The Prime Minister calls it cutting green tape. It's cutting corners is what it is. It's cutting environmental protection. And as the government tries to argue that reducing the regulations, cutting regulations, will somehow not result in weakening laws, just beggars belief. No one believes that. It doesn't make any sense. Oh. They want guaranteed approval processes. That's what they're after. We need environmental protections and laws in this country that actually protect the environment. Australia has one of the worst extinction rates in the world for our native animals. We have land clearing that's continuing at such a rate that our native animals are just losing their homes day by day, month by month. And in many cases, we have Australian wildlife and animals that are now so badly endangered that they're on the brink of extinction. During the summer's bushfires, Australians were shocked at the destruction of our environment. They grieve for the death of our wildlife. They want the government to do more to protect our favourite places, to protect our forests, to keep our beaches clean, to look after our coastline, to keep our rivers, our streams, our lakes clean and healthy. They want less pollution. Australians know that too much of our nature has been trashed in the name of profit, and they want a change from business as usual. This government wants to cut the protections to the environment even more. I asked the minister today whether he could guarantee that this cutting of regulations that in cutting these regulations, whether he could guarantee that no more koala habitat would be destroyed. Well, he couldn't answer the question because he can't guarantee it, because this government is about to sign off on a set of rules that allow for more koala habitat to be destroyed. No checks and balances. 
or very little. I asked the minister whether he could guarantee that no more ancient historical sacred sites would be blasted and blown up like Rio Tinto did only a couple of weeks ago. Well, they can't guarantee that either. In fact, putting in less protections, weakening the laws, cutting, allowing companies and corporations to cut corners when it comes to environmental, their environmental application process is, is going to put Australia's nature, our environment and our native animals Order. Senator Hanson Young, time has At the expired. brink of extinction. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills, allowing them to be considered during. This period of sittings, a the Broadcasting Services Amendment, Regional Commercial Radio and Other Measures Bill 2020, b the Education Legislation Amendment 2020 Measures Number One Bill 2020, c the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment, Governance and Other Matters Bill 2020, d the Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2020 Measures Number One Bill 2020, e Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures Number Two Bill 2020, f Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures Number Three Bill 2020, and g. Treasury Laws Amendment, More Flexible Superannuation Bill 2020, and I also table uh, statements of reasons justifying the need for the bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated in Hansard. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Draw a notice of motion. Just leave granted. Leave granted. Thank you. Mr President, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number three, proposing a reference to the Procedure Committee. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Chair. I seek leave to make a, a brief statement, which I should have done at the beginning. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Coleman. Uh, consistent with the government's position on formal motions, which I outlined to the Chamber on two occasions last week, when we get to general business notice of motion number 669, I flag that the government will seek to have it dealt with during general motions rather than formal motions. As I stated to the Chamber last Friday, considered in the context it is proposed, this motion raises complex policy matters on which all senators should have an appropriate opportunity to explain their position in an appropriately detailed and nuanced fashion. This session on formal motions is not the right place for detailed debate of complex issues. I thought we haven't quite got to general to the discovery of formal business yet, but I'll take that. And if others would like to seek leave, could we do it then? And I just want to get through the placing of business first, then I'll come to you. Senator Roberts, I know you're seeking the call. Um, we've done notices of motion. Are there any other notices of motion? Senator Hanson Young? Um, I, I've just withdraw. I'd like to. Yep. Yes, thank you. What? Um, I withdraw business, no, business of the Senate notice of motion number four. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Oh, Senator Patrick, sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw general business notice of motion number 677. Thank you, Senator Patrick. There being no other notices, um, I shall proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator, uh, I'll call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate, uh, notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senators Hanson Young, Kitching and Carr, from today to 10 August 2020. Thank you. So we now proceed to the discovery of formal business. I'll take Senator Cormann's statement as given. Senator Roberts, you are seeking the call following that. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a two-minute statement. Two-minute statement? Did you say two-minute statement? Two minutes. Yes, sorry. Please. I misheard. Is leave granted? Yes. Leave is granted for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. This motion that I was proposing uses well-considered neutral language to present accurate data on deaths in custody from the latest report of the government's own Australian Institute of Criminology. This is not the first time a grubby backroom deal between Labor, Liberals and Nationals has been used to deny the formality of such motions. When everyday Australians go to a polling booth, do they look at the names and think, I will vote for this person because they run away from hard issues? Do they think, I'll vote for this person because they're going to be a gutless bastard? No, certainly not. Order. Australian Senator Roberts, I, just, I, I pulled up another senator earlier for the use of the term bloody. I'm just going to ask you to, to, to keep in mind standards of parliamentary language. Thank you. No, they certainly do not vote that way. Australians want champions, not cowards. Let me be clear. Black lives do matter. 
All lives do matter. Deaths in custody are a tragedy. They are happening, yet num not in the numbers bandied around. In fact, Aboriginal deaths in custody, according to the government's own data, occur at a similar rate as non-Aboriginal deaths in custody. Getting to the truth is the very thing for which this Senate was designed. Truth must be our currency. On Friday, I listened to the Prime Minister refuse to talk about these matters. Now, I do understand Senator Cormann taking his orders from the Prime Minister. What I don't understand is why Senator Wong would go along with it. Is Labor now taking instructions from the Prime Minister? Just how deep is the Liberal Labor duopoly? For the last time, I, for, the, for the last year, I've stood in shock at the number of times Labor, Liberals and Nationals have crowded themselves onto the opposition benches to vote down a worthy cross-bench initiative. With this process, the people's elected representatives have been silenced. Senators must decide. Do we do grubby deals to silence senators just to preserve dirt daily talking points? Or do we follow the spirit and intent of the rules developed over 120 years to ensure all voices are fairly heard? George Orwell said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear, even solid data. Order, Senator Roberts. Senator Seward. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Seward. Firstly, the Greens are also opposed to these motions being, deni being denied formality. These are important issues that we need to be addressing. And when, the, when, the minister, when Senator Roberts makes the comments about the minister doing deals, it appears there's some sort of deal that has been done because Senator Roberts' motion on this issue was pulled and withdrawn for today. But I actually want to then address the issues around deaths in custody. What the motion failed to mention was that Aboriginal people make up 2 per cent of our population, yet they make up 47 per cent of our prison population. So when we're talking about facts, let's get the facts right. Order. Senator that it's not a point of order, Senator Roberts, and if, if, uh, this is, I, I might say this is why statements by leave are not the greatest forum for debate. Senator Seward, to continue, uh, I, oh, your time has concluded. Thank you. Now I will proceed to the discovery of formal business, um, and business of the Senate number one will be dealt with later in the day. I understand. Number two has been postponed. Number three and four have been withdrawn. Um, I'll try and do significant divisions at the commencement today. Um, Senator, the business of the Senate, matter number five, sent in the name of Senator Kitching. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate, notice of motion number five, proposing reference to the Environment Communications References Committee relating to the future of Australia Post's service delivery, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal but being done? Senator Urquhart. I move the motion, standing in the name of Senator Kitching. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to move an amendment to the motion to the effect of substituting the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee for the Environment and Communication References Committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Cormann. Uh, I move that motion. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The eyes. Senator Hanson, you're seeking the call. I am uh, I'm seeking leave to, make, um, to ask a question with regards to this. There is an amendment to actually move it to a different um, references committee, but is the dates are the dates the same with regards to what the given the amendments in the chamber? There's no change. There's no change to the date the uh, minister has said to me. So it's only the change moved by the minister. I'll give the, is the minister given leave to explain the issue? Leave is granted. To assist the chamber, so the subject matter of this um, um, motion and this referral is a temporary uh, regulatory change that the government has initiated in the context of COVID-19. The uh, period for uh, the disallowance to be dealt with uh, is by 25 August. Uh, given there is provision in the uh, reference as uh, moved uh, to have an interim report by 11 August, uh, you know we would anticipate that. Um, at that time, a recommendation can be made by that committee. But if it was the wish of the chamber to bring the reporting date forward, so we can, I, I'm, I'm happy to move to, to that effect. I mean, so because the disallowance does come to a close, by t I mean, we've got to deal with it as a chamber by 25 August. Okay, so, right, but you can move to that effect. Senator Hanson, 
Well, I'd like to move after having negotiations and talks with um, the union of the post office's union plus also the CEO. Um, they are quite happy to have the hearing heard sooner rather than later okay, and I've, the reporting date I've down. So yeah, Senator Hanson, I've, I've got to now start to enforce the rules that this is not a place for statement by leave. I appreciate that. I've, I've got a division. Uh, I'll call the leader of the government. This is rather. I seek, I seek leave to move an amendment uh, one to substitute the Environment um, and Communications Legislation Committee for the Environment and Communications References Committee and to bring forward the reporting date, the final report of that committee to 11, to 11 August. So, all right, I've got, um, Senator Cormann, I'll, am I going to take it that you're going to withdraw? You were granted leave to move the First Amendment um, and I was about to put that. Um, would you like me to? Senator Cormann, would you like me to deal with your First Amendment separate to your second one or do both? All right. So here's, Senator Cormann has withdrawn with the leave of the chamber his first proposal and, and is now seeking leave to move the amendment in the terms he just sought. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. So Senator Cormann, I, can I take it that you, you move that amendment? The question is that in business of the Senate number five, the final reporting date be Senator Cormann, I didn't get to write it down. The final reporting date will be 11 August, and it will go to the legislation, not the references committee. Those of that opinion supporting that amendment say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Cormann to amend business of the Senate number five be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes. Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 27. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for a series of divisions. The question now is, business of the Senate motion number five as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I ask senators to remain in the chamber and I'll do best to facilitate their time. Could we move to matter number 666 in the name of Senator Watt? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 666, proposing an order for the production of documents concerning the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Your short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The motion represents an unreasonable diversion of the AAT's resources. The AAT does not record information in its case management system that would enable it to easily identify cases falling within the scope of the motion. The AAT would need to individually review all decisions made by the tri tribunal during that period, from the 1st of July 2015 to the 27th of November 2019, with a, tri a tribunal set aside a debt decision made by Centrelink. The AAT has previously advised, in response to a question on notice dated 3 March 2020, uh, listed as LCC AE20-59, that a request for more uh, limited subset was an unreasonable diversion of resources. Question is, motion number 666 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells.
question is that motion number 666 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 27. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I ask senators again to remain in the chamber. Um, Senator Seawitt, are you moving the motion on behalf of Senator Steele, John? Senator number 667. No, not for the time being. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 667 relating to confidentiality for submitters to the Disability Royal Commission be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The government recognises the importance of witnesses being able to give evidence safely and in confidence at Royal Commissions and the need to balance this key concern with the principle of open proceedings. Having uh, receiving advice on these issues, the government is carefully considering options as to how we can best achieve that certainty. A decision by the government will be made shortly. The question is that motion number 667 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Could we go to motion number 668, Senator Roberts? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 668 relating to the live cattle export industry be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Roberts. Mr President, I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Our country's live exporters have no greater friend than this Liberal national government. The government sympathises with the sentiment behind this motion. Labor's decision to ban the live export trade caused enormous and unwarranted damage to the industry and individuals. The industry needs and deserves stability, predictability. The, the federal court's decision in the Brett Cattle Company case was handed down on Tuesday, the 2nd of July, uh, June, rather, 2020. No decision on the future of the litigation will be made until some time after the scheduled court hearing to make final orders in the matter, including orders for damages. That hearing is set down for the 29th of June, 2020. Given the risk that this decision could actually establish a precedent that could be weaponised against the live export industry. The responsible course of action is for the government to seek further advice before making determinations with respect to the future of this litigation. The question is, I'll go to Senator Faruqi, who was on her feet first, and I'll come to you, Senator Gallagher. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Let's be clear. The live export industry is based on animal cruelty, on animal misery, on blood-soaked supply chains. But this government does not give a damn. They have just given an exemption for 50,000 sheep to be sent off to the extreme heat of the northern summer, where they will face immense heat stress and they will be at risk of death. You make a mockery of your own rules. You should be ashamed. You don't care about animal welfare. And the so-called independence of the Department of Agriculture is a complete farce. It's a joke. Ban live export. Shut it down. 
Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement leave to outline Labor's voting intention. Leave, leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor will not be supporting the motion. The Shadow Minister for Agriculture has made it clear that Labor acknowledges and respects the court's decision. Further, the matter is still subject to legal proceedings and the government must always act in the national interest. Question is, motion number 668 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Can I put that again? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Can I take this opportunity? Can I take this opportunity to remind those seeking leave that it is generally a way to explain a position rather than debate a motion? All right. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 668 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith. Tell off the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell off the nose. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I've told the whips we'll be going to one minute bells for the foreseeable future um, of the series of matters. Senator Roberts, can I come to the matter that we foreshadowed in earlier debate, Senator 669? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 669 relating to Indigenous deaths in custody be taken as a formal motion. Is it, there is an objection to the motion being taken as formal, Senator Roberts, um, and that was discussed before by leave. I'd like to move the motion. Yes, Senator Roberts? Yes, I'd like to move the motion. Uh, yeah, no, formality has been denied, as foreshadowed in the earlier debate, uh, discussion. The standing orders be suspended, as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So that gets put to the, uh, to the, the vote immediately. The question is the motion to suspend, to allow consideration of motion 669 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Roberts, tell off the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell off the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 3, noes 53. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Faruqi, can I come to your matter number 674? Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 674 relating to proposing an order for the production of documents concerning supporting international students before asking that it be taken as formal. Is leave granted to move the amendment? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Senator, uh, is there any, any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Faruqi. Then I move the motion as amended. Thank you. Senator Dunningham, then I'll come to Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Australian governments and higher education providers are supporting international students through this pandemic. International students can access support initiatives worth over $1.3 billion from the federal and state and territory governments and universities. Students who have been in Australia longer than 12 months who find themselves in financial hardship will be able to access their Australian superannuation. States and territories will be able to put a six-month ban on evictions for both residential and commercial tenants during the COVID-19 pandemic. The government has worked with the community organisations and providers to ensure students have ongoing access to mental health and welfare support. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. I, um, seek, I wish to vote differently on part one uh, and part two, three, and four of this motion. All right. So I will put part one first, and then put parts two, clauses two, three, and four separately, and, but and together. I, and I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Um, I, I will be supporting the first part of uh, the motion. Uh, I, I'm not supporting the, the second, third and fourth because I think the government needs to be given an opportunity to return the documents, after which we see what their uh, public interest immunity or whether they've uh, uh, provided the documents, and then I might be inclined to support the latter parts. The question is that clause one of motion number 674, as amended by Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that uh, clauses 2, 3 and 4 of motion 674, as amended by Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Stop the bells. The question is that clauses 2, 3 and 4 of motion 674, as amended and moved by Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. Could we move to matter number 650 in the name of Senator Waters? Thank you very much, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 650 relating to the Adani Carmichael coal mine be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Question. So the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Statement. Seek leave. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor will not be supporting the motion. Projects in the Galilee Basin will be subject to the same stringent science-based approvals processes as any other project. Labor welcomes investment in projects which can meet agreed environmental standards. Question. Senator Roberts. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation will oppose this motion. The Carmichael coal mine operators agreed to the most stringent environmental conditions of any infrastructure project in Australia's history. Environmental activists used every dirty trick to try and stop the mine, and they failed. Far-left ideologues trying to destroy our mining industry forced Adani to wear millions in dollars in court costs from vexatious and frivolous lawsuits. These same dishonest, immoral, anti-human environmental pests are now intimidating and bullying the mine suppliers and service providers to interfere in the mine's operation. One Nation stands 100 per cent behind the Carmichael mine and 100 per cent behind Queensland's mining industry, and we will do everything in our power to protect their lawful enterprise. Queenslanders need jobs, community infrastructure and services that will come from opening the Galilee Basin, just as Sir Joe Bielke peterson approving the Bowen Basin opened up central Queensland. I remind senators, as I've said before, that the courtesy of leave is granted by every senator and has at this point been viewed as a way to explain a position rather than debate a motion. Um, the question is that motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Dr Bell. The question is motion number 650 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the nose. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 36. The matter is resolved in the negative. Can we go to matter 659 in your name, Senator Seawitt? I'll give you an opportunity to get back to your seat. Is that 659? 659. Yep. Thank you. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 659 relating to robo debt be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawood. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor, has, uh, Labor won't be supporting this motion today, but we have acknowledged the need for an independent investigation into robo debt. We agree the government has refused to provide basic information about this government program because it believes the disclosure of the information may materially affect the Commonwealth's position in the negligence claim of the robo-debt class action. The Senate has previously agreed to orders for the production of documents requesting details of the program and legal advice and confirming that legal professional privilege is not a recognised ground for refusing to provide information to the Senate. If the government complied with these orders, a royal commission may not be needed. That's why we're opposing the motion today and will instead allow the government, if I can finish, until the final sitting day of this sitting week on the Thursday, the 18th of June, to do the right thing, reconsider its position on the public interest immunity claim and its attempt to cover up the robo-debt scandal. The question is the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 659 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, sorry, the, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. Would tell of the ayes. Senator Urquhart tell of the nose.
The result of the division is eyes 8, noes 35. The matter is resolved in the negative. Could I come to matter number 670 in the name of Senator Faruqi? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 670 relating to live exports during the northern summer be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I move the motion. Question. Senator Dunham. Uh, that's me. If I could seek leave to make a short Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you very much. Um, the Australian government recognises that the live animal export industry is a major economic contributor and employer in rural and regional Australia. Ugh. This is the latest misguided attempt by the Australian Greens calling on the government to interfere with the decision of an independent regulator. The Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, as the independent regulator, has made this decision with the full consideration of the welfare of the animals in mind. It's incumbent upon the government to accept the independent umpire's decision. Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Labor will not be supporting this motion because we do not believe it is appropriate for the minister to intervene on the decision of the live export regulator. We do hold deep concerns for the welfare of the sheep that will be exported to the Middle East under an exemption provided by Mr Hazelhurst, who is the delegate of the secretary for the purposes of the northern summer order. However, we, we, um, believe, we strongly believe that the position should be truly independent, um, that is, the live export regulator from the department to ensure that a minister of any government persuasion does not have undue influence over the final decision when granting exemptions for or against export licences. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawood tell off the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell off the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 9, nose 36. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Hanson, could I come to your matter number 672, please? Mr. President, I ask that general business notice motion number 672 relating to the Bradfield scheme be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Hanson. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. I seek leave to make a short speech. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The government has committed $513 million to 26 water infrastructure projects in Queensland. Uh, while there have been a number of assessments on the merits of the original Bradfield scheme, work needs to be undertaken to assess the feasibility of this scheme using the best available contemporary science. The government, through the National Water Grid Authority, will consider options for developing large-scale water transfer schemes such as elements of the Bradfield scheme. And we remain committed to working with the Queensland government to identify and progress uh, water projects in Queensland. And we'd like to commend the Queensland LNP leader, Deb Frecklington, for her ongoing passionate advocacy for the new water infrastructure in Queensland. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Roberts, tell for the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell for the noes. The result of the division is eyes to nose 39. The matter is resolved in the negative. So I'll come to what I, my best guess is the non-controversial matters and commence with government business matter number one.
Senator Dunningham, are you in a position to move that? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that the Government of Business notice of motion number one, proposing the reference of works to the uh, Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Dunningham. I move the motion and I table a statement in relation to the work. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seawitt, number 671. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 671 relating to World Elder Abuse Awareness Day be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawitt. I move the motion. Question is, oh, Senator Dunningham. I uh, seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government is committed to ending any abuse of Australian seniors in all its forms, including in aged care. And that's why we developed a national plan to respond to the abuse of older Australians, elder abuse, 2019 to 2023, in consultation with the states and territories. It's also why uh, one of the Prime Minister's first acts was to call a royal commission into, into aged care quality and safety. We've led action to protect senior Australians in aged care settings, including by committing to a seri uh, serious incident response scheme. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith, number 673. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice, notice of motion number 673 relating to the Vietnamese community to be taken as formal, and I add Senator Keneally as a co sponsor of the motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion standing in my name and in the name of Senator Keneally. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Polly, could I come to oh, Senator Urquhart? Senator Polly's motion. President, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator Billick will also sponsor the motion. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 675 relating to Migraine Awareness Month be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. By law, the government cannot list a medicine on the PBS unless it is recommended by the Independent Medical Experts on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, the PBAC. Unlike Labor, the Coalition has a policy to list all new medicines on the PBS recommended by the PBAC. To date, the multinational drug companies that make these medicines have not provided PBS listing proposals that are consistent with the advice of the expert PBAC. The government cannot compel these drug companies to list their medicine on the PBS, and the Australian government will list these medicines on the PBS as soon as the drug companies provide listing proposals consistent with the PBAC recommendation. The question is that motion number 675 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi, number 676. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 676 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Faruqi. Mr President, I move the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator, I'm oh, sorry, the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. That concludes the discovery of formal business, Senators. I'll give people a moment to rearrange themselves around the chamber before we call on the MPI. Thanks, you go, mate. Order. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 22 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot, and as a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Gallagher. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. 
That being the Morrison government's incompetence in failing to appoint any civil society or union representatives to the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group, thereby establishing an unbalanced group that overwhelmingly represents business interests and undermining Australia's progress to eradicate modern slavery in supply chains. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr Deputy Acting uh, President. Just over 18 months ago, the Modern Slavery Bill 2018 passed the parliament, taking the first steps to tackle modern slavery risk in the operation of businesses and supply chains. This was the parliament working together to make progress to a fair, decent, compassionate and responsible country. These steps were taken because no country in the world is immune to modern slavery. The most recent estimates from the United Nations International Labour Organization predict there are 40.3 million people in the world currently trapped in slavery. That's one in every 200 people on the planet trapped in a form of modern slavery. Given the way in which people are forced into silence and subjected to abuse, there are more, undoubtedly, that we will never know about or be able to account for. Of those people, 24.9 million are in forced labor, working against their will and under threat, intimidation or coercion. That's the equivalent of the entirety of the Australian population being trapped in forced labor. The other 15.4 million people are estimated to be living in forced marriages, and yes, that includes people right here in Australia. Slaves are forced to clean houses or to be maids. They pick fruit, they mine minerals, they make electronics. There have even been reports of Nepalese migrant laborers facing exploitation and even dying in Qatar as the country builds infrastructure for the 2022 World Cup. Slaves even make the products and the clothes on the shelves of stores here in Australia. And close to 5 million people globally are trapped in forced sexual servitude or sexually exploited. This is a reality for millions of people around the world that we cannot ignore. And for those people who are trapped in forced labor and working in supply chains of products that end up in Australia, the Modern Slavery Bill and its reporting requirements are the beginnings of Australia doing its part to stop this scourge. From my portfolio perspective as the Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, we've seen tens of thousands of people end up in slave-like conditions on farms right here in Australia. On the Minister for Home Affairs watch, people are being trafficked to Australia on tourist visas, made to apply for asylum, then sent out to work in exploited conditions on farms or other jobs for the three or so years it takes to determine their asylum claim. Now, there's nothing wrong with claiming asylum. It's an important right. But 90 per cent of these applications are eventually found without merit. The number of airplane arrivals represents a work scam run by people smugglers as they expand their business model from boats to planes and it's trapping people in slavery. Even the Assistant Minister Jason Wood warned in a report to this parliament about this crisis unfolding on Mr Dutton's watch and still Mr Dutton has not acted. Even today in the Sydney Morning Herald there are stories of people smuggling venture being intercepted in Timor-Leste with 11 Vietnamese nationals seeking to get to Australia. In fact, the, the Task Force Emergency Response Coordinator in Timor-Leste told the Sydney Morning Herald that these Vietnamese have been offered work on Australian farms by people smugglers. You used to be able to trust this government with Australia's borders. Indeed, Operation Sovereign Borders has bipartisan support. But sadly, you can't trust Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton anymore. Labor wants Australia to be a world leader in tackling modern slavery. We don't agree with, we don't, in fact, disagree with the government on this very important issue. But just as the government has stressed so many times in so many areas of policies, we must not set and forget. The government announced on 17 February they would be establishing a modern slavery expert advisory group. The group has the purpose of, quote, collaborating with business and civil society to combat modern slavery and supply chains through Australia's Modern Slavery Act 2018. The government opened nominations for positions seeking, and I quote, experts with practical experience in business and human rights, procurement and supply chain management to help drive effective implementation of the Modern Slavery Act. Now, these are sensible and important steps. 
And I thank the government, and I pay credit to Assistant Minister Wood for establishing the panel they announced three weeks ago on the 25th of May. However, there is a but, and it is a very significant one. There is not a single representative from civil society organizations or unions having been appointed to the panel. Not one from ad advocacy organizations, no charities, no modern slavery experts with practical experience, no one from the union movement. This leaves an unbalanced group that overwhelmingly represents business interests and undermines Australia's progress to eradicate modern slavery in supply chains. This isn't political point scoring. In fact, the statistics speak for themselves. From the 70 applicants, including many experts in the modern slavery field, not a single appointment has been made from those who are working directly with the workers who are at risk of modern slavery. I have significant concerns for what this group will be able to achieve without representatives from civil society or the trade union movement. The 10 appointments that have been made to the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group overwhelmingly represent business interests. Six out of the 10 appointments are from large Australian companies, including Bunnings, Telstra, Country Road Group, and David Jones. There are five permanent members in the group. Three of the five permanent members of the group are the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, and the Business Council of Australia. All of the groups directly represent the interests of business. A fourth, the Global Compact Network for Australia, is predominantly a network of Australian businesses. There's also one member of the group who has held positions in the Liberal Party in New South Wales. Yet still, no one from the union movement or civil society. On the 1st of June, a letter was sent to the Assistant Minister Wood from 20 civil society organizations, unions and academics, voicing their alarm following the government's announcement of appointments to this group. This letter here, signed by 20 civil society groups, warned that mass unemployment caused by the COVID-19 pandemic will heighten risks of labor exploitation, making it crucial for the government's approach to be informed by experts working directly with workers at risk. They stress that given the current panel of appointees, the government's efforts in combating modern slavery will be, and I quote, driven by companies that are subject to Australia's modern slavery laws rather than by the interests of people at risk of modern slavery. I share these concerns, which is why I wrote to Minister Wood yesterday stressing the need for the government to listen to these experts. And I acknowledge that the minister has contacted me today offering a meeting. The government must ensure that the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group is balanced and has unbiased representation. The government cannot let their incompetence or their stubbornness potentially jeopardize Australia's response to modern slavery. The government worked with the unions and civil society when it came to addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, and the government is continuing to do so. The government can and they should take a similar approach now with modern slavery. How can the government comprehensively address modern slavery with an expert advisory group that contains no representation from groups who work directly with the workers who are working in slavery who are at risk of modern slavery? It beggars belief. It defies logic. I implore the government and the Assistant Minister, Jason Wood, to make further appointments to this expert advisory group from civil society organizations, from churches, from charities, from the trade union movement, to guarantee that the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group is balanced and informed in its representations. Importantly, so the voices and the experience of workers who are in modern slavery or at risk of modern slavery are heard and understood by the government. We must work together 
to get Australia's response to tackling slavery right. And the Labor Party in this parliament and in the community stands ready to do that with the government, which is why I have made these representations to Minister Wood. And I am pleased he has offered a meeting. I am hopeful that he's willing to enter into a dialogue that sees balance come on board this expert advisory group. Because if we don't get our approach to modern slavery right in Australia, getting it wrong will do nothing to stop this scourge that is infecting tens of millions of people around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Uh, Senator MacDonald. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Acting President. Well, how disappointing to see such an important issue as modern slavery being picked up by the Labor Party and absolutely being made up of political point scoring. It once again demonstrates the lack of understanding that Labor has for how to get things done. And in this case, it's how to take a very practical uh, piece of legislation um, which has at its base an advisory group an advisory group that will complement the existing consultative forums, such as the National Roundtable on Human Trafficking and Slavery, the National Roundtable, which was established 12 years ago in 2008. And that roundtable comprises of 12 civil society and NGO, NGO groups, only one business organisation, I have to point out, and one union. And there's yet this complete lack of understanding of how the advisory group will provide information back to business and back to government on the implementation of these important uh, initiatives and reforms. Uh, I am also very concerned that uh, Senator Keneally has talked about people in Australia working in modern slavery. And I'm sure that if she has knowledge of such circumstances, she would bring, be bringing that to the attention of authorities. I want to talk particularly about the great work that's been done in the agricultural sector. Most recently, it is GROCOM who has put together the Fair Farm Initiative. Now, Fair Farms is an industry-led initiative. It's aimed at fostering fair and responsible employment practices in Australian horticulture. And that's the kind of practical uh, and useful initiatives that ensure that workers are being paid properly and fairly. Um, and I want to expand on that to say how pleased I am that Coles has picked up that initiative and worked in partnership with GROCOM uh, to pick up the Fair Farms certification. It's a terrific initiative from very practical people ensuring practical outcomes. Um, and I imagine that the reason why Coles has done that is because of their ethical supply chain, their ethical sourcing policies, which they've gone to great lengths to put on their website, uh, and as has Woolworths and Aldi. It is unfortunate, though, that I can't I'm sorry, Senator Keneally saying something to you. I, I couldn't, couldn't hear. hear. Um, that it is. I'm sorry, I've just lost my train of thought. That it is uh, an important initiative to ensure that ethical supply sourcing uh, ensures that businesses are paid adequately to ensure that their workforces are paid properly and that there is a little bit of something left in it for the business. Uh, it is unfortunate that Coles and Woolworths and Aldi don't apply the same practice of ethical sourcing that they're now putting across through GROCOM and the Fair Farm certification to dairy and to dairy farmers who are being paid less than the cost of production, who are being uh, robbed blind of a fair price uh, by these big supermarkets, who are putting downward pressure on price uh, through the milk processes and the dairy processes and ensuring that dairy farmers um, are at the very bottom of an unfair negotiating uh, practices. And indeed, I was horrified to hear again this week that Lactalis, the Queensland-based uh, milk processor, is trying to introduce a new clause into milk contracts, saying that any dairy farmers who then do media on their contracts uh, would now be, they would not have their milk picked up. Shame. What an outrageous Shame. threat to make to these hard-working Australians 
who have a very short shelf life for their milk. And, uh, and so it is important that we continue to work hard on ensuring that we don't have modern slavery in this country and that the advisory group uh, is a terrific initiative that will provide feedback to government about businesses' response to modern slavery. And, uh, and I thank you for that contribution. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I thank uh, Senator Keneally for bringing uh, this matter, a very important matter, before the Senate. And while I'm uh, handing gratuitous thanks around the chamber, I do want to thank and acknowledge the work that uh, then Senator, now Minister Reynolds, did um, in uh, shepherding the Modern Slavery Act um, through uh, the previous parliament. Um, it was, uh, of course, supported um, by the Australian Greens, although we did express and we still retain um, the view that um, penalties should have been part of the legislation. Um, and, and I thank Senator Keneally for her, for her support for that comment. Uh, and I can only hope that when the review um, that is required does take place, um, there will be a recommendation for penalties to be inserted into the Act. Now, the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group is the topic of this uh, matter of public importance, and the, the Australian Greens share the concerns articulated by Senator Keneally, because um, this uh, expert, uh, I'm sorry, this Act, this piece of legislation, is essentially a supply chain management act, and it deals uh, in large part with working conditions. And it would have been most helpful if the uh, Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group um, contained people with expertise in supply chain management uh, and with expertise uh, in and relationships with people who represent workers in this country. The Minister's guidance material on the Australian Modern Slavery Act states uh, in uh, the Commonwealth Modern Slavery Act 2018 guidance for reporting entities that, and I quote, collaboration with civil society organisations such as non-government organisations as well as other stakeholders like workers and their representatives can be an important way to strengthen your entity's response to modern slavery. Now, that's obviously um, aimed uh, at uh, corporations in the main, but the point that it makes is equally relevant to the makeup of the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group. So we do have to ask where are the civil society organisations and NGOs in this group, and where are the workers and those who represent workers in this expert advisory group? Now, I'm also in possession of the letter that Senator Keneally um, referred to. That is a letter to um, Assistant Minister Wood, signed by <coughs> excuse me, a number of civil society uh, and workers' organisations, including the Human Rights Law Centre, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the United Workers' Union, the Uniting Church in Australia, Synod of Victoria and Tasmania, Be Slavery Free. Transparency International Australia, the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, the Salvation Army, Action Aid, the RMIT Business and Human Rights Centre, the Victorian Trades Hall Council, the University of New South Wales, the University of Melbourne, the University of Technology Sydney, the University of Western Australia, Monash University, the RMIT, RMIT University and uh, the University of New South Wales, Canberra at the Australian Defence Force Academy. Now, those groups and uh, the signatories to that letter which uh, represent those groups have made it perfectly clear to Assistant Minister Wood that uh, the appointments that have been announced by uh, Mr Wood to the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group overwhelmingly represent business interests. Now, this should not come as no surprise to anyone who's watched this government in action over the last parliament 
and this parliament because, let's face it, they are most comfortable when they are hearing from their corporate mates. And they are least comfortable when hearing from uh, areas of our community like civil society and uh, unions who represent workers. I could also add, out of context to this debate, that what makes them most uncomfortable is receiving advice and suggestions from the environment movement. But that's a debate for another day. Now, as the letter points out, the need for the government's approach to be informed by those working directly with workers at risk is critical. And it's very difficult to argue with that sentiment. Very difficult indeed. And it's a sentiment that is shared by the Australian Greens. And we can encapsulate this debate by uh, the, the last but one paragraph in uh, that letter to Assistant Minister Wood, which says this. This leads to the disturbing result that Australia's efforts in combating modern slavery will be driven by companies that are subject to Australia's modern slavery laws rather than the interests of people at risk of modern slavery." End quote. Um, let's be very clear about this. The Modern Slavery Act is not intended to be beneficial legislation for corporations. It's intended to be beneficial legislation for people at risk of modern slavery. That's what it was designed to do. And even though it lacks some teeth and it lacks um, some structures that would allow it to perform that role to the fullest extent of its capability, it is nevertheless still a decent first step down the road, and it could be made a better step and a larger first step down the road if the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group uh, appointments uh, were made with due consideration to the need to include uh, civil society representation and representation from workers and unions who represent working people in Australia. I also want to refer uh, to um, a couple of matters that have come up in uh, the debate around uh, racism in this country, a very welcome debate that, uh, that uh, our country and many other countries around the world are, are engaged in at the moment. And uh, it's a debate that people are putting their lives on the line to have in many parts of the world, including um, in, in Australia. We've had uh, a Prime Minister who uh, last week tried to claim that there was no history of slavery in Australia and then, when he was quite rightly pulled up on that, uh, tried to weasel uh, out of that claim with uh, a sorry if you're offended non-apology, the kind of non-apology that we hear far too much of uh, in public life in Australia at the moment. What I want to say is it's very um, uh, uh, difficult to understand how the Prime Minister of this country could be so ignorant of Australia's history. And there has been slavery in Australia. There has been and there have been many instances of slavery in Australia's history, shameful instances of slavery. And unfortunately, one of the big issues that we have in this country in the context of the debate around racism that we have had and are continuing to have in Australia is the fact that so many of our structures are based on a racist colonial legacy. The concept of terra nullius and the fact that we are yet to reach genuine reconciliation with First Nations people in Australia. And until we have a treaty with First Nations peoples in this country, we will still have significant unfinished business. And until we have that treaty, it's going to be very hard to eradicate the kind of systemic racism that far too many First Nations peoples and people of colour in this country face every day. And it's not just 
their daily lived experience. It is the structures of so much of what goes on in this country that are based on that racist colonial legacy and based on the fact that we have yet to come to terms with the dispossession, the murders, the genocide that occurred in this country in regards to white settlement and the way that uh, white people treated First Nations people when uh, white people arrived in this country. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm pleased that the government is getting on with implementing the Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group uh, and indeed implementing the legislation. But it will only be the world-leading initiative that we want it to be if it brings the right experts together, those with the practical knowledge and expertise in combating slavery. It's laudable and terrific that so many big Australian companies want to step up and nail their posts to the mast to combat modern slavery in Australia. But I tell you, they can't do it alone and they can't do it without the right people around the table. This group could be a, great, uh, a wonderful resource for taking steps towards crushing modern, modern slavery in our nation and indeed uh, making a contribution around the world. However, the appointments to this uh, group don't include anyone who have ever worked with people at risk of modern slavery. And I tell you that the places that modern slavery exists in our nation, you can see it in oh, look, I understand that there are experts in those companies who work in it in their global sub supply chains. I can tell you, I can see that there are some academics on it. But I want to tell you that we need a broader base than that. It needs to be people who can work with small business because we've seen modern slavery in our nation in uh, the agricultural sector. We've seen, we can see it in people's homes, uh, in domestic service. We can see it in so many locations around our nation and, as the Prime Minister proved this week in his ignorance and blindness to Australian history, it can be right under our noses and we can still not see it because of our cultural prejudices and our blindness. That means you know, when you see, uh, for example, a domestic servant in someone's house, you're going to assume that they're there of their own free will uh, and that they're being paid properly. You have to take your uh, blinkers off and look for exploitation in many places. So in our colonial history, you know, we saw incarcerated First Nations people as prisoners when in fact they were slaves. You might have seen uh, Pacific Islanders here as uh, uh, immigrants for employment like we do today when in fact they were very much slaves. So I want to put the onus on the government to say you need to have people on this advisory group who work directly with people who are in exploited labour situations today. People who are in these situations today in our nation, but also people who work uh, at the coalface with exploited labour and slavery-like conditions and slavery conditions right around the world. You see, uh, people who produce goods uh, and uh, exercise modern slavery, they're pretty good at hiding what they do from their supply chains. And I know that there are experts from corporations that are appointed to this panel that well know that, that, that well know that and will be quite good at what they do. I don't denounce that. But you must also have representatives from people who understand the kind of cultural leverage, the kind of cultural leverage that people have over other people, economic and cultural, that puts them in these slavery conditions. I'm really pleased that Minister uh, Wood has acknowledged uh, uh, that he would like to meet with Senator Keneally uh, on the basis that so many groups have critiqued the appointments to this body. And I can see uh, my good senatorial colleagues opposite saying, 
uh, that what Labor is saying is incorrect. Well, I have to tell you that I deeply respect the academics and the civil society groups that have written to Minister Wood raising their concerns. I don't negate the credentials of those that have been appointed, but I say to you it is blatantly one-sided and we've got an opportunity to fix that, to bring in the diversity that will be required to, bring, uh, to combat modern slavery in our nation and globally. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Slavery is perhaps the most abhorrent practice in human history, and I doubt that that's a matter up for debate. If we all agree how deplorable slavery is, then I fail to see why those opposite would seek to make the elimination of modern slavery from international supply chains a partisan issue. But then again, history shows that nothing is above petty partisan politics when it comes to the Australian Labor Party, especially when doing the bidding of their union masters. Do you think abolishing slavery is a joke, Senator Keneally? I don't think so. Given the sharp decline in the relevance of trade unions, evidenced by the fact that they now only represent 14 per cent of Australian workers, you would think that this extremely sectional interest group would wake up and accept that its influence has diminished in line with its dwindling representation. Yet, apparently not. Any opportunity to press their thumb on the scale to leverage undue influence for their flagging enterprise is grasped with gusto. And that's what today's matter of public importance from the Labor Party is all about. Senator Pratt, please take this seriously. Surely this is a new low, even for those opposite. At a time when the primary concern of this government is ensuring that as many Australians as possible are supported as we emerge from a global pandemic. The opposition can't resist making a petty political point, a point dripping with self-interest on an issue that should be above party politics and factional interests. Senator Keneally, please. The fact remains that Senator Keneally, I didn't interrupt you. The fact remains that ending modern slavery is an extremely noble and worthwhile goal and one that we should all be committed to. The Modern Slavery Act will hold large businesses to account for ensuring they work earnestly to mitigate the risk of modern slavery within their supply chains. The Act is the strongest legislation of its kind in the world. The Act sets clear mandatory criteria that businesses must meet. It creates a central register to house statements on modern slavery and even requires the government itself to report on modern slavery risks in procurement. The Australian government has a strong and effective national response to modern slavery and human trafficking. There are a powerful set of criminal offences with up to 25 years imprisonment available as a punish as well as specialist investigative teams working within the Australian Federal Police. The government works extremely hard to ensure that Australia's Modern Slavery Act is world-leading and drives a race to, to the top by business. Reporting requirements and the risk to brand reputation mean it is in the best interests of businesses to comprehensively deal with even the suggestion of slavish exploitation within their supply chains. Good supply chain management and ethically sourcing products are big winners in the modern marketplace. One need only look at McDonald's ta talking up their ethical sourcing of coffee to see that this is a path that big corporates are keen to take. Consumer consumers support it, meaning it is a good business decision as much as a moral one. Let's not pretend anything about this legislation was rushed or that extensive consultation wasn't carried out. Consultation included releasing a detailed public discussion paper in August 2017, 
roundtables with representatives across the spectrum in September and October 2017. More than 50 meetings with stakeholders and almost 100 written submissions. To put it bluntly, this was an extensive process that sought as much feedback and input as possible. The government has also released guidance on reducing the risk of modern slavery within the context of our COVID-19 response. The call to action around this initiative is one which has all parts of society united. Yet those opposite seek to categorise and divide on this very issue. Public nominations for the expert advisory group to assist with the implementation of the Act were sought in February this year. The group is a diverse one, made up of business and academic figures, as well as the previous former committee chair. Chris Couther, Crowther is an incredibly well-qualified and experienced person to be on this committee. Chris led from the start on this issue and shared the parliamentary inquiry into the drafting of the legislation. Independent experts and people with pragmatic experience in this field like those on the advisory group, are the people best placed to guide the application of the legislation, to reliably identify and remedy problems within supply chains, and to remain true to the spirit and objectives of the Act. It makes sense to combine the best theoretical and academic minds on a subject with the best practice from industry. This is what the exceptional appointees to the expert advisory group bring to the table. This is the best path forward to ensure that the trends and practices in this area are monitored and our responses stay ahead of attempts to disguise this wicked practice. Why are so many key stakeholders in this order, to order, me, order, 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 ignore the interjection. Okay. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. To me, it is ludicrous to suggest that a union representative would somehow make any positive difference to this group, which is intended to be non-political and seeks to match the best industry leaders with leading academics with experience and understanding in the field. Unions have a chequered history when it comes to protecting workers, often placing their own interests first. You need only look at Bill Shorten's time as AWU secretary. Senator, Ask the Ren workers. Senator Rennick, order. I, just before my colleagues jump, I would urge you, under the standing orders, if you're referring to those in the other chamber, by their title, correct title, please. Sure. Ask the workers on the East Link project how they feel about union representation. So-called flexibility measures ripped workers off substantially. The builder then paid the union almost $300,000 over the next few years. Unions look after their mates in the ALP and vice versa. Then there was the Winslow incident, where workers had their union fees paid by the company, seemingly without their knowledge. Just a block of members being chucked into the AWU for no apparent reason. Or clean event, where workers were signed up to the union without knowing, where the union numbers delivered diminished penalty rates of hard-working cleaners. Again, to enhance union influence in the Labor Party, cleaners and construction workers have been clear victims of modern trade unions. It is a disgrace, Acting Deputy President, a disgrace. Finally, if Labor are concerned about unions having more influence, why not bring them to the table on an issue where they do have a stake? They should perhaps look at getting unions on board with amendments to the Fair Work Act to make it easier for small businesses to comply. To just look at how difficult this is, we need only look at the failure of compliance by Senator Watt's old employer, Morris Blackburn. If an industrial law firm can't get it right, how can a small business owner with no legal training ever get it right? The fact remains that, except with those directly opposite, Unions are less relevant than ever. In a global economy with complex supply chains, a union official is likely to be unqualified when determining how modern slavery might corrupt complex supply chains. 
This is the reason why none were selected, and, suggest, and to suggest that anyone is incompetent for making a correct decision only serves to sum up the ALP. A party who is interested in protecting their rivers of gold from union fees and superannuation funds. The hard-working Aussie butler was left behind by the Australian Labor Party a long time ago. Human rights are non-negotiable, and ending slavery is a critical goal. We should all be working together to achieve it. Right, uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I was on the committee uh, of Hidden in Plain Sight, and uh, along with many other Labor members, and uh, and I do, as uh, uh, the Greens have already raised, uh, do commend uh, the Minister, Defence Minister. Uh, Linda Reynolds uh, for her work in bringing this through to the parliament. Uh, I also acknowledge that Chris Cruther MP, then chair of the time and was MP at the time, who uh, chaired it. We did travel over to the UK and we were briefed uh, quite extensively uh, in terms of uh, the UK uh, legislation. So we were able to, to listen and uh, have evidence uh, brought before us uh, in terms of uh, what worked, what didn't work, and it was quite clear, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, that the united uh, steps that this Senate and this committee, joint committee, took to push forward this report, which is quite extensive, and we were enormously pleased uh, to to push for an anti-slavery commissioner, and clearly very disappointed uh, that it could not progress. Uh, beyond the current piece of legislation, but there's always hope. Uh, I note that New South Wales certainly took the step in terms of the first jurisdiction in Australia to appoint an anti-slavery commission. And I think there's certainly still scope, obviously, for the federal parliament to do the same in terms of this uh, piece of legislation. So that's why it's important that this uh, matter of public importance is brought on uh, in terms of the 10 people who are uh, and have been appointed by the Assistant Minister in this regard. And I, I bring to the attention of the Senate that there has been tremendous work on this from all sides of, of the parliament. Uh, this isn't just about standing up to raise an issue. This is actually about imploring uh, Minister Wood to actually listen to the concerns that are genuinely being raised here in the Senate through this MPI. Uh, one of the, we, we had over 250 submissions to this inquiry to Hidden in Plain Sight, and many of those came uh, from uh, certainly uh, not government organisations or companies. Uh, they came from smaller businesses and families, uh, and certainly the, uh, the, the groups that aren't taken up in terms of business and corporate companies uh, that wanted to give their views. Uh, certainly the religious quarters, all of those. So I think it's important to, to acknowledge that they're absent in this. And what about those NGOs? And I pick up on the previous senator's comments. The unions are critical to this. Uh, they are very relevant because we're talking about workers and the exploitation of individuals, whether it's in family homes on farming companies, and we've certainly heard plenty of that when we travelled around Australia. Over 4,000 people, we estimate, are to be still in slavery here in Australia. And so we needed to make sure that this expert advisory group reflected the concerns that were raised in our inquiry. So, so I would certainly urge Chris Cruther, who is on this, to, to push hard on Jason Wood, MP, Minister. Uh, to push hard and make sure you do have union representatives. You know, make sure you do have other expert advisory groups from civil society who can fairly bring forward a compassionate position but a very practical one in terms of the representation they bring on behalf of all those, especially the over 4,000 people that we are aware of in our estimates through this report who are enslaved here in Australia today. So I would urge senators to realise the importance of what this MPI is about. You think 
that these 10 people are being identified as not good enough. We're saying that you could do better. You must do better. So many senators and members have worked so hard on this particular piece of legislation, and we will not stop. We want to see an anti-slavery commissioner in this country. We want to stop slavery full stop. Over 40 million people around the world are enslaved somewhere. Over 4,000 of them are here in Australia. So this is a matter of public importance. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. If I could say at the outset that I don't have an issue at all with the representative of the trade union movement with appropriate expertise with respect to modern slavery, supply chain management, being a member of this expert committee. And I suspect there will be a fulsome discussion. As Senator Keneally acknowledged, the minister has agreed to meet with Senator Keneally, and that's a good thing. And I also acknowledge Senator McCarthy's warm comments directed towards Senator Linda Reynolds and also a previous member of the other place, uh, Chris Crowther. So those were very warm comments, and uh, I certainly acknowledge them. My issue with this MPI is with respect to the language. With respect to the language, can we come back for a moment and consider what civil society is? What is civil society? It's people brought together with common interests. With common interests, and every single person on that expert panel, whether or not they are a member of a, a company, whether or not they're a legal academic, whether or not they've been at the forefront of setting up charities which have helped protect the most vulnerable people in our world, they're all part of civil society. And their common interest is to abolish modern slavery. And that's the concern I have with the wording of this MPI. It is a them and us MPI. Does anyone in this place seriously think any of the 10 members on that expert panel are going to be trying to wiggle their way out of complying with the legislation? Does anyone honestly think that? And I say that, I say that as someone who is a senior executive and a director of a company of companies in Laos, in PNG, in Myanmar, in Thailand, companies where there was in fact modern slavery. I say that as a person who's held those senior director positions and senior executive positions. And you know what? You know what? We didn't even need a piece of legislation. We didn't need a piece of legislation to fight against modern slavery. We didn't need this chamber to pass this act when we decided to fight against modern slavery. Why? Why? Because it was the right thing to do. Because it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to have appropriate due diligence with respect to supply chains, to make sure contractors and their subcontractors weren't engaging in abhorrent child labour. It was the right thing to actually visit those contractors, walk their factory floors, have a look at their occupational health and safety standards and see if they met the requirements. And each and every single person on this expert panel brings some expertise, particular expertise, to this co committee. And I think it's quite shameful. It's quite shameful that this MPI has been worded, and I don't know who worded the MPI, but I think it's quite shameful that it's been worded in this way that it seeks to pit business against worker. And we're talking about civil society here, civil society, collective interest, the collective interest to abolish modern slavery. And let's not forget the great Australian who was at the forefront of fighting against modern slavery, Twiggy Forrest. Twiggy Forrest. What side's Twiggy on? He was at the forefront of combating modern slavery. But the Labor Party, those, some of them, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, want to make it a partisan issue and want to say it's about them and us. Them and us. And it's not. It's about collective interests, the collective interests to abolish modern slavery. And can I just refer to some of the qualifications of some of the members? of that expert panel, because one of them is a constituent of mine from my home state of Queensland, Dr Kate Van Doer. Kate has done an absolute wonderful job in setting up a charity, a charity that looks after orphanages. And, and I can't think of anything more vile 
than people trafficking in children, selling them into orphanages, selling them into orphanages. I can't think of anything more vile. And Kate has established a charity, an NGO, that specifically addresses that. Specifically addresses that. So why come into this place? Why come into this place and tip a bucket on these good people? Why? To what end? Why didn't you just raise the matter? Why didn't you just raise the matter in a civil way, in a civil way, with the minister and say, you know what? It could be helpful. It could be helpful to avoid something like this if you actually put on a member from the trade union movement. It could be helpful. Why? Why put forward this awfully worded MPI? It's just disgraceful. And to actually assert, to actually assert that this has the potential to undermine Australia's progress, to eradicate modern slavery and supply chains? How? 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 They didn't explain how. The fact of the matter is the legislation which was passed by this House through the committee Senator McCarthy participated on requires companies to put a statement on a publicly searchable register outlining how they comply with the, with the uh, legislation in terms of their supply chains, how they do that due diligence, how they do that risk management on a searchable register. On a searchable register. And the people on the committee are people who have experience in sustainability reporting, in public reporting by public companies, in terms of advocating on these issues, in terms of supply chain management. What an idea. Some of the experts we've got on the expert panel actually do supply and chain management. And this is an issue. You couldn't raise it some other way. Goodness me. It's just despicable. Absolutely despicable. Let me refer to someone else. Let me refer to someone else who's had the, it, the bucket dumped on them by those opposite. In particular, Senator Keneally has dumped the bucket on them. Let's refer to another one. Sunil Rao. Electorate at La Trobe University Law School. He actually founded the Modern Slave Initiative. He's written books on child trafficking, the history of anti-slavery laws. And what, you say he's unbalanced on the issue? Why don't you do your homework? Why don't you do your homework before you tip the bucket on Australians? It might be the way the New South Wales Labor Party behaved, Senator Keneally, but I would have expected you to rise to a higher standard when you came to this place. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. And let's, let's not talk about the Victorian Labor Party. I'm not, I'm not sure they're part of civic society, are they, Senator Keneally? Uh, Senator Scar, may I remind you to address your comments to the chair? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think another point that needs to be noted in this debate is that this ex expert panel actually reports to the National Round Table. And who's on the National Round Table? So the expert panel reports to the National Round Table. Now let's have a look who's on the National Round Table. Because I didn't hear anything about the National Round Table from any of the speakers opposite. I didn't hear anything. No, I didn't hear anything about the National Round Table from any of the speakers opposite. I certainly didn't hear an acknowledgement that the expert panel actually reports to the National Round Table. So they report to a round table that includes the ACTU. So the expert panel actually reports to a round table that includes the ACTU. Includes the ACTU. They're actually subject to oversight by the body, by the body that includes the ACTU. And those opposite have an issue? Madam Deputy President. From time to time, it, it is quite dismaying that those op opposite make political issues out of those things they shouldn't make political issues on. This matter could have been handled quite differently, but they are chasing a headline. They are chasing a headline, Madam Deputy President. And I do hope, I do hope Senator Keneally's meeting with the minister is fruitful. But can I just say this? It would have been nice. It would have been nice if that meeting had occurred without tipping the bucket. On good Australians. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Walsh. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy President. Well, earlier this year, I met with uh, Lydia and Dello, two women from uh, the Philippines originally, who are living here in Canberra. 
uh, and they had been recruited to work as qualified massage therapists. They'd been sponsored on 457 visas and signed contracts which promised them legal pay and conditions. But when they arrived in Australia, their employer took their passports from them, forced them to work 13 hours a day, six days a week, and kept them under constant surveillance. They were forced to live in an overcrowded house and they were locked inside. They were banned from talking to family and friends and were forced to hand back part of their salary in cash to their employer. All the time, their employer kept the threat of deportation hanging over them. Their family members back in the Philippines were threatened with violence and harm if they spoke out. And there were two groups who helped those women. One of them was the Salvation Army and the other was the union movement, specifically the United Workers Union. So it is extraordinary that these groups have been excluded from this advisory panel. It is absolutely extraordinary. It was with the support of these groups that these women were able to bravely stand up and tell their story uh, and speak out and advocate on their own behalf for the justice that they so uh, incredibly deserve. Um, it is extraordinary uh, that they are not uh, participating on the government's modern slavery expert advisory group. Uh, because right now the likelihood is that if an example of modern slavery is found in Australia, it will be a union, it will be a human rights organisation, a faith organisation, a social service organisation that finds it. Uh, and it is also these organisations that are working directly with the workers who are impacted by modern slavery for them to be able to speak out and fight for justice. And it is these very organisations that have been advocating for the type of supply chain reform uh, that the senators on the other side have been talking about. These are the people who have been advocating uh, for this reform. So um, this is not optional. It is absolutely critical that this expert advisory group includes these organisations in the discussions around how we, as a country, as a society, can best tackle um, this tragic issue. Uh, and last year, I met with a group of farm workers who had similar experiences in my home state of Victoria, and their experiences were very much located in a supply chain um, of exploitation with supermarkets at the top. Uh, Mahali uh, was one of the workers who told me about contractors paying workers $10 an hour to pick fruit, lettuce and herbs, um, not far from where I live in Victoria. Uh, and Daniel told me about how the farm labour contractors are setting this up. They're charging thousands for visa applications. They're taking workers' passports off them on arrival. They're leaving the farm workers trapped in these exploitative conditions. They're unable to go home and they're terrified of speaking out for being reported to immigration. So it takes incredible courage for them to speak out. And of course, the organisations that are helping them speak out are the unions. And that is why we need the union movement to be included on this expert advisory group. I really welcome the government's decision to establish this group. Um, it is absolutely vital that this, or, this committee exists to inform uh, the government on responses to combating modern slavery uh, in supply chains. It's an incredibly important step uh, and we need to get Australia's response right. But again, it just cannot be the case that the very organisations that work directly with the victims of modern slavery are excluded from this advisory group. Out of the 10 appointments made to the advisory group, they overwhelmingly represent business and employers, uh, and that is just not good enough. Uh, and contrary to the comments made on the other side, of course we welcome business and employers being on that advisory group, but we want to see balance. We want to see the people who have been advocating for and speaking out uh, with these workers who've been exploited, who've experienced um, this modern slavery to be included in the discussion about the solutions. Uh, that is all we are asking for uh, in this matter of importance today. Uh, and the advisory group has received 70 applications to participate um, from organisations in the union movement and civil society, including the ones I mentioned before. So let's pay some respect to the organisations that have been doing the work to advocate and speak out with these Thank workers. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Your time has expired and the time for the MPI debate has concluded.
Um, there are no documents listed for debate today, so I shall now proceed to committee reports. Um, so I think, uh, Senator Hanson, you're presenting a statement. I have. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I um, should suggest it's on the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System. Thank you, Senator Thank Hanson. Thank you. I rise today to provide an update on the progress of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's family law system. As with other committees, the way we have carried out our work has changed due to the restrictions in place over the past three months as a result of the COVID-19. Despite these restrictions, the work of the committee has continued, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank members for their contribution. To date, the committee has received and is currently processing over 1,500 individual submissions and almost 200 organisational submissions to this inquiry. We continue to receive and consider submissions. The committee has also held a number of hearings this year. We were fortunate to travel to several communities in Queensland and New South Wales in early March where we conducted public and in-camera hearings. We also had a number of hearings scheduled in Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, the Northern Territory and Western Australia. While we have been unable to travel since mid-March, the committee has continued to conduct in-camera hearings to hear from individuals about their experiences of the family law system. We have also begun to hear from organisations in public hearings using the video conferencing facilities available here in Canberra. Since COVID-19 restrictions came into place, we have conducted five in-camera hearings and one public hearing. We will continue to conduct hearings in this way for the foreseeable future. There are a number of themes that have begun to emerge from the evidence. We have heard about the costs associated with the family law system, delays in the court system and the appropriateness of our legal framework. We look forward to further interrogating these and other themes as we continue our important work. On behalf of the committee, I thank all of the submitters and witnesses to this inquiry, especially those children, parents and grandparents who have been through or are currently in the family law system. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator uh, Gallagher on another report. Uh, no, sorry, Madam Deputy President. Oh, I present a delegation report. Come to you, my mistake. Um, I think there's a government response, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Madam Deputy I present the government's response to the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties on its inquiry into investments, Uruguay, uh, ISDS, UN Convention, and Convention SKAO, and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Gallagher now. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to present a delegation report. Oh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator uh, Gallagher. I present the report of the Australian parliamentary delegation to Thailand, the Philippines and Malaysia, which took place from 24 August to 4 September 2019. And I seek leave to move a motion to take note of the document. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. The delegation consisted of uh, the delegation leader, the member for Page, uh, Mr Hogan, the member for Groom, Dr McVeigh and myself. Uh, we attended the 40th uh, General Assembly of the ASEAN Interparliamentary Assembly in Bangkok as observers. Uh, Australia and ASEAN not only enjoy a significant economic relationship, but also strong government-to-government -government relationships and, most importantly, people-to-people -people connections. Australia's cooperative programs with ASEAN commenced as early as 1974, and the cooperation has expanded and adapted to uh, match the progress, which has been significant, that all ASEAN countries have made since then. 
The delegation attended both the plenary session of the Assembly and was also invited to participate in dialogue sessions with IPA member countries. The dialogue sessions had a particular focus on good regulatory practice, and the discussion also covered the relationship between member countries and Australia. On the sidelines of the Assembly, bilateral meetings were held with members of the delegations from Malaysia, Canada and the Republic of Korea. The delegation also met with the Secretary-General of IPA, who discussed ways in which IPA is developing its relationship with some observer parliaments. And the delegation considers that there is an opportunity for the Australian Parliament to deepen its relationship with IPA. For example, it could explore a dialogue series on specific issues, for example, road safety and marine debris. For the first time, the delegation to IPA was combined with regular country visits to ASEAN nations, and following IPA, the delegation travelled to the Philippines and then Malaysia. In Manila, the delegation met with parliamentarians, business research, business people, researchers, uh, the Australian ambassador, and visited a project supported by Australian aid in the Pandacan district. A meeting with members of the Philippine Congress was a good opportunity to share experiences amongst uh, parliamentarians and committee members and learn more about the parliamentary system in the Philippines. A discussion with members of the Australian New Zealand Chamber of Commerce uh, of the Philippines gave the delegation insights into the existing business relationships between our countries. The long-standing relationship between Australia and the Philippines is both broad and deep, includes strong people-to-people -people links. However, the delegation heard the trade relationship is less strong, and there is certainly room for growth in the economic ties between the two countries. In Kuala Lumpur, the delegation met with Malaysian ministers and civil society, received uh, briefings from the Australian High Commissioner, and finished with a visit to the Malaysian Parliament to meet with the Speaker of the House of Representatives. A recurring theme of discussion was the Malaysian government's focus on reform, including parliamentary reform. Malaysia is looking at other countries to identify good practice and other resources that it can adopt or adapt. This includes OJAS and the House of Representatives practice. In its uh, conclusion to the report, the delegation continued, uh, considered that continuing to focus on and, where appropriate, deepen our relationship with ASEAN countries and their parliaments should remain a priority for Australia. Combining the delegation to IPA with the regular visits to ASEAN nations followed a suggestion from the 2018 parliamentary delegation to Vietnam, Thailand and Brunei, and that ASEAN country visit should be timed to coincide with IPA to obviously maximise the delegates' interaction with regional parliamentarians. The delegation considered there is a natural alignment between observing the IPA General Assembly and visiting two of the member countries to see their parliamentary environment in practice. However, it is noted that the stay in Thailand was heavily focused on the Assembly and was therefore not the same in, uh, opportunity for in-depth engagement with our Thai parliamentary counterparts as, as there were in the other two, uh, two countries. The delegation thanks the hosts of IPA on the 40th of uh, IPA General Assembly, the National Assembly of Thailand, the IPA Secretariat and Australia's diplomatic missions in Bangkok, Manila and Kuala Lumpur for developing the programs and the support provided through the visits. And I'd just like to say this, Madam Deputy President, that seems like an absolute lifetime away. You know, six or seven months ago, uh, we were able to travel the world easily and deepen our already uh, strong relationships. We will get back to that, and I do encourage the parliament to continue its interactions with ASEAN and IPA because they're genuinely good things to do. They're not, uh, as some would have in the media and other places, jaunts. They're really hard-working, good endeavours which result in tangible achievements. The Malaysian parliament looks at the Senate practice. It looks at the Senate practice in respect to estimates and wants to do some good work in those spaces. So I do uh, encourage all senators to, where possible, contribute on these delegations 
because they are extremely worthwhile and when the world returns to normal, there should be more of them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gallacher. Um, so there are no ministerial statements, but there are committee memberships. Oh, and I just need to put the report. Sorry. So the question is that motion is moved by Senator Gallacher uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe that's carried. Um, so there are committee memberships. The president has received letters requesting changes in the memberships of committees. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is uh, leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dy dynamic red. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We do have a message from the House. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Amendment Coronavirus Economic Response Package Bill 2024 concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may, be proceed, may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act 1975 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing the name of Senators Kitching and Carr for the disallowance of the Australian Postal Corporation Performance Standards Amendment 2020 Measures Number One Regulations 2020. Uh, Senator Kitching. Thank Can you, Deputy we just President. Get the I clock adjusted, please. Thank you, Senator I move, Kitching. I move the motion. I seek leave also to add Senator Hanson Young's name to this motion. Uh, yes, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. On 21 April, those opposite announced that Australia Post's performance standards would be temporarily amended by regulation. The regulation was then registered on Friday, the 15th of May, 2020. These changes are set to last until July 2021. The government and Australia Post management said that this will help to manage the impacts that COVID-19 has had on its operations. This regulation reduces the frequency of letter delivery and provides Australia Post with significant flexibility to restructure its workforce operations. Currently, Australia Post is required to service 98 per cent of postal delivery points daily. This excludes weekends and public holidays. Under the regulation, this requirement will be removed. Australia Post will instead be required to service 97 per cent delivery points at least two days per week. Currently, delivery timeframes within a capital city allow for three business days after the day of posting. This would change to allow for five business days after day of posting, which is effectively, when you think about it, seven days if you post on a Friday afternoon. Currently, delivery timeframes within a regional city allow for three business days after the day of posting. This would change to allow for five business days after day of posting. Letter delivery timeframes from a capital to regional city within the same state currently allow for four business days after day of posting. This would be pushed out to five business days after day of posting. The current post box clearance frequency and day of posting definition means that clearance is daily Therefore, the day of posting was same day or following day. The changes mean that Australia Post can now set their clearance times, which in turn determines the day of posting. In practice, this will mean no clearance on a Sunday. On its priority letters service, Australia Post had to offer this where businesses 
could pay to have letters delivered faster. Now this is no longer offered. This is a service that generates $400 million a year in revenue. Australia Post argues that COVID-19 means that fundamental change is required. Annual parcel growth is now forecast to be 20 to 25 per cent over the next few years, well ahead of pre-COVID forecasts of 10 per cent. Current parcel volumes are up 65 per cent. The CEO of Australia Post has also argued a collapse in letters is the reason why change is needed. However, this claim is disputed by unions and contradicted by people within Australia Post. In an article published this past Sunday in the New Daily titled, Australia Post refuses to divulge data as it pushes service cuts to parliament, Isabel Lane notes that addressed and unaddressed number of letters sent fell sent fell 10 per cent in February compared to the last month last year, 11 per cent in March, 28 per cent in April and 36 per cent in May. However, the coronavirus pandemic is not the only factor that could have triggered the dramatic decline in April and May, as May 2019 was a federal election month, which means unusually large volumes of unaddressed letters were sent in the weeks preceding the national poll. Ms Lane goes on to say, an Australia Post media spokesperson told the New Daily the figures for annual changes in volumes of addressed and unaddressed mail sent in February, March and April, which the New Daily first requested on Thursday, would be provided by 6pm on Sunday. The spokesperson then provided an incomplete set of figures covering May only and not the three months preceding it, including April when the government's decision to approve service cuts was made. After repeatedly refusing to give the journalists, the unions and the Labor Party the correct information regarding the decline in letter volumes, the government finally acknowledged they deliberately deceived Australians with misleading statistics when ramming through their temporary COVID-19 postal regulations. Address letter volumes did not collapse in March or April 2020 as the government claimed, a claim they used to justify the need for these regulations. Volumes were in line with forecasts and possibly ahead. The day the government announced its decision to cut service standards, Australia Post CEO claimed addressed letter volumes had collapsed by 50 per cent. This in turn became the justification for cutting delivery frequency in half and putting the jobs of one in four posties in limbo and many indirect jobs at risk. Furthermore, we now know that the request for change was made on 31 March this year, when letter volumes were an estimated 4 per cent above trend. In other words, the 7 per cent decline in March 2020 was in fact beating or in line with the internally budgeted pre-COVID forecasts. The lengths this government will go to cut workers, pay, entitlement and conditions, well, really it knows no bounds, Madam Deputy President. In response to these revelations, my colleague in the other place, the member for Greenway and Shadow Communications Minister, said that it was not address letter volumes that collapsed during COVID-19, but the integrity of the Morrison government's rationale for these changes. She went on to say that, the Morrison government has tried to use a health pandemic to bypass consultation and ram through an agenda that cuts services and cuts jobs. And she added, this is an unacceptable breach of trust with the community and a cheap shot on the workers of Australia Post. The parliament must call this out for what it is. I agree with the member for Greenway. This is a shameful and deceitful act by a proven cruel government that is always looking to undermine the conditions of Australian workers. If these regulations were based on a, on a hoax, how and why should we trust them now? Madam Deputy President, these regulations, if they are allowed to stand, will allow Australia Post to scale back services and put jobs and take home pay at risk. Their agenda is to reduce costs by laying off unionised workers and shifting some of the workload to contractors. This is about nothing other than cutting some jobs and transitioning others onto lower wages. 
We know that Australia Post does not intend for these changes to be temporary. That's why all involved are tying themselves into knots, trying to avoid answering the question of whether there will be any indirect job losses. The regulations are pursuing a long-term industrial agenda with COVID being used to get a foot in the door. The extent and impact of that agenda warrants dedicated parliamentary scrutiny, scrutiny that we have sought through a referral to a Senate References Committee. These regulations will cut by half the frequency of postie delivery rounds, as well as push back mail delivery time, time frames within capital cities, within regional cities and between our cities and regional areas. According to the CEPU, around 50 per cent of a postie's daily workload is currently parcels and packets based, 30 to 35 per cent reserved letters and the remain, remainder being unaddressed and premium express products. The idea that the government likes to put forward that posties are just there for letters is nonsense, and we all know this from our own experience. If Australia Post and the government wanted to make a case for change, they should have fronted up and given an honest account of their plans. Instead, they have chosen to hide behind COVID-19 and describe these changes as temporary, in the full knowledge that any consequent changes to the Australia Post workforce may well become irreversible by next July. These changes are not temporary, as the government has claimed. They are intended to be permanent. I cannot understand why the government and those on the crossbench that plan to oppose this disallowance continue to pretend that they are. Voting against this disallowance is a vote for permanent service cuts, with many jobs being put at risk. This vote will be recorded. And when the inevitable job cuts come, when these changes become baked in, permanently undermining the service that our posties provide, the government will be held responsible. Using the cover of a pandemic to pursue an agenda that was clearly on foot prior to the outbreak of COVID is reprehensible. This is about cutting some delivery and processing jobs and shifting other workers onto lower wages. In 2019, the government commissioned the Boston Consulting Group to undertake a review of Australia Post and its financial sustainability. The report has not been published, but it is understood to recommend a range of measures that would impact community service obligations and the workforce. When this report finally comes out, it will be interesting to see if its recommendations align with what the government is currently trying to do. Furthermore, this regulation is proposed to have effect until July 2021. This is curiously longer than the expected COVID-19 timetable for lifting restriction, but just long enough for restructuring to occur. We will see what they try in July 2021, and if they do try and extend these regulations further or seek to make them permanent, then what we will see uh, is, what the, is the agenda that the government has had. COVID-19 should not be used as, as an excuse to rush through changes which are irreversible. This is a behaviour we would expect of an authoritarian regime, not a democratically elected government. The last few months have been a challenging time for everyone, perhaps more so than any other time in our living memory. It has brought out the best in all of us. There has been cooperation between businesses and unions, not seen in a generation, really, in order to protect jobs and keep businesses running. That is a better way forward, not ramming through a regulation like this without consultation and without any opportunity to examine alternative ways forward. These regulations have proven to be not only unnecessary, but also built on a foundation of lies, and they should be shelved immediately. We want to set up a process to give fair examination to alternative options, and this is what the public would expect of us. That is what the public would expect of all of us. Labor supports the disallowance of these regulations. Thank you, um, uh, Senator Kitching. Uh, I think Senator Hanson was first on her feet. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. This is a very important issue, and over the last um, week or so, I've had meetings with the CEO of Australia Post, the IR Relations Manager, uh, Postal, uh, 
services delivery plus also the unions. Conversations on teleconferences. So I've really spent many, many hours dealing with this matter, and I think it's very important because it does affect the workers of Australia, Australia Post. I think there's been a lot of scaremongering that's been going on, especially by the Labor Party and pushed by the unions. Um, let's, let's put some facts on the table. They said it's about COVID-19. This is the first time we've had this pandemic that we've actually ch had to change the way that we do business in this country. A lot of people have lost their jobs, by all means, but to see Australia Post, they haven't. They've done a fantastic job to pick up the cudgel and actually keep going and doing the work that they did. They have actually um, took the mail and deliveries to people. We know over the period of time of years gone by that the delivery of letters has declined considerably. Even the unions admit to that. They are also saying that the increased um, number of parcels to be delivered is what has been the impact on the services that have been provided by the postal workers, such as in one day they had an increase of 160 per cent in parcels in one day alone. Why some of the deliveries aren't happening is because when the COVID-19 happened, a lot of the older workers were actually asked not to come in because they're safe distancing and because of their age and they're worried about their health. So therefore, there was a backlog of deliveries that were done. Because also Qantas and Virgin, who flew a lot of the parcels around the country to actually get um, the mail delivered, of course, they were put on hold. And so it was very hard. So they had to bring in contractors and to take about 60 per cent of the deliveries of the parcels were handed to contractors because they couldn't handle the increased load of parcels that needed to be delivered. What has been said now, and the scaremongering is, the fact is they're, they're saying that they expect it to be cut off, the parcel delivery, to be cut off and then it was going to be privatised. There is no intention from the government or the CEO to privatise Australia Post. I have actually spoken to the minister, and this would be a piece of legislation. As long as One Nation has um, some say in this chamber, or even basically if we have the balanced power, at no time would I ever support privatisation of Australia Post. But that's not, that's not the point, because the CEO of Australia Post has no intentions or the government to privatise Australia Post, any part of it whatsoever. So that's been a scaremongering tactic that's been used by the Labor Party. When you actually look at, they're saying they're going to lose, of the 8,000 jobs which are basically around the cities who deliver the mail, because of the reduction in the number of letters that are out there, um, and a, a, quite a lot of reduction in letters, they want to do a delivery every second day. Now, of those four postal runs, it's not getting rid of anyone whatsoever. So you still have two that will be doing the deliveries. Another one will be dealing with the parcels, just handling it. Two of them will be doing, actually the other two will be dealing with parcels. So it's not going to lose people's jobs. You see, under Australia Post, there are people that are leaving all the time, but they want to transition people, if they were on the bikes, to put them into safe vehicles to deliver their a cart, a uh, car effect. So get them off the bikes, which are dangerous for the older posties who are over 60. So they're looking after their safety. So basically, they're wanting to get them in, into other areas of parcel delivery because the bikes cannot carry the parcels. And this is the way that the Australian consumer is going that they're looking at more in parcel delivery rather than letters. Australia Post was poorly run for a long time by a CEO that was paid $5.6 million in his last year. Now we have a CEO who was intent to actually pull that back. Now they are making a profit, an organisation that has not gone out to actually get rid of jobs. They haven't done that, but they've managed to put Australia Post 
into the black. This is an organisation that they wish to see grow. You can only grow it with an expanding business by running it properly. A lot of the members in this parliament have never run a business. They have no idea. Unions are not there to run businesses. This is why we have a management committee and the CEO to run the business of Australia Post. I can understand the workers are very concerned about their future and their jobs. But there is nothing there to, to say that they are about to lose their jobs. I've seen the documentation and there's been a lot of um, misreading of it. They've told me things were going to happen. They couldn't prove that. And that's why today, in having met with the unions plus the CEO again today, that we came to an understanding and agreement that there will be a Senate inquiry into this, which will be reported on by the 11th of August. They both agree to that. They both want it. And at that Senate inquiry, then we, as the senators, can ask them the questions. They have to present the documentation. They have to present the truth. This disallowance motion is not going to help anything, because unless we look at it and move forward with an industry that provides a lot of jobs in Australia and a service for the Australian people, we're not going to be able to um, do the service to the, to the community. This is about moving forward. COVID-19 is about having to change our ways and how we do business so that we can provide a service to the community plus also maintain the jobs out there. When you have a growing business, as Australia Post is, you don't get rid of your staff. You don't threaten them. They want to keep them on because they're experienced, they're loyal. They've had a great working relationship with their workers, with the unions, and even the unions told me that themselves. So there's been a lot of mistruths that's been put out there and that's been expanded on by the Labor Party because you are backed by the unions and you're pushing your own agenda. Well, I'm not going to allow that to happen. That's why I'm standing here and speaking on behalf of the, of the workers because they need assurances that their jobs are going to be there for them. And I think that's what's very important in this debate. And you've got to start to realise both sides of this House. It's not all about you and pushing your own agendas. It's what's right for the people. So it's about working together. This is only a regulation that will actually finish on the July the 1st, 2021. Then it will be reviewed. By that time, we may be, have a, a totally different system, but this is about providing a service to those people in Australia. Like I said, that is most important. People want those products delivered to them, and that's why there's been increase, and the, they are trying to look at it realistically, and they are trying to work with, with the um, workers. And another point here that was brought to my attention. Australia Post actually offered the workers a 1% bonus. They offered it to the workers. It wasn't asked by the workers. They thought because you'd done a fantastic job, you actually continued to do your work, you went and knocked on these doors. And we didn't know where we were going with COVID-19. So they have offered the 1% bonus to the workers of Australia Post, 36,000 workers, a cost of $22 million. So they are respect their workers. You don't offer that if you intend to get rid of them. And also there's no intentions for a, um, to actually pay, uh, pay them out a redundancy. There's no intentions of a redundancy. There will be no redundancy offered to these workers because they want them to transition to actually doing the jobs and delivering parcels. So what you've said is totally misleading. And you are going to scare a lot of people out there who work for Australia Post who want assurances that their jobs will be there. And the community of the Australian people want to know that their Australia Post is going to be there for them as well, which it will be because, again, I'll reiterate it again and again, there is no intentions of privatising Australia Post.
There is no intentions of offering redundancy pays. There is no intentions of actually getting rid of the workers. They want them to transition into other areas so they can provide the services to the Australian people. So it's about time that this evidence, I'm hoping, will come out in the inquiry. The truth of the matter will be produced and we'll, we will, should go on from there to ensure that we will have the survival of Australia Post for a long time to come in the hands of the government for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Carr, I'm going around Senator Hanson. Young, sure. You'll be next. Um, look, so there we have it. One Nation is prepared to sink this motion because One Nation has taken the view that they've heard the good oil from the management of Australia Post because they've taken the view They've taken the view that we're going to have an anti-union, anti-worker position from One Nation in terms of the defence of Australia's public institutions. And we've had it all spelled out to us tonight, very, very clearly, unequivocally, clearly spelled out to us by Pauline Hanson. She's accepted the word of the management of Australia Post that there's no threat to jobs. She hasn't referred to any of the documentation that's actually put before this parliament. She's not actually looked at the words, the actual words used by the management of Australia Post. She's relied upon the good intentions of the management of Australia Post and this government. And she's essentially reinforced her traditional view that we're not to listen to the unions and we're not to listen to the labour movement on such an important matter. No wonder there's so little trust in One Nation across this country. No wonder there's so little understanding of why it is that One Nation fails to come to grips with the really basic questions that's confronting this nation. Now, this is an important and profoundly important uh, motion, which, of course, we've all understood One Nation is going to vote down. It is a motion that is for reasons of both substance and process that should be supported. And no doubt, as a result of the Senate inquiry that will be held, there will be an opportunity for us to vote on this again, when One Nation might have actually got a few facts in their heads, as distinct from glib assurances. There may well be an opportunity to reconsider the damage that they do by their profoundly naive attitudes. What we have here is a process. Well, perhaps we go back to the first issue about public institutions and public trust. This is a government that, of course, is all about cutting jobs and about cutting downgrading essential services and, of course, in communities who need it most. And that's not the first time we've heard this government use this pandemic to run out their ideological agendas when it suits them. We've seen the position they've run in the universities. We've seen their position that they've run in regard to superannuation. We've seen their position in terms of industrial relations. They can set up all the committees they like. They can offer all the assurances they like. But at heart, they remain a conservative government that wants to use this pandemic as an excuse to pursue these matters. We, of course, then have the question of the process, where the government delivers under the guise of this pandemic a proposition that says, well, now we've got the chance to implement this, this effect this, this uh, agenda this, and, and it reflects the real danger of having unchecked power and regulations of this type. And that's why, and I remind uh, Senator Hanson and the One Nation senators to actually look what this parliament said, because the scrutiny of delegated legislation committee, not run by the unions, not run by the Labor Party, but comprising an equal number of government and opposition senators, they've expressed deep concern at the fact that this uh, set of regulations have been introduced using the guise of the pandemic to evade scrutiny in regard to the regulatory changes. And as a consequence, a letter has been sent to the minister to explain why there has not been proper consultation on these matters. That's exactly the position that's been presented on the 11th of June. We're waiting a reply to those matters. But it has become increasingly clear that the government, of course, knows already the answer to that because they've set in train the practice to implement these changes without consultation. 
And furthermore, they're acting on the assumption that these are not temporary changes but permanent changes. And that's why we have a situation here where the uh, proposal for the Australian Postal Corporation Performance Standards Amendments regulations will allow the closure of post offices and postal outlets. And that's the point I want to emphasise. That has an impact, particularly in rural communities, for the closure of rural post offices and particularly in regard to the fact that these are important, essential community services under the guise of the pandemic. These changes were made uh, in such a way because the Prime Minister on the 18th of March provided with an exemption for the need to have a regulatory impact statement. Now they just say, well, that's just a routine matter. But it goes to the heart of the question about how these processes have been put together. Subsequent amendments to the postal regulations will effectively allow the shutdown of rural outlets at, on, on the face of it till the 30th of June next year. And once that happens, you try reopening a country post office or a rural outlet once it's been closed. What we'll see, of course, is that there's uh, clearly a statement from the government that they want to reduce the number of outlets that are available. Currently, they're required. The 4,000 real outlets have to be in placed in defined areas. At least 50 per cent of these outlets uh, have to be uh, sure that, uh, so that there is, uh, of course, uh, provided in, in in, in country areas, in fact, 2,500 that have been rural areas. In metropolitan areas, outlets must be located so that at least 90 per cent of the residents are within two and a half kilometres from an outlet. But outside metropolitan areas, they're located so that at least 85 per cent of residents are within seven and a half kilometres of an outlet. This provision changes that. It changes that because what it says is that under the terms of these regulations, because of staffing changes, the government can now close those outlets. And what do the actual explanatory memorandums say? And this is the point that I've made on a previous occasion. The new regulations give the post office very, very broad disc discretions as to why or how they can close outlets. They don't have to provide an explanation for a start as to why they're closing those outlets. The explanatory statement for the new regulation states and applies to all types of retail outlets, and I quote, and that the workforce of retail outlets is to be interpreted broadly. Why are those words presented in that manner? It provides the opportunity to actually close those statements without explanation and the broadest possible interpretation. There are, of course, changes to reduce letter delivery standards with priority mails being suspended, maximum delivery time for within a letters within one state to be able to reduce in the, the uh, operations so that it can now take up to five days. Talk about snail mail. We've got delivery frequencies in metropolitan areas to, to actually decrease from daily delivery to alternate business day delivery. And so what we've got is a situation where the government says to the union, we will then implement these changes in this manner. So it's presented as a fait accompli. This is despite the fact that the union believes that the consequence of these changes is that some 2,500 jobs will actually be lost. Now, it shouldn't be underestimated that further consequences on the knock-on effect in terms of the postal supply chain, in terms of other mail rooms and the like. So it's much more than just the 2,500 jobs. Now, this is in the mix of the first recession we've had in 30 years. I would have thought, and under any normal circumstances, you'd have to question whether or not this is in fact reckless and irresponsible. Where the government who purports to claim to represent rural interests is actually providing an opportunity, which One Nation is now endorsing, providing the opportunity to actually undermine an essential service in rural and regional Australia. The government has been willing to ensure that other essential services to uh, that are able to operate throughout the pandemic. They don't say that schools can't operate. 
In fact, they insist that schools do operate. They don't say that trains uh, can't operate. In fact, they insist that people do use public transport. And even this parliament, after a bit of begrudging work, they did come to the view that we have to have a parliamentary system in this country. So why is it that post offices are to be treated in a different manner? And I have to suggest that Australia Post has been given a nod and a wink from this government that they are in fact preparing them, fattening them up for a different business operation, for the dreaded privatisation, which of course is the model that happens in so many places around the world. Now the annual report makes it very clear that Australia Post is actually doing very well. Revenue of 6.9 billion and before tax profit of 41 million. Strong domestic parcel growth with revenue up 9.2 per cent. Business efficiency savings of already $250 million. Profits are increasing. So why does the government actually want to cut services? Why is it, if the government says that these are only temporary changes, that it wants to cut jobs? Now, it's not as if they've got an intractable union. In fact, this union has a long record of working constructively to make very significant changes to the way in which postal services are delivered. And the union and management have set up a number of joint working groups on a number of trial sites across the country. So it's not as if the union's not prepared to engage, but these groups, of course, were cancelled, actually cancelled because of the pandemic. And I don't think we can really take the dedication of Australian posters and their posties, something that we, uh, could be taken for granted. And this pandemic is a demonstration of why we should not. They are indeed frontline workers, and like healthcare workers, like cleaners and supermarket staffs, and posties have kept on delivering in a timely manner. They provide an essential service to the Australian people. But when, of course, Australia Post CEO, Mr Christine Holgate, actually asks, will you in fact guarantee that we know job losses? She uses the yes minister, the weasel words, or well, we don't, uh, we can't guarantee it. Well, we guarantee there won't be forced redundancies. In fact, she says, we don't need to offer, we offer re uh, voluntary redundancies because we did it to support the union. So there you have it. It's the ultimate in management doublespeak. They're prepared to put people out of work to help the union. What extraordinary generosity. We all know that the changes to the communications board about the internet have made parcel delivery the crucial part of Australian postal business. But in doing so, we should ask ourselves, how do we organise ourselves in such a way in which we are able to improve services, not reduce them? The government has tried to claim that posties only deliver letters and the changes are needed to ensure the delivery of parcels. Any of us who have spent any time at home recently know that's just not right. According to the CEPU, about 50 per cent of the typical postage run is parcels and packages. About a third of the load is reserved for letters. The remainder is unaddressed and premium express products. The government should stop pretending that we can, what we can actually see for our own eyes is very different from the double speak that they use and the sorts of management speak that they use about not forcing redundancies, but only offering voluntary redundancies. We, of course, know that this is a government that should be seriously committed to building the communications infrastructure for the 21st century. We should have a government that actually has its eye on the future and also has a view to ensuring a assured revenue stream. Now, Australia Post 
is such a revenue stream. Publicly trusted public institution like Australia Post is something we should protect, something we should preserve, something that we should advance. And it's not just about parcel courier service to be eyed off by some potential corporate raider. It's an essential public service that we should, as a country, advance to ensure that we are able to service this community in a manner fitting an advanced industrial country in the 21st century. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this debate this evening and, uh, as one of the co sponsors of this motion, of course, uh, wholeheartedly agree that this regulation should be disallowed. Now, we've heard time and time again in the midst of this debate uh, that uh, the reason that this regulation is needed is because we are in the middle of COVID-19 and a pandemic. Well, Madam Acting Deputy President, what type of government cuts essential public services in the middle of a health crisis? What type of government cuts essential public services when everyday Australians are being told to stay home, don't go anywhere, do everything from your lounge room, your kitchen and your back porch? What type of government cuts public services, essential public services, in the middle of a pandemic? This government. It's this government who is using this pandemic to allow their creep of privatisation into Australia Post. And we've heard from uh, Pauline Hanson and One Nation tonight that they are prepared to take the word of uh, the boss at Australia Post and the minister that everything's going to be OK. Well, of course, here on the uh, green benches, uh, we are not so foolish. We are not so gullible. There has been no commitment given that this would be simply a short-term suspension, and in fact it's not. This regulation would put in place these new rules for delivery, for cuts to services, job losses for another 12 months. And of course we know, Madam Acting Deputy President, what happens when the government cut public services. It's very, very hard to get them back. Very hard. Now, I'm quite concerned at the principle of this because I do believe that Australia Post needs to remain in public hands and needs to remain as an essential service for everyone. Metro, suburban, rural, regional areas for everyone. But I do have a particular concern that for senior Australians this is going to be a blow to them. People who are more likely to engage with uh, government agencies, uh, with utility services, uh, with friends and family via letters as opposed to electronically. It's senior Australians who are going to cop it because of this cruel move from the government, this cynical move from the government. But I've also got a particular concern for those who live in rural and regional Australia. I grew up in a country town. I know what it's like when the government of the day decides to cut the public service and says, oh, well, it doesn't really matter, you're just a small town. You can drive 100 k's down the road to the next post office. In some cases, maybe it's 150 kilometres, maybe it's 200 kilometres, maybe it's more. I also happen to be um, uh, the sister of uh, someone who's been a postie. My brother's been a postie in a country town, the country town I grew up in. And it's essential, it is absolutely essential that in country and rural areas, that the people who have these jobs right now are able to keep them. We know that we are heading to a cliff of unemployment that is going to start rising more and more. We've already had hundreds of thousands, a million people lost their jobs in the last three months because of COVID-19. Millions more are worried about what happens come September when the government cuts JobKeeper. Are we going to allow a cut to public services 
through this regulation that is going to mean more Australians out of work, not because of COVID-19, but because of the government's actions, not because of the virus, but because of the government's obsession with cuts, deregulation and the slow creep, creep, creep to privatisation. Thousands of Australians who currently work for Australia Post could be out of work because of this regulation. But as the One Nation and the minister tells us, oh, no, 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 we'll just, it's just for 12 months. No one believes that. And if you do, you're a fool. Slow creep to privatisation, it, has, it is the hallmark of the Conservatives in this country, state and federal. It's not going to change. Senior Australians should be very upset that their government is about to sell them out. Rural and regional Australians should be very upset that the government doesn't think they deserve these basic services. And everyone should be worried that the government is using once again COVID-19 as a cover for their reckless and cruel policy agenda. Only a couple of weeks ago, last month, the finance minister, Matthias Cormann, proudly said on radio their government's going to use COVID-19 for an aggressive, an aggressive deregulation agenda. Well, here is just one simple example of that. This government could lie straight in bed when they talk about their commitment to essential services, to public jobs. Every single time they utter their words of, oh, no cuts, no privatisation, look behind their back and see their cross fingers. We know the hallmark of this government is cuts, deregulation and job losses. This, de this disallowance should be supported by the chamber tonight. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, uh, and I will uh, indicate I'm reserving the position of Centre Alliance because we do have a Senate inquiry on, on uh, foot now that will examine this detail and, and greater issue. But I do want to put some thoughts uh, on the table. Firstly, uh, the operation of the National Post Service has been and still is one of the core functions of the Commonwealth Government. Under the provisions of Section 51v5 uh, of the Constitution, the Commonwealth Parliament is empowered to make laws with regard to postal, telegraphic, telephonic and other like services. The Postmaster General's Department was one of the original Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth Departments created on 1 January 1901 uh, by Federal Executive Minute No. 1 of 1 January 1901. The Post and uh, Telegraph Act of 1901 was one of the earliest pieces of legislation passed by the Commonwealth Parliament, formalising the federal takeover of the post and telegraph services of the states. That Act and the Postmaster General's Department were the responsibility of a minister with cabinet rank, the Postmaster General. The Postmaster General's Department functioned for 75 years until the it was disaggregated by the Whitlam government to form in the mid-1975 uh, mid two entities, the, the Australian Telecommunications Commission, trading as Tel Telecom Australia and later as Telstra, and the Australian Postal Commission, trading as Australia Post. 40, 45 years of corporatisation and privatisation has followed. Telstra was privatised by the Howard government and the Gillard government sold off uh, the Commonwealth Government's remaining shares in the company in 2011. Since 1989, Australia Post has operated as a fully corporatised government business enterprise under the Australian Postal Corporations Act 1989, the APC Act. The APC Act imposes a community service obligation that must be adhered to, uh, uh, to, Australia's, uh, to Australia Post letter services. These include that Australia Post must make the letter service available 
at a single uniform rate of postage for carriage within Australia by ordinary post of letters that are standard posted postal articles. Australia Post is also required to ensure that, in view of the social importance of the letter service, the services should be reasonably accessible to all people in Australia on an equitable basis wherever they reside or carry on their business, and the performance standard, including delivery times for the letter services, reasonably meets social, industrial and commercial needs of the Australian community. It's interesting to go back to the explanatory memorandum associated with the original bill. Um, uh, the, in, in, 1980, uh, in 1988, uh, where they talk about uh, the, the uh, community service obligation, and they say the right to carry letters within Australia and between Australia and overseas is reserved uh, to Australia Post in recognition of the uh, uh, community service obligations imposed on Australia Post. Australia Post is empowered to take action in the federal court for relief where a person engages in or proposes to engage in the provision of a reserve service. So what that means is Australia Post has had exclusive rights in Australia to carry letters, um, uh, and indeed that's what Australia Post built its, uh, its, its reputation on. No one else could deliver letters. It was against the law. And that post, that uh, red um, uh, bike uh, that uh, went down the th down the street, or the red, um, uh, I don't know, we call them pre-moped uh, uh, motorbike, uh, would go down the street, and that's what people remember about about Australia Post. And so it's interesting they built their reputation, the, uh, and it, and their iconic sta uh, um, um, status on that letter service. And now we see that they want to. Uh, in some sense, reduce that uh, that uh, customer service obligation and uh, or community service obligation. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. I did talk to the CEO uh, in reducing that, not willing to open that up to the market. So they want to maintain that reserved uh, status, uh, not deliver in accordance with what was originally intended, uh, but not let anyone else uh, step into uh, their shoes. The Australia Post has unquestionably had its ups and downs, and it has responded to the challenges and opportunities uh, of our evolving digital economy. In October last year, Australia Post completed a major rebranding pro project with Melbourne-based brand strategy firm Maud. This project saw the development of a new brand identity, websites and self-service platforms, parcel and letter, letter packaging, street posting boxes, staff uniforms and a fleet of custom-designed electric vehicles for the company's booming parcel, de parcel delivery service. Under CEO Christine Holgate, the declared purpose of Australia's uh, post rebanding is to communicate the organisation's unique and important role in the community and, in the words of the promotional material, to put the Australia back into Australia Post. And yet today we're, we're standing here looking to wind down those services. And my, my concern in relation to this is that um, uh, we, we know there has been a, a, a loss of demand, but the people who likely still have that demand are elderly people who don't know about email or don't uh, like to use it, don't know about Dropbox and all of those other, uh, all of those other things that we, we may take for granted. So just saying that the demand has reduced ignores the fact that uh, there are still people that rely on uh, the post turning up every day. And I kind of look at this in, so in the same way as you look at a bus service where you have some of the unprofitable, unprofitable bus routes and uh, what happens is you say, let's cut those bus routes. Can't afford those. We want to focus on the areas where we make the most money. And that's not how you look after a community. So I just, I'm very, going to be very interested in the, in the uh, Senate inquiry to see exactly what uh, information is drawn out uh, such that we make a good decision in relation to this regulation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Carr is big on gusto and light on truth. Here's a letter from the, con the consulting organisation that is advocating on behalf of the union. It is to Dear Patricia, who happens to be in Senator Hanson's staff. Dear Patricia, this was received today. 
at 5.36 p.m. Dear Patricia, please pass on my thanks to Senator Hanson for her actions in the Senate today to put the regulations to a committee inquiry and ensure the reporting date was brought forward to August rather than March. She goes on. I think neither the government, brackets, who wanted the regulations passed without scrutiny, close brackets, nor the opposition, open brackets, who wanted the inquiry extended to March, close brackets, are thrilled with this outcome. But it is the right one for postal workers. It is the right one for postal workers, she says. She's advocating on behalf of the union. It is the right one for Australia Post management, Australia Post customers, and importantly, for the ability of the Senate to properly scrutinise legislation. This is on behalf of the union. As I said, she goes on, as I said at the end of the meeting, Senator Hanson and I may not agree on everything, but on protecting jobs for essential workers, protecting services for Australian citizens, and keeping public services in Australian ownership, we share a common goal. Let me read that again. Senator Hanson has the common goal of protecting jobs for essential workers, protecting services for Australian citizens, and keeping public service in Australian ownership. That is Senator Hanson's goal, shared by the union. She finishes by saying, thank you again for your time this morning. Let me read you what I received just a few minutes ago on a text message from Angela Cramp, who is leading the licensed post office group. Oh my God, maybe you should run down and tell Kim Carr, this was while Senator Carr was speaking, that his issue was on the table in 2014 and he, bought the, he brought the wrong speech with him. Then she came back again and said, he is actually embarrassing himself he is so off topic. And then she said some sympathy for me. Seriously, I don't know how you guys put up with this rubbish. This is just stunning, what is going on. Senator Hanson listens because she cares. She listens to all sides. She invited the government. She's been in and out of the government's offices in the last two days with a member of my staff and a member of her staff because she cares enough to get the facts. The facts are what should be driving any decision. And if you care enough, you get the facts first. And that's what Senator Hanson does, because she cares. Now we are in regular contact, not regular, frequent contact with the licensed post office group, because we know they've been left out. Left out in the cold, hung out to dry by both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party. I had Angela Cramp in my office today telling me that, agreeing with me. What is the matter with governance in this country when we don't listen to the people whose lives are being affected? Angela Cramp said, Angela Cramp and, and the others are saying that they're supportive of the proposed changes because that is being fair to the people. If we lie to them, if we mislead them, give them false hope, that is no good for them. They need better than that. Before I go on, I want to acknowledge our hard-working post office workers and post office licensees across Australia. In Sen considering Senator, the impact Senator of the Senator Roberts, that, that might be a good, a good moment to, to pause and you'll have the opportunity to resume your, your comments tomorrow. Uh, it being 7.20, debate on the motion is now interrupted for the adjournment and debate will continue as a business of the Senate uh, order of the day tomorrow. Uh, I propose uh, that the Senate now adjourn. I call Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. And, um, I'm pleased to be able to participate in the adjournment debate tonight on an issue that I feel very, very strongly about. And I'm pleased that my colleague Senator Ciccone is here as well. Uh, both of us, along with a number of others in this chamber, Senator Davey, and uh, look, I won't go through the names, are strong supporters of the timber and forestry industry in this country, uh, an industry that proudly supports and sustains jobs across many regional communities uh, right throughout the country, an industry that we as a nation should be proud of. We should be proud of how we do it better than anywhere else in the country, notwithstanding what some amongst us would say about this industry. And I know Senator Brown's a big supporter of the forestry industry in Tasmania as well, and I applaud her for that. But there are some out there who wish to undercut this industry, wish to uh, spread falsehoods about how sustainable and environmentally friendly this industry is. And they are people that need to be held to account 
for what they say. But look, we'll put that to one side for a moment because it's really the people that work in this industry, and I know uh, Senator Rice, who I have a great degree of respect for because she is uh, very, very strong in advocating for her views, many of which I don't agree with, but we are uh, respectful adults and we uh, agree to disagree on many things. The people that work in this industry are the ones I'm interested in advocating for, the honest, hard-working men and women of Australia that work in this sustainable, renewable, world-leading industry. These are the people that go to work every morning thinking they're going to come home safe, that there is no risk to their health and well-being. But when in Tasmania, just last month, we had someone or a group, I'm not sure who, and we will find out, go into our forests and spiking trees. Gigantic metal spikes inserted into the trunks of trees in our state in a way that you could only describe as deplorable. These metal spikes were inserted into the trunks of trees so deep, then covered over with silicon and the bark put back on the outside of the tree to conceal any presence of a, uh, this uh, metal spike. You can only assume whoever did it, individual or group, I don't know, wanted to cause harm. Because it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what happens when a tree trunk being processed in a timber mill with a giant chunk of, a chunk of metal embedded in it encounters a fast spinning blade in a sawmill. It doesn't end well. People lose limbs. People are injured. People are killed. And we only have to look at the comments from Wayne Booth at the Karanja timber mill in the Derwent Valley in southern Tasmania to talk about the close call he had when they were processing timber with a metal spike embedded in it. Seven spikes found. And rightly, there's an investigation underway. And I hope it's the most forensic investigation that we can see, because whoever it was out there that thinks Whatever cause it is they're advancing, and I don't know who it was, whoever it was I am sure will be found out, I want them to be brought to justice because no one out there, no honest, hard-working man or woman who simply because they work in an industry that some people don't like for one reason or another should ever be subjected to such risk to their health and safety just because they go to work. They're not political activists. They're not trying to push a particular barrow. They are going to work to earn an income to pay their bills. And what's more, they're doing it in an industry that we should be proud of, because we do it better in this country than anywhere else in the world. Compare us to Brazil or Malaysia, where they rip trees out of the ground and never plant them again. They don't care about the locals they dislodge from their places of residence. They don't care about the wildlife. They have no regard for any of that, but here in Australia we do, and we have world-class management of that. And that is thanks to the hard-working men and women of the timber industry. And so to whoever it is, and I hope somewhere on the uh, interwebs, as they're referred to by Senator Seawitt from time to time, there is someone who will pick up on what I said tonight, and they will feel regret for what they have done and come forward and admit that they have put the health and safety of hard-working, honest men and women at stake. We need to find out who these people are, bring them to justice and protect this proud industry from people who seek to do such awful things. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Tonight I make a brief contrib contribution regarding the future of manufacturing in my home state of WA. In the West, we've navigated the impact of COVID-19 somewhat better than uh, others had expected since the virus first arrived in the state, which is pleasing indeed. The McGowan government's done an outstanding job steering uh, the state and protecting the community through the pandemic and crisis. But we know that the economic tail, uh, the economic impacts uh, of COVID-19 will have a long tail, including in Western Australia. We've seen destructive uh, and obstructive behaviour from the WA Liberals and Lisa Harvey in the uh, opposition. Uh, 
whereas we nationally have tried very hard to be uh, constructive. Now, I have to say, for the state of WA, the state government's focused on the task of economic recovery, rebuilding communities, ensuring decent, secure and well-paid jobs for Western Australians. It has become more evident than ever that we must see jobs restored and grown in the state's manufacturing sector. The nation uh, has, you know, there's been a commentary about the Australian uh, impacts of COVID, and some have said that some industries have done better than others, uh, for example, mining. But I have to tell you that manufacturing industries in Western Australia have been significantly impacted. Uh, and the impacts there have been very real in terms of job losses and economic downturn. And I doubt very much, given uh, the evidence base that's there, uh, many uh, companies will be feeling the worst of that impact uh, right as their eligibility for things like JobKeeper starts to dry out. We've seen officials scrambling to procure the very medical equipment we've needed to make it through the crisis. And I think that's a legacy from the shrinking manufacturing uh, sector. We've been overly dependent on overseas supply chains, uh, and we've been poorer for it as a nation. But research undertaken by the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union in WA—600 voters, nine in ten of them said WA would be better prepared for future crises if we manufactured more in Western Australia. More than eight in ten surveyed think the equipment needed to keep essential industries like mining, energy and transport going. They say it should be manufactured in Western Australia. And I'm confident if we asked more West Australians those same questions, we'd get the same answers. Australians believe in our manufacturing industries uh, in Western Australia and in this whole nation, in their state and in their towns. Workers and their families in regional Australia have always suffered the most during economic downturns, and our tradies in WA, like other places, are more likely to live in outer suburbs uh, and, or in regional areas. And they're really feeling the impacts of coronavirus uh, very intensely. Uh, and I really wish the government would amend uh, their, their uh, renovation and building incentives so that they could be properly used to stimulate uh, our trade sector. In communities like Collie and Bunbury and other areas of the southwest, they're dealing with the winding down of coal-fired power production and are now experiencing much greater economic uh, distress from coronavirus. The Manufacturing Workers Union has put forward a proposal for the Southwest Advanced Manufacturing Hub, and it deserves proper consideration by state and federal governments. It could be the hub for local mining, transport, energy industries and the critical minerals that the government uh, likes to talk about, uh, but as yet we, we haven't seen anything real that delivers on it. This kind of investment that was successful in the ca case of the Australian Marine Complex in Henderson can bring together uh, capital and industry that can really drive manufacturing and economic growth in the region of the southwest and it should really be pushed forward. I'm glad to see the AMWU taking a lead role in economic recovery in my home state of WA and for the manufacturing sector nationally. And I look forward to constructive and continued engagement in securing the future of jobs in regional Western Australia. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. In this time of heightened awareness and focus on First Nations people's issues and particularly the justice system, the change the record's release of its report called Critical Condition, the Impact of COVID-19 Policies, Policing and Prisons in, uh, on First Nations Communities is very timely. This is an important and, as I said, timely uh, contribution to uh, the issues of First Nations peoples and uh, the issues that affect them, and it highlights how First Nations peoples are disproportionately affected by the more punitive policy approaches and responses to COVID-19. 
As has been Australia's shame for many decades, First Nations peoples are grossly overrepresented in both the adult and youth criminal justice systems. Places of detention are potential hotspots for the transmission of COVID-19, where social distancing is basically impossible. The policies that have, in, in, have been enacted in places of detention in response to COVID-19 pose a very significant risk to First Nations peoples. For example, Change the Record has received multiple reports of increased use of lockdowns, of separation isolation within corrective facilities, forced quarantining of, in, of incoming prisoners, including of children and young people, and reduced access to education, family and legal visits. Take the case of Daniel, a First Nations man being held on remand in Tasmania. Restrictions on legal visits, limited access to telephone calls and a failure of the prison to facilitate confidential legal meetings meant that Daniel's matter was unable to be resolved in court on the day it was listed for. As a result, Daniel is now spending more time in prison on remand. The government needs to take a proactive and preventative approach in this COVID crisis, starting by releasing First Nations prisoners who are low risk, have chronic health conditions, are on remand, are elderly, are, elderly, are children or young people. Many countries around the world have already released prisoners who have less than six months to serve, are on remand, elderly or have chronic illnesses. Australia should follow this, these examples. While the COVID-19 restrictions have been important, the burden of policing and punishment for breaching guidelines disproportionately falls on First Nations peoples. Look at the, the case of in Tennant Creek, a town of around 3,000 people with approximately 50 per cent of the population identifying as First Nations. Of the 48 fines issued in the Northern Territory related to COVID uh, restrictions, 15 were issued in Tennant Creek. Aboriginal legal services in the Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia have reported significant concerns about the issues of fines and over-policing in border towns. Border town communities have been reporting higher levels of police presence, policing of borders and issuing of penalties. Due to a lack of affordable housing, it is difficult for First Nations, peoples, uh, First Nations communities to comply with directions on gatherings in, in gatherings in public and private places. I'm aware of the consequences of police targeting First Nations peoples a few months ago in my home state of Western Australia, where members of the Noongar community in Perth were issued with move-on notices and fines despite being homeless and having nowhere to go. In fact, their gear, their camping gear, their eskies, their sleeping bags were actually taken and put in a, in a rubbish truck. The issuing of fines has long-term consequences for First Nations peoples, including further enforcement measures, imprisonment and the entrenchment of poverty. In the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, Change the Records report further exposes the discrimination discrimination and racism embedded within our justice system, especially during this crisis. I urge everyone, um, including politicians and policymakers, to take note of the information in Change the Records report and make sure you put the recommendations into action. Now is the time to rebuild our justice system, to focus on investing in community, not prisons, to increase community safety and prevent black deaths in custody. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Many Australians would have been shocked in recent weeks to hear about our top science body asserting that anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman, or to see in the media the abuse J.K. Rowling has received online for stating simple facts about the female sex. I was less shocked than others to read about these developments. Just a few weeks earlier, I'd received an answer to a question I'd asked Sport Australia at Senate Estimates earlier this year. I asked them for the purposes of supporting, promoting, encouraging and making policy with regard to women's sport, how does Sport Australia define the term woman? Sport Australia's written response received three months later was, Sport Australia has not defined the term woman. The reason I asked Sport Australia this question was because they would developed a set of guidelines for the inclusion of transgender and gender-diverse people in sport, along with the Australian Human Rights Commission. 
Parents, competitors, sporting administrators, women's groups and constituents from across Australia were taken aback at the tone and implication of these guidelines and the suggestion that participation in sport should be based on a person's affirmed gender identity and not the sex they were assigned at birth. Given that men's and women's sport specifically exists to cater for the biological differences between the two sexes, this pronouncement by Australia's peak sports body is troubling. During Senate estimates, both Sport Australia and the AHRC refused point blank to name the organisations they consulted with as part of developing these guidelines. When I queried them about the practical implications of the suggestions in the guidelines, both organisations were evasive. When I asked the acting CEO of Sport Australia if he thought young girls might be deterred from playing sport if they are competing against males, he replied, I don't have an opinion on that. It's quite extraordinary that an agency would release a 50-page document suggesting that you don't have to be a woman to play women's sport and not have turned to your mind to what that means for women. When I asked the Sex Discrimination Commissioner about people of the opposite sex using women and girls' change rooms, she told me that she didn't accept the premise of my question and that the Act contains location-specific exemptions supporting single-sex toilets and change rooms. Two months later, in response to a written question on notice, Ms Jenkins corrected the record to say that there is no such exemption to provide for female or male-only change rooms and toilets in the Sex Discrimination Act. For obvious reasons of privacy and safety, many Australians do not want them or their children to have to share change rooms or toilets with the opposite sex. We have seen in the last week J.K. Rowling very eloquently explain the very real and very genuine concerns when it comes to single-sex spaces, speaking from her own experience as a woman and a victim of abuse. The vile abuse and threats which Ms Rowling has received for speaking out on these issues is disgraceful and highlights why many women are afraid to speak out on this issue, despite the vast majority agreeing with Ms Rowling's point of view. Women's sport, single-sex change rooms and toilets, women's health services, women's refuges and shelters are all clear examples of services which are designed to cater for a specific sex with very good reason. But look at how the institutions, which we should be able to trust to understand the importance of differences between the sexes, are acting. Sport Australia has no opinion on what a woman is. The Australian Academy of Science says that if you say you're a woman, then you are. The Australian Human Rights Commission confirms that sporting clubs ha can have legal action taken against them for keeping a male out of female change rooms. The Australian people never voted for these scenarios and, in most cases, don't, don't even know it was possible under our anti-discrimination legislation. Most Australians would be shocked to know that women may have to share change rooms with a person with male genitalia. They'd be very uncomfortable with an Australian female athlete missing out on an Olympic medal because they were defeated by a transgender athlete who was born male. They'd be appalled if a male sex offender was housed in a women's prison due to their gender identity. Far from being inclusive, replacing sex with gender risks denying Australian women the right to single-sex services, which play a vital and necessary role in our society. I stand with J.K. Rowling and millions of women around the world who are determined to ensure our rights as women are not traded off in the name of diversity. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week I met over Zoom with uh, Wendy, Tracy, Rolanda and Sue. They're aged care workers and the Zoom meeting was right across the country. They're also proud um, members uh, like I am of United Workers Union. They are angry because they've worked really, really hard in very dangerous situations over the last couple of months during this pandemic to keep Australia's most vulnerable uh, citizens safe and well, those people who uh, reside in aged care and in home care. And not only that, we've heard the Prime Minister of this country and indeed the Health Minister tell us how important aged care workers are. So imagine their disappointment when they feel like they've been duped and they were angry. They were angry and it takes a lot for aged care workers to get angry because they were expecting, in the case of some of these women, an $800 bonus 
and the ones who work in uh, home care were expecting a $600 bonus. And of course, they thought they were all going to get that bonus. But no, what we find out now, uh, despite the minister's media releases, is that the eight and six hundred dollar retention bonuses will one be taxed, which was uh, a complete breaking of the promise that had been given to those workers, and two, it'll only apply to some workers in aged care, to caring staff. Now I don't know. Um, how many times the Prime Minister or indeed the Health Minister and indeed the Aged Care Minister have been into an aged care facility. I've been into many. I started work as an organiser at United Voice uh, in the aged care sector. Let me tell you, who are the bulk of the staff working in an aged care facility? Well, guess what? They're not the care staff. They're the cleaners. They're the kitchen staff. They're the laundry workers, they're the outside staff, they're the bus drivers. All of them have patient contact, beg your pardon, contact with residents. All of them do. All of them have put themselves at risk over the last couple of months during this pandemic, and all of them will be denied the retention bonus, which will only be paid to caring staff. And of course, caring staff are vitally important. But I would have thought all staff in aged care were vitally important. So Wendy, Tracy, Rolanda and Sue told me how angry they were. They're angry and they're disappointed, and they feel like they've been let down by their government. And indeed they have. And indeed they have. So they're asking, uh, they asked me tonight to speak on this in the Senate and to ask the Morrison government to reconsider or to go back to the commitment that they made to these aged care workers, that the retention bonus would be paid to all aged care workers and that it, would be, uh, that it wouldn't be taxed up front. Now, to add insult to injury, last week I heard from workers in Western Australia, but I am assured this is happening right across the country, is of course we want aged care workers, if they have a sniffle, to get tested. Well, guess what? They're getting tested in their own time. The employer is not paying them to go off and get tested. Many of those workers, and they're predominantly women workers, they're predominantly um, low paid, and they are predominantly part time, are now having to go and have a test, lose a shift to go and have a COVID test. Now, if that is not adding insult to injury, I don't know what is. And I would applaud, I would urge the aged care minister to do something about that, because many of those facilities, sadly, are run for profit, and obviously many providers are putting profits before caring for their staff. So, Mr Morrison, I would, would urge you and Senator Colbeck to reconsider that decision to pay that retention worker to every single worker in the aged care facility that you praised. You didn't actually say just care, worker, care workers. You and Minister Hunt um, said all workers. They thanked them. They thanked all workers for the contribution they'd made. Well, let's make sure that that retention work, that retention bonus, goes to all workers. Workers like Wendy, Tracy, Rolanda and Sue. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Haruki. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. There has been a lot of public discussion in the last few weeks about racism in our society. This has largely resulted from the massive anti-racist Black Lives Matter protests that have been held across the world. As I said in the Senate last week, these are long overdue conversations taking place about the way that racism operates in our society, not just in its interpersonal, everyday, so-called casual forms, but also through systems, structures and institutions. An ongoing frustration for many anti-racist advocates is the often poor and inadequate way that the news media reports on issues of race and racism. This can range from a lack of understanding about how racism works to actually perpetuating racism. Both unacceptable. In 2018-19, the Australian Human Rights Commission received 27 formal racial hatred complaints in relation to views expressed in the media. More than one complaint per fortnight. Complaints are also frequently made 
to the Australian Press Council. And this is just the tip of a truly ugly iceberg. We know many instances will not be formally reported, nor can one report the kind of biases that see stories on race spiked or underreported before they even reach the pages and our screens. Independent research released last year by anti-racism organization Altogether Now found that more than half of race-related commentary in Australia negatively targets racial and cultural minorities. I quote, Muslim Australians are the most frequently targeted, with 63 of the 281 media pieces sampled discussing Muslims specifically. More than 80% of these pieces discuss Muslims and Islam in a negative way. Sadly, this is not a new phenomenon, and it's not likely to abate soon. The reality is that there simply aren't any substantive consequences for being racist in the Australian media. You can have a successful media career after being found to have breached the Racial Discrimination Act. Part of resolving this will inevitably involve ensuring that the media more adequately reflects the racial diversity in our community. If journalists come from communities impacted by racism, it follows that their reporting is more likely to be sensitive to issues of race. The Australian media is overwhelmingly white. Newsrooms should be actively hiring, mentoring, and platforming journalists of color, including the indigenous journalists who are already doing exceptional work in a frequently hostile industry. It's the responsibility of outlets to try and rebalance this and ensure the media is representative of the huge diversity in our community. If our media is also to represent a diversity of views, there should be a large range of outlets, not an oligarchy. There must be space for smaller online, often youth-focused publishers. Tragically, in the past few weeks and months, we have seen the closure of outlets, including, including BuzzFeed News and 10 Daily. It is smaller youth media outlets that have followed issues that bigger publishers simply won't touch. And a case in point is the coverage of abortion law and access in Australia by Gina Rushton of BuzzFeed News. This incredibly important issue simply would not have, be, have received the detailed ongoing attention it has in the last few years without Gina's reporting. Likewise, the landscape of reporting on refugees and the impacts of politics on young people is impoverished for the absence of the likes of BuzzFeed, Ten Daily, and their reporters. And while reflecting on the contributions of young journalists, I want to pay tribute to Sam Langford, who tragically passed away last month, aged 23. Sam in my, interned in my New South Wales Parliament office and was simply a joy to be around. An amazing writer and thinker at such a young age, Sam was a force of nature in their student journalism and work at Junkie and SBS. Their writing spoke truth to power and raised the voices of those usually left out of the conversation. Their endless curiosity and the joy they took in sharing their wonder at the world made the days of countless readers. Sam was so near and dear to my heart. They were incredibly talented, most thoughtful and truly kind, always there with unconditional love for their family and friends. My thoughts are with Sam's family and friends through this time. We will miss you so much, Sam. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to speak regarding the battle this country faces against a rising tide of political correctness, aggressive left-wing ideology and why everyday Australians should be alarmed. Mm. Australians are overwhelmingly respectful and tolerant people. But disappointingly, in the last few weeks, we've seen a small but vocal minority behaving badly and, in some cases, behaving unlawfully. Across the United States, protests which were initially related to the tragic death of George Floyd have descended into chaos. Left-wing agitators in this country didn't waste much time using this as an opportunity to mobilise. And while most Australians did the right thing during COVID-19 and refrained from attending gatherings such as Anzac Day, Mother's Day and, in some instances, sadly, even the funeral of loved ones, these protesters did as they pleased and marched in large numbers across the country, potentially even putting lives at risk. 
Left-wing protesters then vandalised uh, historic statues and even forced monuments, including the statue of James Cook in Sydney, to be placed under police guard. This wave of spite continued, sending TV publishers into a meltdown as they searched through their back catalogues to sacrifice a few comedic lambs. Netflix decided to dump the iconic Chris Lilly TV series, prompting the ABC to conduct what they described as a harm and offence audit to ensure they were meeting current community standards, which is ostensibly code for rewriting history. Not even today Aussie beer is safe anymore, Mr Acting Deputy President, with news that Australian-owned craft brewer Colonial Beer Co is no longer being stocked by a Melbourne liquor store due to the reference to the word colonial. Alarmingly, the owners are reportedly considering changing the name rather than incurring the wrath of the PC Brigade. Frankly, this censorious behaviour has been indulged for too long. And I understand sometimes it's hard to call these things out. Most Australians have better things to do and better things to think about. Jobs, families, other commitments, they all make it difficult <laughs> for people to find time to argue the point. And many Australians find it challenging to speak out for fear of being screamed at by an angry mob. But sadly, tacit endorsement for this woke culture is all around us. Many corporations have been seduced by these self-appointed moral guardians and continue to join campaigns on social issues and submit to the mob. Many of these trends are, of course, simply laughable, but many are far more sinister. Cancel culture is a new phrase for an old and familiar tactic of the far left. It was a tactic used by Stalin, who would literally make his enemies disappear and then delete them from photographs. The far left want to remove any views they disagree with on the grounds that they see as offensive. They are incapable of existing in a world in which there are views which they don't agree with. This trend threatens the very soul of this country. And there are many Australians who understand what this is doing to the fabric of society, but we need all of them to call it out. And we need Aussies to, to prove that these intolerant themes are a minority position in this country. We must all stand up to the imperious ambitions of the PC Brigade because every capitulation to the mob emboldens it. The struggle by the far left to undermine and ultimately overturn the traditional and respected institutions that have served our society so well um, is underway, Mr Acting Deputy President. And it may seem trivial, but rest assured the Australian way of life as we know it is under threat. If we don't battle this insidious trend, free thought, reason, and perhaps even our democracy is at risk. To paraphrase General S. Patton, no one ever won a war by refusing to fight the battle. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy <coughs> President. I'd like to just uh, raise in the Senate the importance of the work of the Northern Territory Government in terms of the restrictions across the Northern Territory in relation to COVID-19 and commend the Chief Minister and the Cabinet uh, in their handling of what has been an incredibly difficult time. Uh, just recently we have seen uh, the people of the Northern Territory who live beyond uh, the capital city of Darwin and the Palmerston region uh, have had their restrictions moved so that internal travel around the Northern Territory has been quite significant. And I thank the people in all those areas, in all those communities across the Northern Territory uh, for their diligence in making sure that uh, these concerns around COVID-19 were followed, were adhered to, and many uh, traditional owners, uh, family clan groups, uh, community members went home, went on country and just waited until it was the appropriate time uh, to be able to travel again uh, throughout the NT. And it was difficult, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, for people to not be able to get to Catherine or to Alice Springs. But we did see in recent weeks with the removal of those intra-territory restrictions that our communi communities are now able to engage uh, right across the territory. On the weekend, there were around 1,000 people, perhaps more, who then gathered in Darwin, Mr Acting Deputy President, to raise their concerns about the high incarceration rates of First Nations people uh, in Australia, but also to call on governments, not just the Northern Territory government, not just state, other state governments, but also the federal government, 
to realise that this issue, the issue where so many First Nations people are being incarcerated at an enormous rate, when we are only 3 per cent of the population, must be brought to the forefront of the federal government's agenda. I reiterate my call, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the Prime Minister, through the National Cabinet, can make this an absolute priority. We have witnessed, through the work done on that National Cabinet, the ability of our country to engage against the concerns around COVID-19 and to do so in a united way. So we can do the same with issues that are impacting and affecting hundreds and thousands of Australians who have taken to the streets in recent weeks to express their deep passion, their heartfelt views in terms of the deaths in custody of over 400 people, 437, and the fact that there has not been anyone convicted or charged on those occasions. It is a difficult time in our country's history. But as political leaders, that's what we're here for, is to deal with the complex and difficult times as much as the good times. So we're not here to demonise the views of others, and we should not do that. We must always rise higher than that, especially here in the Senate, especially over there in the other house. We must do everything we can to make sure that we are not inflaming the division or even hatred at a time when people desperately need strong leadership. It's not about always agreeing, but it is about always trying to work together to find a common goal, a common road. So I say to the people of the Northern Territory, those who marched the streets of Darwin City on Larrakia country on the weekend, to the organisers, to the young Larrakia women who led the way, thank you. Thank you for your passion, your vision. Thank you for working with the Northern Territory Police to ensure that this was a safely held march and rally. And thank you to the Northern Territory Police for your support. Thank you to the Chief Medical Officer and to the Northern Territory Government for rising above what they could see was causing division across the country, that when you do work together, when you commit to working together, you can actually have some really positive outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. For those playing along at home, Senator Bush Wilson has missed his slot, so Senator Bragg. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, Australia is the most successful multicultural nation on earth. Uh, that we have been able to settle millions of people after the Second World War in a harmonious fashion uh, is perhaps the strongest uh, record we have as a democracy and as a country. Nice. My own family has been a beneficiary of our very harmonious and cohesive society. Now, over the last few months during the coronavirus pandemic, there have been some troubling but isolated incidents against Chinese Australians and against uh, Asian Australians, uh, some of which have occurred in my home state of New South Wales in Sydney. Now, the Chinese Australian Forum, uh, which is a group I've had quite a bit to do with in my time as a senator, uh, have started a petition uh, where they have collected 80,000 signatures of people in support of cohesion and unity over division, which has uh, been an important theme here in the Senate. Now, the Chinese Australian Forum have said, we are living through some challenging and frankly scary times, but fear of the coronavirus is not justification for vilifying our fellow citizens. This petition sends a strong message to those who have been victims of racial abuse that our community stands with them. Now, in New South Wales, between January and April this year, there have been 240 uh, complaints including 62 based on, on race. So again, these are fringe incidents, very troubling fringe incidents, but one incident is one incident too many. And we, uh, we on this side uh, join with our colleagues uh, across this parliament 
in saying uh, no to racism. There is no place for racism in Australia. Now, the Chinese Australians have been thanked particularly by our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who has consistently said throughout this pandemic uh, that the Chinese Australians have done more than any other group uh, to protect us against the pandemic. And the PM said they were the ones who first went into self-isolation. They were the ones who were returning from family visits up in China. And it was through their care, it was through their commitment, their patience, that actually Australia was protected in the first wave. Now, Minister Tudge, the relevant minister, has also gone on to say that we've got to be very, very clear here in separating people's view about the Chinese government, about the Communist Party of China and Australians or permanent residents here in Australia who may be ethnically Chinese. And the minister's point is that the coronavirus has nothing to do with our citizens. The coronavirus has nothing to do with Chinese Australians or Asian uh, Australians. Uh, and so that's why we have uh, already, through the Human Rights Commission, uh, launched a, a campaign. And there is, uh, that is a very important initiative because we need people to know that racism uh, is intolerable in this country. Now, I'm pleased to report to the Senate tonight that this has been a bipartisan initiative and uh, Mr Andrew Giles in the House of Representatives made some similar comments last week. So uh, I very much um, thank him for his cooperation and partnership uh, in, working, in working on these difficult issues because at the end of the day, we have been a shining light to most countries around the world. Uh, we have settled millions and millions of people since the Second World War in a harmonious way. Uh, yes, there have been some instances of racism during the pandemic, but in the main, uh, people have pulled together to get through this pandemic, and diversity has been a strength. Uh, our diverse uh, Asian Australian communities have helped us more than any other group get through this pandemic. So the least we can do, the least we can do is to repay their efforts to help our whole country by not uh, engaging in any form of racism which has absolutely no place in our country, uh, which we're all so proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Watt's not here. So, Senator Macdonald, I'll call you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I um, am excited to speak tonight because of the future opportunities for regional Australia that have become apparent during the COVID uh, crisis. Rolling out the Morrison government's COVID-19 tracking app <laughs> meant that Telstra had to hit the fast-forward button on allowing text messages to be delivered via Wi-Fi, even if there is no phone reception. This is a major breakthrough for regional and remote communities and means people can do business and stay in touch with loved ones, even when they're far away from the beaten track because people in regional Australia don't require an advantage. They only require a level playing field. And this is just one small example, one small step towards levelling that playing field. Communications, connectivity opens the door to further enhancements for business, telehealth, education and for agriculture. The other major consequence of coronavirus has been the realisation that many businesses operated effectively with their staff working remotely. Meetings were conducted online, instructions were emailed or phoned in, people had to learn how to use web-based drive applications to share large files. And working remotely opens up huge potential for people to move or stay in the regions while working for big city companies. The work of Joe Palmer, the 2019 winner of the National Rural Women's Award, is a case in point where she sees location is no uh, restriction for where, for where you need to be based to, an, to have well-paid uh, people working right around the country, be it remotely on a cattle station or even in some of our bigger regional centres like Townsville. Regional Australia is where we build the nation's wealth. It's where you build your own prosperity and a family. And when we level the playing field for education and medicine, we allow families to stay, to stay and build a life. It's good for families, it's good for the regions, but most importantly, it adds to the depth, the capability and the capacity of Australia as a nation. 
the work of the CRC for Northern Australia uh, in producing a roadmap for extraordinary uh, opportunities has been terrific. Ambitious yet achievable targets can be achieved by collaborating more. Now, given that we know that Western Queensland is not supplied STEM teachers, it will be interesting to see if Education Queensland can be flexible enough to take up the idea of having, for example, a physics class where the students of smaller schools can be dotted all over the state but still have access to the same opportunities that we expect city, uh, kids in um, urban cities to have. Now, I want to implore uh, Councillor Andrew Martin, Mayor of Tambo Blackhall in Western Queensland, for the work he has done to access the capability of internet technology for remote areas. For an investment of about a million dollars, people in that remote area are achieving uh, normal download speeds. This is a massive game changer for remote communities and that it is not a significant amount of money in what we spend around the rest of the country. Uh, Cloncurry Shire Council is looking to do a similar project. Another factor that discourages people wanting to move to the regions is access to specialist health care. But another silver lining of the, of the virus crisis is that telehealth via phones and the internet was thrust to the fore and is now poised to be very much mainstream. Not only are GPs and specialists able to consult remotely via video calls, the Royal Flying Doctor Service has professionals providing telehealth con consultations to rural patients and healthcare workers 24 hours a day by phone, by radio and video conferencing. Um, I have seen incredible technology for remote Bluetooth uh, sensing um, that would allow uh, the Bullia uh, Medical Centre to keep those on hand and to be able to assess if somebody is actually having uh, a heart attack and needs to be airlifted out of town or if they just need to go home and have a good lie down. Key to this seismic shift in regional livability is fast, is reliable and cheap telecommunications. And these are all things that I am very proud to say that this Morrison government is committed to facilitating. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Senator Green, please. Thank you. Uh, I am becoming increasingly concerned that this government is not listening to young people because we know that young people are bearing the brunt of Australia's first recession in 29 years. And the truth is that young workers were already being left behind by this government before the pandemic hit. Their economic security and safety is only going to get worse as this crisis drags on, but the government is leaving them out of the conversation and letting them down. We know that in the aftermath of the GFC, youth unemployment went steadily upwards, reaching 13.2 per cent, and after the GFC, it took longer for youth unemployment to come down, and it has never recovered to pre-2009 levels. And after this crisis, it will be much worse, worse than the GFC for young people, because older workers are unlikely to retire as quickly because they will need to rebuild their super. Young people make up the industries most affected by shutdowns, and a large number of people were working as casuals for less than 12 months, so they missed out on JobKeeper. We know that youth unemployment has jumped to 13.8 per cent, and in some places in regional Queensland it is reaching upwards of 16 per cent. It's not a surprise, given we have a Minister for Youth who has never been able to come in here and give a satisfactory answer about these unemployment rates or what the government is planning to do about them. Yesterday, when I read these figures out in the Senate, Minister Colbeck muttered something under his breath about statistics. I guess he didn't want to hear these statistics. But what the Liberal National Government has forgotten is that this recession is not just about numbers. It is about people. And these numbers represent every single young person who is worried about their future. This government has forgotten about the almost 500,000 young Australians who have had to raid their retirement savings instead of getting support from this government. They have forgotten about the 100,000 apprentices and trainees who will lose their jobs as a result of the ongoing skills crisis. 
and they have forgotten about the 1.1 million short-term casuals who have missed out on JobKeeper. And they have forgotten about young workers employed in the arts and entertainment industry because we are still waiting for that support. Particularly in regional Australia, we know that the arts is a crucial part of the community and the economy, and those workers have had nowhere to go. Labor haven't forgotten about this government's dodgy path program, a complete and utter dud. Internships paying for car washes for $4 an hour. And we haven't forgotten about when the government decided to pay Scott Cam $345,000 for 15 months' work as a national careers ambassador. And we won't forget about the childcare workers booted off JobKeeper because you know the thing about childcare workers? 90 per cent of them are women and 40 per cent are under 29. Those are the first people that this government kicked off JobKeeper, young women who are childcare workers who did essential work during this pandemic. That is despite the Treasurer's $60 billion budget blunder, which would have meant more people could have accessed JobKeeper. When we asked why some Australians were missing out on JobKeeper, the government said that they had to draw a line somewhere. And that is true, but they decided to draw a line that left young Australians down here languishing on their own. These numbers aren't something that the government should scoff at or put in the too hard basket. They represent young people, every single one of these statistics, and those young people deserve a lot better. I said in my first speech that young Australians shouldn't be afraid to speak up and speak out. And there has never been a more important time to do that. There are young workers' hub in every state across the country that young people can join and organise and mobilise and share their stories. Don't be afraid to speak up. Do not let this government get away with shutting you out of the recovery process, because they'll tell you that it'll trickle down, but we know that it won't. Young Australians were already hurting Thank before you, COVID, and it's Senator. time that they had their voice heard. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This evening I would like to recognise and thank Tasmania's 12 2020 Queen's Birthday honorees. Each of them has made a significant contribution at a local, state or national level, and these efforts have been recognised by their peers through an award nomination. Upon announcing the Queen's birthday recipients, Australia's Governor-General, the Hon. David Hurley AC, said the list contained all the positives that are in our community, spanning great ideas, hard work and love and compassion for fellow human beings. Tasmania's honorees comprised of two appointments as members of the Order of Australia, Hugh Hiscott from Howth for his significant service to the people and parliament of Tasmania and to the community of West Devon and Dr Rosemary Callingham from Launceston for her significant service to mathematics education and teacher development and to the community. Inspector Glenn Ball received the Australian Police Medal, and Tasmania had nine Medal of the Order of Australia recipients. These OAMs went to Rodney Bramwich for service to the Port Sorrell community, particularly through his involvement in the local Lions Club. Christopher Jones of Sandy Bay for service to the community of Hobart, Michael King of Gilston Bay for service to the project management sector with involvement at a state, national and international level. The late Ian Gordon Payton for his service to the community of Wynyard. Edna Pennycott of Kingston for her service to the community of Kingborough in many volunteer positions and who was acknowledged by Senator Billick in this place last week. Lola Phillips of Lindisfarne for her service to women and the community of Sorrell. And Rex Wilson for his service to education and the Tasmanian community. During his career, Mr Wilson taught mathematics at schools all around the state. Mr Acting Deputy President, the remaining two Tasmanian OAM recipients I would like to speak about in more detail. They are two very special people that I have known for quite a few years. Firstly, Donald or Don Ives, who received an OAM for his service to music and to the community. A music teacher for more than 25 years and a member of the Suncoast Jazz Club on the east coast of Tasmania for many years. 
Don's love for music is infectious, and I am sure his students treasure their memories of learning piano with him. More recently, Don and his wife Suzanne moved to Longford. Since that time, Don has been a driving force behind Longford standing as a jazz town. He is a co-founder of the Longford Jazz Club, which was launched in 2011, as well as being a member of the organising committee for the Longford Jazz Festival, which has been running since 2014. He's also performed in the Magic of Mozart concert at the Holy Trinity Church for many years. Don loves entertaining and he loves people. He was quoted in the Examiner newspaper last week saying the ability to share music was important to him because music is to make people happy and that makes him happy. Don's OAM was awarded for more than his cultural contribution. He is a Justice of the Peace and has been a member of the Tasmanian Society of Justices of the Peace since 1974 and a member of the Northern JP Association since 2000. Don has always been an active supporter of local community and charitable causes and is always willing to give of his time. From a community's cultural pursuits to the health of its members, our final OAM recipient is Colleen McGann, who was recognised for service to community health in Tasmania. Colleen witnessed many changes within private health care during her 52-year career. Starting at Tasmania's own private health care provider, St Luke's Health, in 1962, Colleen worked her way up through the organisation, starting as a junior clerk and later serving as company secretary, public officer, general manager and managing director. In a speech to the House of Representatives in 2013, acknowledging Colleen's retirement from St Luke's Health, former member for Bass, Andrew Nikolic, described her as a transformational leader who has made a major difference in the lives of many of her staff. Only those who worked with her fully appreciate the truth of that statement. Colleen's industry knowledge and nous was recognised more widely when she was named Telstra Tasmanian Businesswoman of the Year in 2000. Colleen was the first woman elected Vice President of the Australian Health Insurance Association, which is now known as Private Healthcare Australia. Her community service extended to a number of board appointments, including Chair of the Health Benefits Council of Tasmania and Australian Regional Health Group, Director of My State Foundation and serving as a member of the Prime Minister's Community Business Partnership. In addition, in her spare time, Colleen has been a vital member of the Rotary Club of Launceston since 1995, regularly serving as a director as well as being club president twice, including this current year during that time and she'll often be seen manning the club's barbecues at local events around Launceston. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator Abetz. If an individual were to engage in self-loathing, relentlessly finding a fault with self and ridiculing and denigrating all their past endeavours, we would rightly conclude the individual had issues. Counselling might be in order. So too with a society. If a society is willing to engage and embrace those who relentlessly spread negativity and wallow in fault-finding, it will have an extremely bleak future. A mature reflection of self or of society recognises the good with the not-so-good. We should learn from past mistakes, not to tear down and destroy, but to build an even better future. This is our, how our society has progressed and why we are where we are today as a nation, the envy of the world. Let's be clear. One of the great freedoms we have in Australia is the liberty to leave if we don't like it. I don't see any of the professionally and perpetually outraged leaving Australia for North Korea, Cuba or China. For all its alleged and real faults, Australia is the favoured destination of the peoples of the world seeking freedom and opportunity. As Professor Allen so eloquently wrote, you know you're living in George Orwell's world when speech is considered violence and violence is considered speech. And that is exactly what we are witnessing today, ugly double standards courtesy of the anarchist left. When conservatives speak, they are accused of violence if they take a view contrary to the woke left. But if the same language is used by the left, it is an indication of empathy and wokeness, always excused. Bettina Arndt's award earlier this year was vehemently attacked by Labor's Senate leadership team. That same team of two women 
remain as silent as a rock over the more recent award to that purveyor of ugly, sexist, violence to women and anti-Semitic tweets, Mike Carlton. Reason? He's from the tribe. He's from the left. Similarly, the treatment of Cardinal George Pell and Paul Bongiorno, both in a seminary with that horrific paedophile, Ridsdale. Pell should have been fully alert and known all that went on. Bongiorno, on the other hand, fully excused. Of course he couldn't have known. The difference of treatment? Pell is of a conservative disposition, Bongiorno from the left. We see the woke left attacking statues of former coalition leaders and Captain Cook, possibly the world's greatest ever navigator, for allegedly being racist. But a Labor leader who supported the white Australia policy and famously or infamously said, two wongs don't make a white, sits in the pantheon of Labor leaders, as does another Labor leader who referred to ref Vietnamese refugees as expletive deleted. Vietnamese bolts. No, their names are not to be vilified or desecrated. Instead, they are hallowed. Why? Because they are from the left, whereas the coalition leader, who voluntarily dedicated a week per year assisting Indigenous communities without media fanfare, needs to be vilified for his alleged racism. Go figure. Refusal to acknowledge any good in others and any possi uh, possible failings in the tribe has become the mantra and justification to remove people from employment, films and books from the public, for sports people to kneel for a cause and close businesses. So much for the celebration of diversity. Everything is judged in terms of claimable victimhood, division and partisanship. The tribe excuses each other and accuses everyone else. The recipe for disharmony, anarchy and societal collapse. Facts, evidence, objective truths adjunct in favour of bullying, sloganeering and emoting. The time has come to stand firm, push back and advocate the cause of our wonderful heritage bequeathed to, our for, bequeathed to us by our forebears an heritage of civility, a system of democratic government, the rule of law, personal freedoms and a standard of living, all of which makes Australians the envy of the world. I, for one, will continue to be thankful and defend and promote that heritage because, for all its faults, I know no better country, I know no better people. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Uh, Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Acting De Deputy President. I wish to pay tribute to all the paramedics in Australia and especially those in my home state of South Australia. In the many ways, they are the a forgotten frontline service, too often bundled into the title health workers when congratulations are publicly in order, rarely singled out for the credit and appreciation they deserve. It is important to recognise they are not just health workers. They are equally an emergency service, and being so, each and every paramedic must deal with the inevitable danger and risk that comes in delivering such a service. They are not armed or trained to defend themselves. Instead, they have the skills to ease pain and save life. They, more often than not, work in pairs, giving care to the sick on the very same streets and in the same houses that the police so often have to patrol or visit. This makes them one of the most noble of our professions. During the pandemic, they just kept going on with serving their communities, while the rest of us adjusted our lives to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe during the pandemic. They walked willingly out the doors of their own homes to serve their communities, leaving their loved ones behind. At the end of their shift, they returned home, often returning in the early morning when their partners are just starting the day weary in body and soul, desperately attempting to put the trauma they had experienced behind them. Trauma that seems so far from their own personal lives, yet remains within them and subtly challenges and disrupts their efforts to live as others do. The life they lead in our service is what makes them truly exceptional. They are the angels that walk amongst us. 
Earlier this month, on the 2nd of June, we took time to acknowledge emergency services on the Thank a First Responder Day. We are also currently in the Post Traumatic Stress Disorder PTSD Awareness Month. Both these events drive me at this time to bring the life of a paramedic and the impact of this life on their health to the attention of honourable senators. Paramedics are at great risk by the very nature of their duty from suffering from PTSD. Some research suggests that they are at the highest risk amongst the ranks of emergency services. Research makes it clear that a paramedic's mental health is adversely affected not only by the trauma they experience on a weekly basis, but also by the inherent pressures of their job, such as making life and death decisions, the relentlessness of shift work, training obligations and fatigue. Despite their professional and assured patina, which we all experience when seeking their care, underneath the calm, many are in great pain. Honourable Senators may not have had the opportunity to have read the report published by Beyond Blue titled Answering the Call National Survey. Beyond Blue conducted a national mental health and wellbeing study of emergency services. It makes sobering reading and compels action. Before I came to this place, I spent a modest sojourn at the foot of the Hindu Kush. I know firsthand that many of those who have served in our military far from home now suffer stress associated with their service. There is an abundance of services offered by all levels of government, as well as community support, to ensure veterans receive the care that they need. This is the right path, and I will never waver from advocating for this commitment to our veterans. But I also seek the same commitment for our paramedics. Whilst they do not travel far from home, exposure to traumatic events is an integral part of their working lives. Day in and day out, they are confronted with tragedy and pain, and then they go home, expected to live ordinary lives with their loved ones, which is often very difficult. I acknowledge the state and territory funded support programs that exist within many ambulance services. However, I believe that more can be done and achieved. I call on state and territory leaders in the spirit of compassion to reflect on those men and women that serve in this unique and special role and to ask themselves whether we are doing enough to ease the burden of their service. I suspect the answer will be we fall short. The patron saint of paramedics is Saint Michael, an archangel. We should not just leave it to him to watch over our paramedics. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Uh, Senator Dodson, and then we come to you, Senator Veravanti Wells. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, President. I uh, want to pay tribute to Chai Silvery. On Tuesday, the 19th of May, I was informed that my office manager, Chai Silvery, Silvery had tragically passed away. She had only just given birth to her first child. She was a loved member of my team fiercely protective of us all, and someone who always sought to bring people together. Though not from political circles, she was a person of conviction. She believed in social justice, despised discrimination, and treated people respectfully, regardless of rank or privilege. But like many, she would not have used those words to describe her values. She was unfa unfailingly caring she always asked about our families, often bringing us delicious Indian food for the office, organising staff lunches before we all flew off to Canberra, and making sure we were rested and healthy when times were very busy. In the early stages of this pandemic, well before restrictions had commenced, Chai went to great lengths to protect me and my staff from harm. She never took no for an answer. Even when we protested, she was definitely the boss of the office. Born and raised in India, Chai and her husband moved to Broome and became an integral part of that place. She represented the best of the rich multicultural traditions of Broome. She loved Broome and contributed to her community. She was proud of her rich cultural heritage, her language, her movies and her food. And she supported fellow new arrivals to Broome 
assisting them to navigate the many barriers in front of them as they called a new place home. Many observing the work of this parliament understandably do not see the hard work our staff, uh, our staff undertake. And Chai was an integral member of my team, ensuring that things were organised behind the scenes. My office is a small team, and most of us are based in Broome, far away from Canberra. Chai's passing is not only a huge loss to my team, but for the Broome community as well. She left her mark in a small town, far away from the place of her birth. Chai is survived by her husband, Nembi, and their newborn daughter, Krishna. I am personally grateful for her support, and on behalf of my team, I pass on my condolences to her family and recognise her great contribution to this place and to our lives. And I wish to also thank and express our gratitude to all the Labor colleagues who have expressed their support and concern for us and for her family as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well said, Senator Friendy Wells. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about compensation post Wuhan and inter alia the port of Darwin. Australians will no longer accept business as usual with the communist regime in China. Failure by the CCP to properly follow World Health Organisation procedures has killed hundreds of thousands and caused huge economic damage. Domestic and collective international action is needed. Domestically, we need a clear plan to reduce our dependence on overseas supply chains and build domestic self-reliance and resilience. Supporting Australian Maid will come at a price. Governments at all levels will need to re-examine procurement practices to favour Australian Maid. I now turn to the plan for reparations or compensation. This necessitates an examination of the CCP's culpability, which was canvassed in the recent report by top UK think tank, the Henry Jackson Society in London, entitled Coronavirus Compensation. It clearly states that had the CCP provided accurate information at an early juncture, the infection would not have left China. China only reported to the World Health Organization on 31 December 2019, stating no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. This contradicts reports in the South China Morning Post citing Chinese government documents of 200 cases by 27 December. Instead, China covered up and punished the doctors who sought to tell the truth. US intelligence reports refer to massive underreporting of cases, and the CCP has been desperately trying to rewrite the narrative. We are now in recession, with loss of jobs and livelihoods. Billions of dollars have been borrowed. Australian taxpayers will need to shoulder the enormous burden of repaying the debt. No Australian has been left untouched by the negligent actions of the CCP. Therefore, it is just that China pay compensation. Reparations are synonymous with monetary compensation. The Henry Jackson report makes the point that were the UK to pursue a claim against China and secure a judgment that mandated compensation, and were China to ignore it, the authors argue that, unite, that the United Kingdom would be entitled to pursue any lawful means for collection of that judgment. On the collective international front, given closer economic ties between the Five Eyes and indications given by President Trump and Secretary Pompeo that China must pay, the possibility of international action should be considered. Firstly, Look at whether assets owned by China or its state-owned entities in Australia can be seized, liquidated or in any, form, any way form part of a compensation claim. To extend its influence, China has poured billions into Australia to acquire assets, including the port of Darwin. Following the seizure of any assets, they could be refloated or sold. So will China retaliate if seizure of assets is part of a compensation claim? China is a totalitarian regime. Its history of non-recognition of international legal frameworks is well known. China is hardly likely to contest a legal claim. To do so would mean recognition 
of jurisdiction. Secondly, consider, consider whether we halt repayment of Chinese-owned sovereign debt as part of any compensation claim. The Australian Office of Financial Management issues Australian government debt. The total Australian debt owned by China or its entities is not publicly available because the public register only identifies ownership of less than half of all Australian government debt. The extent of the debt we currently owe China and its entities is within the purview of the government. A 2015 analysis by the Royal Bank of Canada suggested that China may own as much as 20 per cent of all Australian government debt. Collating numbers released in the IMF's quarterly update on foreign exchange reserves, RBC said it appeared China held around $130 billion of the $730 billion Australian government and quasi-government bonds in the market. Thirdly, seek to impose tariffs on Chinese imports as part of the claim. This is a blunt tool which the CCP is, already, is ready to use against us, and we should not be afraid to do likewise. Of course, this would further impact on the relationship, but judging by the ongoing threats by the CCP to Australia across many areas, it clearly doesn't give a damn. I now turn to the Port of Darwin. The lease should never have been granted, and we should be looking to break it not only as a practical demonstration of asserting our national sovereignty and security, but potentially as part of any compensation claim. Following its win in August 2012, the CLP started exploring privatisation of assets, including the port. Consultants were engaged, reports prepared throughout 2014, and in January 2015, an exploratory process to gauge interest was launched. 33 investors, including Australian and European companies, as well as Chinese-owned Landbridge, registered an interest. Media reports showed Landbridge was a subsidiary of the Shandong Landbridge Group, a private company founded in 2001, and that in 2013, its billionaire owner, Yi Sheng, was named by the Chinese government as one of the top 10 and I quote, individuals caring about the development of national defence, unquote. It was found to have extensive links to the CCP and the PLA. Indeed, in an interview in Beijing in 2016, Mr Yi said the Darwin Port Investment fits the company's strategy to expand its shipping and energy interests and serve China's foreign policy goal known as One Belt, One Road. In February 2015, the NT Assembly appointed the Port of Darwin Select Committee. Its inquiry indicated the federal government had advised the NT government the port was better privatised than continuing in government hands. Key recommendations in its April 2015 report were that an Australian entity control the lease and that there be FERB and defence consultations regarding the strategic and security risks of a potential international investor. On 14 September, Malcolm Turnbull became Prime Minister. The day after, FERB contacted Landbridge, indicating the lease and purchase of shares in the port operator were exempt under the Foreign Acquisition and Takeovers Act because assets owned by state, territory and local governments were exempt from FERB scrutiny. On 13 October, then Chief Minister Giles announced the 99-year lease was valued at $506 million and included Landbridge taking a controlling stake in the port operator Darwin Port. The lease process raises the legitimate question as to why, given the years of lead time, that more effort was not made by those in key federal ministerial positions and those advising them to remove the foreign investment exemption, given the national security implications of allowing such a critical strategic asset to be handed over to an entity with such known and close ties to the CCP and PLA. Those in key positions included then Defence Secretary Richardson, who at the post-Senate 
post-lease Senate inquiry sought to defend his department's actions in the face of strident criticisms from ASPE and the National Defence Association. And then DFAT Secretary Varghese, now UQ Chancellor, overseeing the debacle of the Pavlu expulsion following his criticisms of CCP activities at the university. I note that then Trade Minister Robb left parliament in January 2016 and some months later took an annual $880,000 job with Landbridge, and he is still promoting BRI in Victoria. Perhaps the answer to the why lies in the fact that the lease decision was made against the background of years of dealings between Canberra and Beijing. On 7 October 2013, uh, PM Abbott attended APEC in Bali. After meeting uh, President Xi Jinping, he expressed confidence that he could get a free trade deal with China within 12 months. Both leaders met again on a number of occasions in 2014. And on the 17th of November, President Xi addressed a joint sitting of our parliament. The next day, uh, Minister Robb announced the $18 billion FTA, and the FTA was subsequently signed June the year after. Regardless of why the lease was signed, national security imperatives, including threats from China, um, China's actions in the South China Sea, and the growing military requirements Order. are such that the lease should now Your be broken. Your time has expired. Senator Rakan. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Over the last several weeks, we've heard a great deal in the media and in this place about an incredibly brave young Tasmanian, Edward Teddy Sheehan. Teddy Sheehan, at age 18, was among 149 passengers and crew ordered to abandon their ship, HMAS Armadale, on 1 December 1942, during operations in the Timor Sea. Sheehan was a loader of Armadale's aft all can gun. The Armadale had come under aerial bombardment and torpedo attack from a number of Japanese bombers and fighters. Armadale was struck by two torpedoes and possibly one bomb. The ship sank in a short period of time. Teddy Sheehan, after assisting crewmates to free a lifeboat, instead of obeying the order to abandon ship, turned back, returned to his weapon and single-handedly engaged the enemy. He would have known by doing so that he would go down with the ship. He was wounded by the attacking Japanese aircraft but proceeded to strap himself to the Orlikan gun and use this weapon to shoot down at least one Japanese aircraft. He remained at his weapon until he was killed. Teddy Sheehan is undoubtedly a hero. His family and community are intensely proud of his achievements. Crewmates who witnessed his valour spoke of it even as they struggled in the water after the vessel sank and in the years that followed. While Sherman was awarded a posthumous mention in dispatches and MID, it has been constantly asserted by his many supporters that the MID does not adequately reflect, reflect his gallantry. Those supporters straddle almost all political divides. Unlike the Air Force commanders, Australian Navy commanders in 1942 could not specify the nature of the award they were submitting. Australian Imperial Force and Royal Australian Air Force awards were decided by Australians in Australia, but our Navy at that time had to submit its recommendations to the Admiralty in London. Those recommendations were then considered by an Honours and Awards Committee. In my view and the view of many, many people, Sheehan's heroism was not adequately acknowledged in London. His deeds were also suppressed from public knowledge by a decision of the Department of Defence on eight days after the Armadale sinking to impose a complete publicity ban upon HMAS Armadale's story. For decades, Sheehan's family and others, including the Honourable Guy Barnett MP, the Tasmanian Minister for Veteran Affairs and one time senator in this place have agitated for an Imperial Victoria Cross or Victoria Cross for Australia to be awarded to Sheehan for his actions during the sinking of Armadale. I'm sure then you can imagine the intense sadness and frustration after the 2013 Valor Inquiry conducted by the Defence Honours Awards and Appeals Tribunal found Sheehan's actions did not meet the criteria for a Victoria Cross Award. 
In July 2018, the Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Michael Noonan, informed Mr Barnett that Shan's recognition had already been considered during the Valor inquiry and that the findings and recommendations of that inquiry had been accepted by government back in March 2013. Admiral Noonan also informed Mr Barnett that, nonetheless, he had also considered the matter and formed the view that there was no new evidence that supported reconsideration or review of Sheehan's actions. In October that year, Mr Barnett applied to the tribunal seeking a review of the Chief of Navy's decision of July 2018. He submitted that Sheehan's actions were deserving of a full merits-based review by the tribunal. That review went ahead, and on 23 July 2019, the tribunal decided to recommend to the Minister for Defence Personnel that the decision by the Chief of Navy to refuse to recommend the award of the Victoria Cross for Australia to ordinary seaman Edward Sheehan in respect of his actions in HMAS Armadale during a Japanese aerial attack in the Timor Sea on 1 December 1942 be set aside. And part B was the minister recommend to the sovereign that ordinary seaman Edward Sheehan be posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross for Australia for the most conspicuous gallantry and preeminent act of valour in the presence of the enemy in HMAS Armadale during a Japanese aerial attack in the Timor Sea on 1 December 1942. In May this year, the chairman of the tribunal, Mark Sullivan, wrote to Defence Minister Senator Reynolds to correct the record when she misled this chamber over the Sheehan situation. Because of this letter, we know that the recommendations were presented to the Minister for Defence Personnel, Darren Chester, in July 2019. Shortly after, the minister, Mr Sullivan, uh, advised Mr Sullivan that he was comfortable with the recommendations and that he would be communicating with senior mi ministers, including the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister then rejected the recommendations of the tribunal and his own minister out of hand and refused to recommend to the Queen that the VC be awarded posthumously to Teddy Sheehan. In doing so, he, la uh, he later said he took advice from Australia's military chiefs past and present in making his decision. It is this very advice the Senate has demanded to see and expects to be tabled in this place by noon tomorrow. To most people who are aware of this case, it was distressing and baffling that the Prime Minister would reject the recommendation of the independent tribunal set up for the express purpose of providing this advice. It seemed incredibly unfair that an open and proper process could be ditched by the Prime Minister in favour of private advice. It provoked criticism, grief and a good deal of uproar. Then, under pressure, the Prime Minister announced yet another review, not one provided for by any kind of prescribed process, one that he just made up. An extra review, an extraordinary review by three independent experts. In the meantime, passionate people who care about due process who care about transparency, who care about acknowledging the sacrifice of the 18-year-old who knowingly turned his back to the lifeboat and strapped himself to a gun to fight back against the air attack that was strafing, maiming and killing his shipmates, have been vocal. Many have made statements in support of Teddy Sheen being posthumously awarded the VC. We do it because we care. We do it because we revere the Victoria Cross and those who have been awarded it, and we believe proper processes should be followed. Yesterday in the other place, these passionate, well-informed pleas and statements were likened by one MP, Mr Gavin Pearce, the member for Braddon, to conducting a chook raffle. A chook raffle it is not. And to use such language is an attempt to demean all of us who fairly and rightly call for Teddy to be awarded the medal that he so deserves. Mr Pearce can try and silence us, but we believe in free speech. We have a right to speak up and we would be irresponsible not to. There is a view, and a view that I hold, that recently, the recently announced additional review by three independent experts is simply an attempt by the Prime Minister to save face over a poor decision and to kick the can down the road. 
and in kicking the can down the road, the Prime Minister has only made its rattling louder. He has made thousands more Australians hear its sound, and so he can expect more people to speak up, as it is their right. Mr Pearce may blunder about what we may and may not speak about in this place, but in the end he has to face facts. The person who politicised this, who made it controversial, was his mate, the Prime Minister. Mr Morrison made this a subject of debate in this place and across the country by rejecting the advice of the independent tribunal that is commissioned to provide frank and fearless evidence based upon advice to him. Since then, many have weighed in on this conversation. One high-ranking military official even said that requesting the Queen to posthumously award the VC to Teddy Sheehan would put her in an awkward position or even damage Australia's standing with her. My goodness, how unfortunate would that be? But I don't believe it. My mother was a staunch royalist. She loved the Queen, and the Queen that my mother loved would be quite prepared to calmly and reasonably consider such a request and see justice at last for Edward Teddy Sheehan. Senator Dina Tully. One of the great privileges of being a member of parliament is, the, is that you get the opportunity to shine a light on important issues that are too often ignored. Tonight I want to do something I've tried to do many times over the last decade in this place, and that is to bring attention to the plight of the West Papuan people. West Papua, which covers the two western peninsulas of the island of New Guinea, was occupied by the Dutch until 1969, when it came under control of Indonesia. Since that time, Indonesia has killed more than 500,000 Indonesian Papuans. Half a million men, women and children simply because they are fighting for freedom, for independence. I first became aware of the West Papuan cause through my involvement in the East Timorese independence movement. The conflict and bloodshed following the 1999 uh, Timorese independence referendum resulted in the evacuation of hundreds of East Timorese refu refugees to Australia. And as a young doctor, I flew to Darwin to help with medical checks and ensuring that those refugees were able to settle temporarily here in Australia. I later travelled to Timor-Leste, where I visited the graves of many East Timorese people killed in their bloody struggle and heard firsthand about the atrocities committed by the Indonesian military. There are some eerie parallels with the conflict occurring in West Papua. Our assistance to Timor-Leste during the referendum was a bright spot in an otherwise dark history. In the 1970s, Gough Whitlam assented to Indonesian President Suharto's plan to occupy what was then referred to as Portuguese Timor. We failed to investigate and hold anyone to account as they murdered Australian journalists, the Balabo Five murdered by Indonesian security forces in Timor in 1975. Indeed, subsequent administrations cooperated and conspired with the Indonesian military and President Suharto to obscure details about conditions in Timor-Leste and to preserve Indonesian control of the region. And of course, after, after Timor-Leste's independence, Australia spent well over the next decade undermining our newest neighbour, behaving reprehensibly in our maritime boundary dispute. Indeed, it's going on right now with the secret trial of Bernard Caleri, who had the temerity to blow the whistle on the illegal spying of one of the world's poorest nations. It seems we've learnt nothing. The West Papuan people today face oppression and violence under Indonesian rule, just as the East Timorese did. For decades now, West Papuan have endured a brutal injustice. Since the effective takeover by Indonesia in 1969, they've suffered a UN process that's been rigged against them and endured countless human rights abuses. 
What has been occurring in West Papua is described by many people as a slow motion genocide. Half a million West Papuans slaughtered at the hands of the Indonesian military and militia. It's a genocide that's facilitated by the support given to the Indonesian government by Australia through our military training and other support. Successive Australian governments have also supported Indonesia's actions in more insidious <coughs> ways. Indonesia refuses free access to West Papua by the media and UN observers, yet Australia has remained silent. And we have been silent in the face of the countless deaths of peaceful protesters. In the second half of last year, we watched the violence dramatically escalate in West Papua. It became international news. West Papuans were killed while protesting, and they were detained and charged with treason for doing nothing other than flying their flag, the Morning Star. This week, seven West Papuan activists and students are on trial for treason for their involvement in those protests in Jayapura. For decades, the Indonesian government has discriminated against West Papua's Melanesian people. There has been a deep-seated racism at the approach of the Indonesian authorities. The protest last year was sparked by Indonesian militants and soldiers who called West Papuan students monkeys. The seven defendants, Bukta Tabuni, Agus Kosei, Stevanus Itlay, Ferry Gombo, Alexander Gobay, Iwanis Urobmapin, and Hengi Hilapok face between five and 17 years in prison. Their trial is a travesty of justice, something that's recognised by many decent Indonesian people who have opposed sending these activists to prison for treason. Just like we did for decades over East Timor, the Australian government has been silent in the face of systematic human rights abuses. There are many Australians who stand in solidarity with the people of West Papua, and I'm certain there would be many, many more if this tragedy received the attention that it deserves. Over the years, I've worked with many of these incredibly passionate, decent people, some of them uh, people from West Papua, West Papuans like uh, Ronnie Kareni, Jacob Rumbiak, Rex Rumikek, and other Australians like Peter Arndt, Louise Byrne, Jennifer Robinson, Jason McLeod and Joe Collins. Musicians like David Bridie, who's dedicated so much of his creative energy to the West Papuan struggle. And of course, Indonesian human rights activists like Veronica Komen, who's been an amazing advocate for justice here in Australia. Some of these people put themselves at great risk simply for speaking out. Over the years, I've worked with this wonderful community on West Papuan self-determination and human rights, and I've witnessed them come under surveillance from the Indonesian authorities, yet they remain resolute in their determination. In parliament here in Australia, some brave MPs have also spoken out. Politicians from across the political divide. People like Jane Prentice from the Liberal Party, Laurie Ferguson and, more recently, Jed Carney from the Labor Party. I'm proud to say that the Greens have always stood in solidarity with the West Papuan community. During uh, the Indonesian President Joko Widodo's most recent visit, our parliamentary leader, Adam Bank, confronted him directly on the issue, despite our Prime Minister refusing even to raise it. I hope that soon my parliamentary colleagues will do what I haven't been able to do, and that is to organise a parliamentary visit to West Papua to see firsthand the situation and report it back to the world. I hope I can support such a visit in some way. I may be leaving the parliament, but I will continue fighting to stop Australia from repeating the mistakes of the past. 
I'll continue to support West Papuan standing against oppression and injustice. West Papuans, like the 1.8 million people who managed to covertly and under, the th under a huge threat, sign a petition calling for self-determination only a few years ago. Their struggle is our struggle. As the West Papuans say, Merdeka. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. I rise in this adjournment debate to provide a progress report on some of the key projects the Morrison Liberal government is delivering for the Karangamite electorate and across the greater Geelong region and through southwest Victoria. I am indeed honoured to be a regional senator for Victoria, but I want to reiterate that the Liberals are continuing to deliver in spades for the mighty Karangamite electorate. And we are, in fact, the only ones proudly delivering for the mighty Karangamite electorate. While Labor in Victoria is embroiled in the most shocking crisis of its own making, behaviour that shows that Labor is rotten to the core in Victoria, our government, led by Prime Minister Morrison and here in the Senate by Senator Cormann, is getting on with the business of putting Australians first at this most extraordinary, difficult time for our nation. While our focus is on delivering the urgent economic and health response to the coronavirus pandemic, we are also continuing to deliver on the many investments on which Australians rely to support their communities, whether it be road and rail infrastructure upgrades, community infrastructure, health facilities, better te telecommunications and, of course, vital investments to support jobs growth. So tonight I want to put, report, uh, present uh, a bit of a report card on some of the key investments in our region and, uh, of course, I have my office now, my Senate office now in Geelong, so I am still very much a part of this particular region. Of course, the wonderful news for so many residents living in southwest Victoria is the Princess Highway duplication uh, is almost complete. And while the state member for South Barwon tried to erroneously open that project on his own accord last year, uh, the fact of the matter is that that project is not quite complete, but it is a wonderful testament to our commitment to better roads for regional Victoria, an investment of some $550 million in partnership with the state, which is delivering so much for regional communities, for regional businesses and, of course, for families. Another wonderful project is the Howitzer Defence Project, the building and sustaining of 30 self-propelled howitzers, which our government has committed to Geelong which will not only provide vital capability for the Australian Army, but will deliver up to 350 jobs. And when Labor cancelled this project in 200, 2012, they neglected a huge opportunity to support Australia's advanced manufacturing industry, while stripping Army of a much needed capability. And I'm incredibly proud of our commitment to this great project. And I have to put on record it is the height of hypocrisy for the member for Carayo to criticise anyone in relation to this project when you consider Labor's dismal record. That is a great project which demonstrates our commitment to local jobs and to advanced manufacturing in the Geelong region. I'm delighted to see some great progress with our commitment to aquatic facilities in, on both the Ballerine and the Surf Coast. And today, the Surf Coast Shire has approved, in principle, a $38.5 million aquatic and health facility, which includes a 50-metre pool, one of the conditions of funding for our $20 million commitment made before the last election. This is a massive win for the Surf Coast community, uh, for community health, for wellbeing, for swimming safety. I have fought for this facility for such a long time. And now, again, I call on the state Labor government to deliver the funding, the funding shortfall of some $9 million that is required to match the Commonwealth's funding so that this dream can be realised. 
I am incredibly hopeful that State Labor will come to the table. And I want to particularly acknowledge the incredible community effort which has gone into advocating for an aquatic facility, including by the Surf Coast Aquatic Leisure Centre Action Group, as they so passionately argued, build it, and we will swim, and we're very much hoping that will happen. Of course, I'm also very proud of the $10 million commitment we made to a ballerine pool, an outdoor pool. Uh, and I'm also very proud of the leadership shown by Mayor Stephanie Asher. Uh, we are, in contrast to Labor, determined to make this happen. Uh, as locals may remember, Labor committed to nothing more than a small amount of feasibility funding. The Morrison Liberal government, in fact, committed to $10 million, and we have a great vision for the people of the Ballerine. And I do very much hope that, again, State Labor will come to the table with funding for stage two of this project. Uh, this is under feasibility uh, consideration right now. It will be, uh, we hope, in Drysdale, uh, but is also a great win for this community and demonstrates the Liberals' commitment to the people of Karangamite. Uh, we've also had some very good progress on the Geelong Rail Duplication Project Stage 1, which is a second platform at Warren Ponds and a pedestrian pass, is contracted and uh, has got underway and the state government has finalised the project proposal for stage two, which is duplication of the track from Warren Ponds through to South Geelong, upgrade of the Marshall and South Geelong railway stations and the grade separation of several roads, including the Surf Coast Highway. But it is disappointing that this project has taken so long to deliver. Uh, the business case in itself took two years. And when I first started campaigning to fund this project, which is all about delivering faster and more reliable rail services, I started that campaign back in 2015. The responsible Victorian Minister Jacinta Allen said it was not a priority. So uh, this government is now delivering some 80 per cent of the total cost of the project, some 850 million combined with works on the Warrnambool line. And we are very proud of our commitment to faster, more reliable rail in the Geelong region. And I do want to place on record the letter from the Prime Minister, which he wrote to the Premier uh, last August, requesting that the Premier nominate infrastructure projects for this fast tracking of funding. It is disappointing that this project was not nominated. And I again urge the state Labor government to get on with this incredibly important project. Uh, we have had some really major challenges with infrastructure. There has been some serious botch planning for the Geelong Ring Road extension, and Labor has failed to deliver any funding to duplicate the Bowen Heads Road, uh, as it promised to do before the last state election. Of course, there is also no matching funding to the $2 billion that we committed to more than a year ago for fast rail between Melbourne and Geelong. That is incredibly disappointing. We need to see a plan. We need to see a commitment and we need to see the Premier deliver on better rail services for regional Victoria. I'm delighted that the Geelong City deal, the funding agreement, the $370 million Geelong City deal, for which I fought so hard, has now been signed by all parties, supported by $183 million from the Morrison Liberal government delivering some wonderful projects, including the upgrade of the Apollo Bay Harbour, uh, great infrastructure facilities for Kennet River, Lawns Point Grey upgrade, uh, in huge investment into the Twelve Apostles, a new convention centre for Geelong, a new ferry terminal for Queenscliff, critical infrastructure projects to drive the visitor economy in particular, and we know how important these investments will be, particularly as we work so hard to reopen our economy and to build the jobs growth that we so desperately need. Uh, there are plenty other investments being rolled out, a new headspace for Ocean Grove, which is about to open within the next few months, upgraded medical facilities for Port Arlington, uh, a large number of new community sporting facilities and new surf life-saving club upgrades. And of course, uh, works have al already started on a $193 million upgrade of the Point Wilson Wharf 
the ammunition wharf, very important for our defence capability, and some great private investments for our region. The spirit of Tasmania will make Geelong home. Wonderful news. And today, Viva Energy has announced uh, an incredible commitment to establish an LNG gas import terminal. So there are great things happening in our region, and I'm so proud of the work of the Morrison government in how we are delivering for Corangamite, for Geelong, and for South West Victoria. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sacconi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise tonight to speak on a topic that is of great importance uh, to many in, of my constituency back home in Victoria, but particularly those who live in eastern Victoria. The direct value of our port, of the native forestry industry in my home state, is estimated to be in the order of $462 million. And this figure represents the value of growing, harvesting, hauling and processing native timber. Whilst this is a significant enough figure in its own right, when you take a moment to think of the industry and to incorporate the processing and downstream economic activity that this figure of output grows, it is quite substantial, and we're looking at the order of $1.4 billion. And I don't think I need to tell anyone in this place just how substantial $1.4 billion industry would be to anyone in any part of regional Australia. In the context of this industry in Victoria and across Australia, we're looking at around 5,000 jobs. The workers who hold these jobs exist in all parts of the supply chain. They're loggers, they're truck drivers, forklift operators, process workers, machinists and salespeople. They're full-timers, part-timers, casual workers and apprentices. In Gippsland, they are the fabric of many communities and they are the backbone of their local areas. Every single one of these jobs is of value. Every single one is important and every single one is worth fighting for. Every kind of worker is important in some way and deserves respect. And anyone who works for a living deserves respect from our community. However, there are some members of our community who don't always share and recognise the value and dignity of workers in certain industries. They look down on workers. They believe that those people are worth less than others. Workers in industries such as forestry, resources and agriculture are not always offered the same respect and acknowledgement that I believe that they are owed. Those workers deserve respect, not only for the basic fact that there is dignity in all work, but because of the contribution that they make to our nation's prosperity, to the way of our life and to our very own existence. We must never forget that. As a senator who represents the state of Victoria, I'm concerned about the future sustainability of the forestry industry. I'm concerned that this industry that is largely under siege by activists and that governments at all levels are not doing enough to make sure that we better support these workers. The recent decision by the federal court putting in doubt elements of the Central Highlands Regional Forestry Agreement only serves to provide further uncertainty to an industry that all of us should be very proud of. Whilst the full impact of this decision is yet to be realised, I know that it is one of great concern to many people living in these areas, especially those out in Gippsland. And many people are counting on these jobs, not just to support themselves or their families, but local communities. I know because I've spoken to them. I have visited these mills. 
I have met these workers. These are real people. I have seen firsthand that this industry is sustainable, despite what we might hear from the Australian Greens. It is an industry that offers rural and regional towns in Victoria a life. All timber workers deserve our utmost respect. The federal court's decision isn't what the forestry industry was hoping for, but it's by no means the only thing that is serving to put the livelihoods of these workers at risk. Nor might I add, it is not the first time that activists have sought to damage this industry by exploiting our judicial system. A report by Deloitte Access Economics in 2017 found that the demise of the Victorian native forestry industry would have significant impacts beyond its mere economic footprint. It argued that the native hardwood industry is an important employer in regions where limited alternate employment exists and that without it these regions would suffer and there would be significant negative social impact. We cannot allow this future to be realised and workers in this industry should know that they can count on us in this place and in the other place to work cooperatively and with those in many state governments around Australia to protect their livelihoods. After all, that is why people elect us to parliament. And we should also honour the dignity of their work. Madam Acting Deputy President, all workers have an important role in Australia's success and national prosperity, and we should be supporting them to succeed. There is nothing to be gained in undermining the industries that they belong to or attacking these workers for simply making a living. For creating wealth and bringing stability to the future of our nation. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy Madam President. You are abusing the public's trust. That's what you're doing. You are selling us out in darkness for profit. Every single election pamphlet you print out should have to have a little message on the bottom of it. This pamphlet was paid for with dirty money. You think the voters are idiots. You think you can just keep hiding this from them and nobody will do anything about it. Well, I've got bad news for you. We see what you're doing. We all know that every time the Liberal and Labor Party get together to work on our donation laws, the loopholes get bigger and bigger. They're so big these days that you could just about drive a jumbo jet through them. And we're seeing it happen again this week. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the latest in a long line of betrayals in the public's trust. It's a bill that would change our electoral laws that was introduced by the government last week. It would completely undermine strict rules on political donations in states like New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. And I have a sinking feeling that the Liberal Party and Labor want to rush it through without even sending it to an inquiry. Won't that be another shameful day? And I've got that feeling because that's exactly what they're going to do. The bill would let the major party branches ignore the donation laws in their state or territory by claiming that they're using the money for federal purposes. What a load of rubbish. Just write for the feds on the brown paper bag and you can give whatever you want, no matter who you are. Just like magic, you can get a free pass from the state laws. State branches of the major parties get to say, we don't accept dodgy donations, while well, they're accepting them behind the scenes the whole time. It is designed to give politicians the chance to get money from developers while they say they never received it. Nothing to see here. It's designed to let them get away with keeping us all in the dark about where they get their money from, like it isn't already dark enough. I can't help but wonder, was the October Queensland state election in Minister Cormann's mind when he introduced this legislation? Because it will almost certainly benefit the LNP up there. You can bet your bottom dollar on that one. And Minister, do you reckon Queensland voters are OK with being sold out like this, or did you simply hope that they wouldn't notice? The sad fact is that Labor is on it too. 
The major parties are working out a deal to avoid even a hint of public scrutiny because they know that if this bill went to a committee inquiry, they'd get torn to shreds. They know that it will expose what they're really trying to do here and what they're up to. Well, here's a message to the Labor senators. If you don't finally grow a spine, especially after the last 48 hours, and insist that this bill goes straight to a full committee review, you might as well pack your bags up and go home, because you're all but done for the next election. Because if you wave this through, voters will finally know for sure that we don't really have an opposition party in this parliament any longer. We've suspected it for a long time, and I'm sorry to have to say that. For a long time, we've seen that the opposition will roll over for the government like dogs if it suits both political interests. I'm sick of these politicians who think they can buy their seats and not tell us where they got that money from and be transparent with the public about that. Seriously, you're just letting yourselves be bought and sold by the highest bidder. And the only thing missing in Pali these days is the auctioneer. Two months ago, thousands of people stood in their driveways at dawn and said, we will remember them. Three years ago, Jesse Bird was alive. Jesse enlisted in 2007 and was deployed to Afghanistan in 2009. Two months later, Jesse's friend is killed by an improvised explosive device. Jesse came back in 2010 and his mum, Karen, said he was different. He was moody, he was distant, he was evasive. On his post-service health examination, he said he was, on, he was binge drinking and wasn't sleeping. Nobody in DBA screened his psychological health. Defence didn't hand over the recommendation from Jesse's occupational health and safety report, saying that he needs ongoing psychological treatment. His sister didn't know about it. As a matter of fact, he got the all clear. His partner at the time, Connie, said he was having night terrors and mood problems. She told him he had PTSD and that he should go and see someone about it. She helped him approach DVA for help. In 2016, they had a miscarriage. It broke both of their hearts and not long after their relationship broke down. Jesse's family was scared that he was suicidal. His trauma was due to his service. It was due to his status as a veteran. He needed his department to be there for him. And for a while, it seemed like they would be. DVA accepted liability for Jesse's claim. They acknowledged they'd received Jesse's needs assessment form. But he doesn't hear anything further from them. This whole time, Jesse is telling his volunteer advocate that he feels like a burden. His advocate calls DVA to tell them he thinks Jesse is suicidal. He says it's due to money. He says it's due to the time it's taking to process Jesse's claim. Jesse hasn't heard anything for months as he lodges another claim for financial help. DVA acknowledges they've received it. They arrange for a doctor to check if Jesse qualifies for support. He meets the doctor in November. The doctor says Jesse isn't stable. DVA rejects Jesse's claim for compensation. And Jesse learns about it, like so many others, from a letter. Nobody explains the decision. Nobody explains he has a right of appeal. And here's the brutal, brutal truth of it. DVO's own policy manual says Jesse should not have been rejected once again, like so many others. It should never have happened. That letter should not exist. Instead, it does, and it arrives, and he opens it, reads it, and he is shattered. He's absolutely shattered. He's devastated. DVA was the last, last little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, and in one letter, the light's gone out. Jesse writes to DVA and says, I've come close to becoming another suicide statistic. I've done my time and now I need your help. I've done my time, now I need your help. DVA sends another email back to Jesse, and you wouldn't guess it, like many others, they get the email wrong. I just don't know how they do that. Nobody in DVA does anything about Jesse's threat of suicide. Nobody still today 
Like Jesse, bothers to follow up. Jesse is dead two days later. He's found alone in his room, wearing his uniform, duty first, printed on his jumper. He's surrounded by his medals, his military equipment and his DVA claim rejection, rejection letter, the one that should never have existed. Why did Jesse deserve this? How the hell do we let a veteran who's given everything to his country, who has served us with all he can give, die alone in a room broken and bankrupt, covered in letters saying he deserves absolutely nothing? Three years ago, the department lost Jesse. Since then, they've lost more than at least they've lost at least 150 more, and I'm being conservative. The scale of this absolutely breaks my heart. Jesse's family wants a royal commission because they know there is no other way to get to the heart of what's breaking and taking our bravest. It needs independence, transparency, full powers and authority. It needs a royal commission. It's going to take more, it's going to take more than what the government has announced. It will take more than a cut price coroner and a review into the last 17 reviews from the last 17 years. Why would you put a place why would you put in place a commissioner that doesn't pick up a pen and start doing his job until the veteran is already dead? Who does that? Who does that? It's been three years since we lost Jesse and he should be here. He should still be here. Politicians get photographs saying, lest we forget. Well, guess what? You forgot and you're still forgetting. We failed Jess and we'll fail another veteran this week and next week and the week after. We failed Dave. We failed Michael, we failed Ian, and we failed Daniel. And every week we fail them, we break that pledge. We let ourselves forget. Every week we accept some cut-rate coroner instead of a royal commission into veteran suicide, and we break that pledge. Well, I'm not breaking it, and I refuse to lay down and break it. So this is my line in the sand, lest we forget. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last Wednesday, 10 June, I spoke here in the Senate about the Australian construction giant Lendlease, particularly about the fact that while the company has generated tens of billions of dollars in revenue and profit before tax, has raked in a billion dollars of federal government construction contracts and are now dipping into the JobKeeper wage subsidy, they haven't paid any corporate tax for years. Not a brass razoo. I had some strong things to say about the chair of the Lend-Lease board, Michael Ulmer, who, had, who has quite wrongly been honoured with an AO for a long career of corporate number crunching and pursuit of profit without social conscience. Predictably, this didn't go down well with Lend-Lease. These corporate executives rarely like to have the spotlight turned on them, at least not unless it's been directed by their own team of PR flunkies. Last Thursday, the day after that speech, I received a letter from Mr Orman and the then lease group CEO, the managing director, Steve McCann. Now, I hadn't mentioned Mr McCann in my speech last week, and it was remiss of me not to do so, so I shall fill in some details about him now. Steve McCann has been with Lendlease for 15 years and CEO since 2009. Prior to his appointment as the Chief Executive Officer, he was Lendlease Group's Finance Director and Chief Executive for Lendlease's investment management business. McCann, like his boss Mr Ulmer, is a lifelong corporate number cruncher. Prior to joining Lendlease, he had 15 years' experience in property, funds management and investment banking. With degrees in finance and law from Monash University, he's a member of the Business Council of Australia and the Property Council of Australia. McCann appears to lack the social pretensions of his boss. He's not on the board of any symphony orchestra or art gallery. He doesn't feel the need to cloak his corporate wheeling and dealing with some engagement with high culture. Instead, he enjoys the country air at his sprawling mansion once used on the Biggest Loser TV uh, series in the exclusive Sydney suburb of Duffy's Forest. And if you've done as well as, uh, as McCann has as a corporate accountant and lawyer, you can certainly indulge in your hobbies, which in his case are racehorses and punting. 
Although he's been described by, the, uh, by other investment bankers as one of, our finest, uh, one of the finest leaders in business, it's hard to see McCann as any sort of corporate exemplar. After all, his single achievement has been to radically minimise Lend-Lease's corporate tax liabilities to the point of not paying corporate tax for the last five years. Just to recap, and this is according to the tax officer's tax transparency data, over the last five years, from 2013-14 to 2017-18, Lend-Lease generated $43 billion in revenue and in, in, in that period, and they didn't pay a cent in corporate tax. There's lots and lots of greyness, and you ought to come along to the, uh, the Senate Economics Committee and listen to the Tax Commissioner as he talks about the, dis the, the difference between uh, being uh, responsible and being unlawful. And then you might learn something. Just to, so they realised um, a profit before tax of more than five billion dollars, delivered an annual a return on equity for security holders of 11.7 per cent, and returned security holders over two billion dollars. But again, not a cent of corporate tax paid. Lend-Lease's own reports show that they still uh, paid no tax in 2018 and 2019, and they don't expect to pay. Uh, any for, uh, for any time soon. Now, in their letter to me last Thursday, Lend Leases Board uh, Chairman Ulmer and CEO McCann remonstrated at some length, pointing out that uh, for the 10 years prior to 2014, Lend Lease paid more than $400 million in corporate tax in Australia. That may well be so, but in effect, Mr McCann has underlined the fact that Lend Lease stopped paying corporate tax shortly after he became the CEO and managing director. Ulma and McCann were also keen to highlight that in uh, 2019, Lendlease paid, collected and remitted uh, $384 million of direct and indirect taxes, plus $446 million of employee PAYG withholding taxes in 2018-19. I'm not sure, quite sure what their point is here. Perhaps it's news to Lendlease, but employees' PAYG tax is actually paid by the employees, by the workers, and they're, yet they're, they're claiming that that's been paid by them as Lend-Lease. That's their warped sense of social responsibility. That isn't Lend-Lease paying tax. Ulmer and McCann further emphasised that over the five years a period from uh, to June 2018, the company made distributions of approximately $1.9 billion, uh, billion to security holders in Australia. Lend-Lease estimate the tax ultimately payable will be in the vicinity of $225 to $325 million for resident security holders. But again, that isn't tax paid by Lend-Lease. That's pa tax paid by its investors on their gains. Perhaps the most striking thing in Len Lease's letter, however, uh, is the company's unembarrassed confirmation that they're accessing the JobKeeper scheme, sucking off the taxpayer. According to Len Lease, some 15 per cent of its 9,200 workers, that's some 1,400 employees, are being paid through the wage subsidy program administered by the federal government. Len Lease claims that it's strictly in line with government guidelines and the JobKeeper legislation. That may be so, but it's an extraordinary state of affairs. Not, notwithstanding the COVID-19 pandemic, Lend-Lease's business is proceeding apace, especially construction work for the Defence Department. According to the Australian government's own figures and announcements, Lend-Lease is a company that's been awarded nearly $800 million in federal construction contracts uh, so far this year in 2020, and it's only June. So you've got to ask, how can a company that's receiving hundreds of millions of dollars in government contract work and pays not a cent in income uh, tax on billions of revenue, should be allowed to milk taxpayers of, uh, through JobKeeper? It doesn't make any sense, and it's not moral. It might be legal. So it's a good question for Len Lee, and it's a very good question for the government too. 
And with respect to Lendlease's lucrative retirement village business, the vehicles for the company's most impressive tax dodgers, uh, uh, Mr Ulmer and Mr McCain are keen to shift responsibility onto the ATO, arguing their approach has been informed by the ATO's relevant ruling covering development, operation, uh, purchases and the sale of retirement villages. Perhaps, but Len Lee's self-serving interpretation of that ruling has been problematic. Ulmer and McCann point out that Len Lee's has provided input to the con consultation process on the draft tax determination issued by the, tax, the ATO in November last year. Well, I can imagine that's, uh, that, that they've been very active in this. Companies like Lendlease have deployed uh, legions of tax lawyers and accountants to push back at the ATO's efforts to counteract aggressive tax planning and minimisation. As I said last week, the ATO may yet catch up with Lendlease. We'll have to wait and see. In closing their letter, Ullman and McCann expressed a desire to meet with me to discuss their tax, the company's tax affairs and their utilisation of the JobKeeper wage subsidy, and they said they'd await my response. Well, I'm happy to meet with them. And the first question I'm going to ask them is how they th think their, their, their warp perspective that uh, they pay PAYG when they don't. It's workers that do that. And we'll ask them when they're going to change their business model to uh, have a socially responsible uh, position where they contribute to the very environment in which their company thrives. In conclusion, I should add that Len Lease's correspondence is, is part of a counter-battery fire that I've been encountering in response to my campaign to shine the light on corporate tax dodging. Business giants aren't used to seeing some political shell file lobbed about their co corporate headquarters. They don't like being named in parliament. They're more used to politicians quietly knocking on their door and holding out a begging bowl asking for political donations. So when someone like me comes along and puts in a few rounds to highlight their personal responsibilities as directors for amoral tax dodging uh, strategies and lack of social responsibility, they tend to feel a bit wounded. And some form of counter-attack uh, usually drafted by their corporate minions generally follows. Now, I expect a few more shots, but I won't be deterred, and I will be calling out more corporate tax dodges. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to acknowledge the fact that Queensland Day occurred on the 6th of June 2020, and what a, uh, what a great day Queensland Day is. It's the day that Queen Victoria signed the letters patent which established the new state of Queensland, named in the honour of, of course, Queen Victoria. And on the coat of arms of Queensland, there's a sheaf of wheat to represent Queensland's agricultural uh, past and future, heads of a bull and a ram as well to reinforce that fact, two stalks of sugar cane, a column of gold arising from a heap of quartz to signify the importance of mining to my home state of Queensland, and also our state motto, or dax at fidelis, or dax at fidelis. I'd be impressed if any of my colleagues can do the Latin translation. Uh, I'll admit I had to go to uh, the Latin English dictionary. It means bold but faithful, bold but faithful. And it does. It's a motto which does reflect my home state of Queensland. Bold but faithful. Or dax at fidelis. And my home state of Queensland needs to be bold and also faithful as it comes out of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to mention here in this respect that the state Liberal National Party opposition has a bold plan which is faithful, which is faithful to Queensland's past. Bold but faithful. And this plan was outlined by the opposition leader, Deb Frecklington, in the Courier Mail in an article on 16 June 2020. And I'd like to share some of the highlights from this article with this chamber to reinforce what bold but faithful means. Bold but faithful. The LNP's economic plan for Queensland is far-reaching and ambitious. 
bold but faithful. Firstly, there will not be a single new tax under an LNP government. And that is faithful to Queensland's past as being and we used to we used to have a place of honour as, as Australia's low tax state. That was the Queensland I remember when I was growing up. We used to have a place of honour. We were the low tax state. And so it's faithful to our past for the LNP opposition to have that as a cornerstone of its policy going into the next election. Bold but faithful. Secondly, as well as ruling out new taxes, the LNP will cut red tape, speed up government payments and make sure Queensland firms get their fair share of government contracts. And that again is faithful to Queensland's past. But perhaps the most bold measure, and it is bold, is that the LNP government is proposing what's been referred to as the new Bradfield scheme. Now, this drought-busting project is the brainchild of two visionary Queenslanders. The brainchild of two visionary Queenslanders, Sir Leo Hilsher and Sir Frank Moore. Sir Leo and Sir Frank helped build today's Queensland. They were part and parcel of it. The Queensland I grew up in, they were part and parcel of it. And the state opposition under Deb Frecklington has conferred with Sue Leo and Sir Frank, no one better, no one better to be true to that bold but faithful motto than Sir Leo and Sir Frank. And the new Bradfield scheme would create Queensland's biggest dam and a hydroelectric plant capable of powering 800,000 homes. Bold but faithful. It will hold as much water as 28 Sydney harbours and allow an area larger than Tasmania to be irrigated in outback Queensland. It's a bold scheme. It's a bold scheme that's being put forward by Deb Frecklington and the LNP state opposition. A bold scheme, faithful to Queensland's past. Bold but faithful. And as Deb Frecklington says, the scheme is bold. It won't be cheap. But Queensland will get tens of thousands of jobs in return. Tens of thousands of jobs in return. And that's the vision which Queenslanders are looking for. That's the bold vision which is faithful to Queensland's past that Queenslanders are looking for. The LNP will also back a further four new dams, including the Nalinga Dam, Rookwood Weir, Urana Dam, as well as raising the Burdekin Falls Dam. It is time for the state of Queensland to build dams. Queensland needs to build dams. The current government under Premier Palaszczuk aren't building dams. They're actually in the process of lowering the dam wall at Paradise Dam. They're lowering the dam wall at the Paradise Dam instead of building dams. The Paradise Dam needs to be repaired, it needs to be rectified, and it needs to continue to provide water security to all the fruit and vegetable growers in the Bundaberg region. But in addition to that, Queensland needs to build dams. It needs to approve projects. Build dams, approve projects. It is a disgrace that the, Ackland, the new stage of the Ackland coal mine has been in an approvals process for 12 years. 12 years acting, Madam Deputy President. We need to build dams, approve projects, and thirdly, we need to open the state border. We need to open the state border. And this is a matter which I raised last week, and I moved a motion in this place, which was co-sponsored by the other five senators from the Liberal and National parties from Queensland, and which was passed in this chamber. And there were comments made by the Premier of Queensland in relation to opening the borders. But unfortunately, unfortunately today, in question time in the Queensland Parliament, we've seen pa Premier Palaszczuk backsliding, backsliding. And we're back into this world of timidity, timidity and incoherence. People of Queensland do not have, do not have a firm plan from their Premier as to when the Queensland border is going to open. And don't just believe me. 
The headline in the Brisbane Times this afternoon was Palaszczuk walks back from the original border benchmark. That's the headline in the Brisbane Times. So last week, after National Cabinet, I thought Premier Palaszczuk had realised she needs to open that state border for the good of the tourism industry in, on the Gold Coast, for the good of the tourism industry in Cairns and everywhere else in Queensland. That state border needs to be opened. But today, in the Queensland Parliament, under questioning from Deb Frecklington, the opposition leader, she appears to have, not my words, Palaszczuk walks back from original border benchmark. That's the, that's the headline in the Brisbane Times. It's absolutely, it's not bold but faithful. It's timid and incoherent. But that's not the motto of my home state. The motto of my home state is bold but faithful, not timid and incoherent. And it isn't just the Brisbane Times. The Courier Mail headline this afternoon, and the Courier Mail, I pay tribute to the Courier Mail for running very hard on this issue. Their headline is Premier's stunning claim on border closure. Not my words, Courier Mail's words. Premier's stunning claim on border closure. And this is a quote from this article. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk has made a stunning claim about the border closure despite howls of protest from Queensland businesses. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk has claimed most Queenslanders fear a second wave of the coronavirus pandemic and do not want the borders opened. I have absolutely no idea on what basis she makes that claim. The Queenslanders I talk to want to see their state, want to see their state go ahead. They want to see that state border opened. They want to see the thousands and thousands of Queenslanders employed in the tourism industry have an opportunity to go back to work. But Premier Palaszczuk seems to be backsliding. My good friend, the Surface Paradise MP, John Paul Lambrook, said the Premier had indicated the border won't open until there is no active transmission. No active transmission at all. What sort of standard is that? And as he says, is it to be July, September or whenever? Queensland needs to return to its motto. Queensland needs to return to its motto Bold but faithful. Thank you. Senator Davey. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Next Monday, it will be 100 years and six months to the day since the formation of the Federal National Party of Australia, and I rise to mark this milestone. We are the second oldest party in this parliament, having been formed on the 22nd of January 1920. And I'm sure those in the oldest party, the Labor Party, can attest that to continue for an unbroken 100 years is no mean feat. Our party has been written off virtually since its inception by opponents and detractors. But we have survived the decades. We have survived the challenges by adapting to changing economic, political, social and demographic circumstances. Our party has broadened its base, changing its name from the original country party to the national country party and then the national party, to reflect the changes in country Australia and the regional industries that underpin our national economy—farming, forestry, mining and tourism, to name just a few. Over all incarnations, our party remains an important an influential contributor to Australian politics while remaining committed to its founding values. We are a specialist party. We are a regional party and we make no apology. We don't contest metropolitan seats and we have no intention to. Commentators often like to highlight that our primary vote is notionally lower than that of, for example, the Greens. But that's not surprising. The Greens contest nearly all the seats in the House of Representatives, whereas we generally contest fewer than a quarter and only in regional areas because that is who we're interested in representing. Of course the Greens will have a higher primary vote, but they don't win. We do. At the federal election last year, we contested only 30 
House of Representatives seats, and we won 16. The Greens contested nearly every seat and won just one. Other parties spent more and had even less success. In fact, in our 100 years in this parliament, we have contested a total of 1,192 House of Representatives seats at general elections, and we've won 617. That is a success rate of nearly 52 per cent. Our lower house numbers have ranged over the time from a low of nine in 1943 to a high of 23 in 1975. Indeed, since 2007, contrary to the recent callers of our demise, our lower house numbers have increased from 10 to 12 to 15, and we currently have 16 members of the other place and five here in the Senate. We have held our ground and in doing so have succeeded in delivering for the nation as well as our regional constituents. Our achievements over the years have been numerous. From things like setting up agencies that are still in existence today, like the CSIRO in 1926, the Trade Commissioner Service, which is now Austrade, in 1934, and the first medical benefits scheme in 1953, which led to our first national health scheme. We've also abolished poor policy, like petrol rationing in 1950 and death duties in 1977. We established Australia's first regional university, the University of New England, in 1954. We've negotiated numerous trade agreements over the years, most notably the Australia-Japan Agreement on Commerce in 1957, which resulted in Japan becoming our largest trading partner from the early 70s right through for about 26 years. And of course, We've ensured, and we make no apology, apology for doing so, the investment of multi-billions of dollars over the years on regional infrastructure such as mobile phones and internet connectivity, roads, railways, regional airports, water infrastructure, health and education. We invest in Aboriginal affairs and, of course, we continue to fight for drought and natural disaster relief. Our success is principally because everyone in the Nats, from branch members on up, are centrally focused on fighting for better services, facilities and opportunities for the nearly nine million Australians living and working beyond our capital cities. As a party, we realised very early that if you seriously want to make a difference, if you want to get results on the statute books, you have to be part of government. And that is why we've been a forceful contributor in coalition-formed governments almost continuously since Earl Page signed our first agreement with Stanley Bruce in 1923. Because you don't get outcomes from the sidelines. The nationals are in there, we deliver and we make a difference. From time to time, we've had to flex our muscles to get our way with our coalition partners and that's led to the many successes I've mentioned before. But equally, we've had to have been prepared to support policies that are right for the nation, even when opposed by our own mem members. The tougher gun laws following the 1996 Port Arthur shooting massacre is just one example. So the point is that while we have been and are forceful and punch above our weight, we have been and are a reliable partner. The Nationals have provided three Prime Ministers over the time, Earl Page, Arthur Fadden and John McEwen, each taking on the role in difficult circumstances. They're often denigrated as being only stopgap Prime Ministers, but while their tenure may have been short, they were far from gap fillers each being sworn in in their own right with full authority and each making decisions and taking actions that went far beyond the conventions of a caretaker administration. And what I am particularly proud of is that we are a party that operates on the basis of equality. From our earliest days, we've allowed membership for men and women and everyone is given the chance to progress to the highest levels of our organisation. 
We provided the first ever female president of any political party in Australia with Shirley McCarrow, who led Victoria from 1976 to 1981. And she then went on to become the first female president of any federal party, elected each year from 1981 to 87. We employed the first female director of a party in Australia, Helen Tiller, in South Australia from 1978. And in 1992, we appointed the first female federal director of a party, someone I'm proud to call my friend, Cecile Ferguson. Today, more than 28 per cent of our parliamentary party are women, and here in the Senate, that ratio is 80 per cent. And we've done all of this through equal opportunity, not through quotas. I am biased. I am believe in a party whose values I share, whose achievements I applaud and whose history I am proud of. For one reason or another, I've grown up with the National Party, and I'm proud to say that I can, uh, proud that I can say I've known every federal Doug leader from Doug Anthony on. I worked for a while with Ron Boswell, who served in this place for 31 years and who I was delighted to see was appointed as an officer in the Order of Australia in this year's Queen's Birthday Honours. In conclusion, I quote from a 1950 country party brochure titled Mileposts, which said, you can't afford to be without a country party. Thank your stars, there is a country party. Change that name from country party to national party and the statement remains as true today as it was in 1950. You need a national party to deliver for the regions, to take the focus away from the cities and make sure that those nine million Australians are not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise this evening to talk about the importance of industrial development in the northwest of my home state of Western Australia and the challenges facing Australia's world leading resources sector. As many in the chamber are aware, Western Australia is a major economic player within the Australian economy, primarily driven by our globally competitive resources sector. Last year, WA resources sector posted record sales of $167.3 billion. That was almost $200 billion shared by every Australian. A May 2020 report commissioned by the Minerals Council of Australia estimated the total royalties plus company tax payments from the minerals sector was $39.3 billion in the 2018-2019 financial year. This is $8 billion more than the previous year and a taxed and royalty dividend that benefits, again, every Australian. In the same year, WA received $6.22 billion in royalties from the resources sector, and that projection is estimated to increase to $6.37 billion in this financial year. In 2019, the WA mining sector employed a record 133,000 workers, up from 120,000 in 2018. This indirectly creates thousands of jobs in the transport, supply support and service-based sectors throughout the West Australian economy and indeed the whole economy of Australia. Significantly, the mining and resource sector has continued to operate throughout the coronavirus pandemic and greatly assisted many families and businesses to weather this period of great economic uncertainty. This point was well made by one of Australia's most senior officials. During a recent public hearing at the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19, the Secretary of the Treasury, Mr Stephen Kennedy, highlighted the importance of mining to the Australian economy. He said, mining represents 10 per cent of gross value added of the Australian economy and 3 per cent of employment. But Mr Kennedy also acknowledged that the early and decisive action by the Australian government substantially reduced the adverse economic impact of the health response to the pandemic, saying, in Australia, we have been able to continue a wider range of economic activities, such as construction, manufacturing and mining. Some countries have had no choice but to act more aggressively. This view is reinforced by iron ore research analyst Philip Kirschling Kirschlinger, who stated, by keeping the mines open, Western Australia is supporting the whole country. And Iron ore miners are paying company tax, which goes to the federal government, so it's all the Australian people who benefit from the taxes the mining companies pay. 
It is also important to note that both the WA and Australian economies are expected to recover from the impacts of the pandemic sooner as a direct result of the resilience of the mining and resources sector. This is no surprise to many West Australians who have long recognised the wide-ranging benefits this sector has brought to our local economy and our high standard of living. But our mining and resource sector has many facets. Yarra Pilbara, which operates two facilities in the Pilbara region of Western Australia, is a little-known but critical feature of the state's industrial development. The Yarra Pilbara's fertilisers plant is one of the largest ammonia production sites in the world, producing fertilisers which are exported globally. Yarra Pilbara is the operator of the first modular technical ammonium nitrate manufacturing plant located on the Burrup Peninsula adjacent to Karratha. The technical ammonium nitrate facility converts ammonia into ammonium nitrate, a crucial material for mining and resource operations throughout the Pilbara as the main chemical component of industrial explosives. Despite the obvious connection between industrial development and the prosperity of Western Australia and Australia, some operators are now finding themselves the subject of passionate but unsubstantiated claims of environmental vandalism. A powerful example is the poor treatment levelled at Yarra Pilbara by environmentalists and the West Australian state Labor government. In November 2016, the Senate Environment and Communications References Committee established an inquiry into the protection of Aboriginal rock art on the Burrup Peninsula. The inquiry was tasked to examine whether industrial emissions were having an adverse effect on nearby rock art. The inquiry heard from a range of stakeholders, including the CSIRO subject matter experts. It examined Commonwealth State Regulatory Framework, the strict environmental approvals process for the construction and operation of the Technical Ammonium Nitrate Facility Plan and the requirements to undertake extensive air quality and spectral mineralogical monitoring, the independent CSIRO monitoring being conducted to identify risks associated with industrial emissions impacting upon the rock art and the role of the Burrup Rock Art Art Technical Working Group established by the West Australian Government to monitor the heritage rock art sites on the Burrup Peninsula from 2004 to 2016. And finally, it examined the CSIR's, ro CSIR's role in conducting the monitoring work designed and commissioned by the Burrup Rock Art Technical Working Group. Between 2004 and 2016, the CSIRO conducted independent monitoring of colour change and spectral mineralogy and conducted a series of art quality studies to assess, to assess any likelihood that industrial emissions could affect the nearby Aboriginal rock art. Its final report, released in September 2017, concluded that monitoring since 2004 indicated that industrial emissions had had no statistical significant or measurable impact on the rock art. The Senate inquiry was initiated by the Australian Greens and was designed to undermine confidence in the activities of Yarra Pilbara and future industrial development across the Burrup Peninsula. Central to claims by the Australian Greens, aided by the Bob Brown Foundation and others, was so-called evidence presented by Professor John Black that sought to destroy the scientific credibility of the CSIRO's monitoring and findings. For context, Professor Black is a former assistant chief of the CSIRO Division of Animal Production and adjunct professor in veterinarian science at the University of Sydney. He is currently an honorary research fellow at the University of Western Australia and affiliated with the Friends of Australian Rock Art Advocacy Group. Professor Black's criticism of the CSIRO's research was primarily di directed at the methodology applied to measure colour and mineralogy changes at rock art sites. However, Professor Black's submission also addressed health and safety effects of additional pollution from the plant, including nitrate poisoning, carbon monoxide poisoning and risks of ammonium, ammonium nitrate explosion. None of these claims were supported by credible scientific evidence. Further proof of the lack of evidence and unsubstantiated claims of Professor Black has been revealed in recent materials and analysis as part of Yarra Pilbara's licence extension approval overseen by the WA State Government. 
Benchmark Toxicological Services Proprietary Limited was engaged by the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation to undertake an independent peer review of the information submitted by Yarra Pilbara. The review made the following comments regarding Professor Black's claims. It said, John L. Black Consulting did not consider the concerns of other scientific studies about the additional complexities in the atmosphere that might affect the colours of chemistry of gases. On the important point of nitrogen dioxide emissions, Professor Black claimed Yarra's nitrogen dioxide emissions were 23 times higher than the ambient air quality guidelines specified. What did the independent review found, find? It found that this conclusion is alarmist and not scientifically justifiable. It found that the exceedances quoted by John L. Black Consulting in this period occurred as a result of daily recorded high emission levels from calibration of drift span checks, not routine operational conditions. On Professor Black's method for assessing nitrogen dioxide exposure health risks, the independent report said this approach is, I quote, scientifically inappropriate and the outcomes are misleading. Having failed to make a compelling case in front of a Senate inquiry, had their claims repudiated by authoritative and independent advice commissioned by the WA State Government, Professor Black and others have continued their advocacy. This time they have found a softer, more impressionable target in the form of the WA Labor Government Minister for the Environment, the Honourable Stephen Dawson. In November 2017, approximately nine months after appearing before the committee, Professor Black and former Senators Bob Brown and Christine Milne wrote to Ms. Minister Dawson repeating their alarmist and unsubstantiated claims. Madam Deputy President, I look forward to returning to the Senate uh, very, very soon to continue my story about how the WA State Labor Government Minister Stephen Dawson has now become the soft target for environmentalists uh, and those wanting to undermine industrial development across the Burrup Peninsula. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to discuss character, specifically the character of members of parliament. Australia has people that are fine quality, resources in abundance, opportunity potential. We're close to a huge and growing market, yet financially many people are going backwards. The Australian median wage is the wage at the half point. Half the people are above that wage, half the people are below that wage. It's a great way, great way to compare how everyday Australians are faring. Median, in this way, is more representative in this case than average. So the figures I'm about to present are all after inflation, which for the last 15 years was 40 per cent. Over the 15 years to 2017-2018, the medium wage fell 2.4 per cent. We have officially gone backwards, but it gets worse. Everyday Australian families trying to live on an income that is going backwards are paying more to buy their first home. In the last 15 years, in Brisbane, home prices went up 100 per cent. In Sydney, 150 per cent. Yet medium income is $48,000 and falling. How the hell do Australians buy a home on $48,000 per year? For people who do manage to buy a home, it will cost 100 per cent more for electricity now. That's actually slightly more than 100 per cent for electricity now. Kids' education expenses over the last 15 years have gone up 100 per cent. Government fines, state fines, have increased enormously. Speed cameras, for example, are now a revenue-raising device. It's a tax. Government fines are taxes. So that's why people are feeling uneasy, scared, hopeless and lost, because people do not feel heard. People are needing leadership, support, hope. They need solid economic management. Remember, early in our nationhood, we led the world in per capita income. Per capita income, we were number one. Now we're sliding out of the top ten. Why is Australia falling? Because governance is failing the people. Consider the events of the last five days. Senator Hanson, well, I tried to present data this morning. The government denied me the right to present that data in a simple motion, presenting the facts that the government's agency, the Australian Institute of Criminology, developed. Taxpayers funded that data, 
but taxpayers can't hear the data. Does that mean we should sack all, tax, all public servants because we're paying them to do nothing? Because government wants to rely not on data but on opinions. No, we shouldn't sack public servants. But we should have governance in this place that requires policies and decisions to be based on data. Now, the left, and I consider many of the Liberal Nationals to be left, uses unfounded opinions, lies, hate, emotions, fear to control. The Greens, for example, in the last 285 days since I first challenged them, have never provided any evidence for their core policy of climate change. They've never They've never fronted me for a debate that I challenged them to 285 years ago. Senator Waters, I challenged her 10 years ago. She, she jumped to her feet and said she would not debate me. She still won't. Ian MacDonald sat, stood just over there in 2016 and looked across and said he doesn't always agree with me, but he said at least I've had the courage to start the debate on climate science. But no one's wanting to debate because they don't have the data and they know that I do. The Liberal Labor Nationals are chasing the Greens agenda, which is pushing the United Nations Agenda 2030. If you don't believe me, have a look at their policies—2030, compliant with the UN's agenda. The policies of the main parties are same in substance, differing slightly in degree. Liberal, Nats, Labor. The UN Kyoto, is the Kyoto Protocol is the basis for stealing farmers' property rights that both sides of politics do. The UN Rio Declaration and the Ramsar sites and international agreements in the Water Act are the result of both sides of politics. The UN Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement, climate lies and false alarm based for, as the basis for energy policy, both sides of politics. The renewable energy target, the national electricity market, which is really a racket, retail margins inflated, networks gold-plated, privatisation, which is really a tax in Queensland under the Labor government, both sides of politics. We have deregulation, supposedly, and, uh, and what we have now is a profit-sharing plan—sorry, a power-sharing plan for saving the Portland smelter, in which the various privately owned, privatised entities for supplying power are getting together to save Portland. And who will control it? Victorian and federal regulators. So we've seen as a result the destruction of manufacturing and agriculture. Taxation policies, hideous. We've gone, Senator Hanson and I have done them many times. We've exposed them. Economic management is now based on budget cycles to, to annual cycles to, to pay for bribes. We've seen immigration driving up house prices, driving wages down, driving taxes up. We've seen regulations, red tape, green tape and blue UN tape. Richard Court, the Western Australia Premier, in his book Rebuilding the Federation, 1994 Premier of, of, of Liberal, Liberal Premier of WA, has outlined the policies and the process by which the UN has usurped our governance. But let's dig deeper. Barnaby Joyce was the most colourful and effective climate sceptic in this country and in, certainly in this parliament. And then when he sniffed cabinet, he suddenly became an alarmist and allowed Malcolm Turnbull to shower $400 million on his New England electorate for wind farms. Matt Canavan was his chief of staff when, when Barnaby Joyce was in the, off, in the Senate. He became his replacement. And then when he sniffed cabinet power, he became a, a, an alarmist as well. The Nat Nas Nationals, an article going around the newspapers recently, talking about their grandfathers of the party, wonderful people, Fadden, Sinclair, McEwen. The last person mentioned in that article was John Anderson, and he left in 2007 after signing with John Howard and Rob Borbidge the policies that stole farmers' property rights in New South Wales and Queensland. Energy policies, the Liberal Nationals and the Labor Party are implementing the same policies as Trent Zimmerman in the, in the lower house here. Woke Liberal Nationals. Property rights, basically Greens policy, John Howard sold them. Didn't sell them. He stole them. His, his government stole them. Water Act, Turnbull Howard Water Act, destroyed water policy in this country. We went from being the best to being the worst. That's not my view. That's an international expert's view. The Water Act of 2007. Look at the specifics. The Dairy Bill, defence land being stolen until Senator Hanson and I jumped in. The Bradfield scheme. Today we heard the reality. We heard 
someone in this party, in, we had jo uh, Senator Dunningham say that Deb Frecklington, had, and Deb Frecklington was in favour of elements of the Bradfield scheme. Senator Hanson cares. She gets the data. Senator Hanson cares. She speaks out. Senator Hanson cares. She steps up. Thomas Jefferson said, you can have farms without cities, but you cannot have cities without farms. That is still correct. That's why One Nation focuses on property rights. We want restoration or compensation. We were focusing on water, the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, getting that under control and eliminating it, getting rid of the Water Act 2007, the Bradfield scheme. We want to tie water back to the land. Energy, competitive federalism. Competitive federalism will deliver us cheap power. We need to get back to compliance with our constitution. Coal-fired power, hydropower. Taxation, tax multinationals and reform the tax system. Small business, protect small business. Reduce immigration to net zero and, and free up freedom of speech. The real issue in this country is control versus freedom. This parliament is about controlling people. One nation pushes to restore freedom. The bigger picture, our keys are cost of living, which is affecting standard of, standard of living, quality of living, which is about security, future living, which is about infrastructure. We need to do all these three things, but we also need governance, strong governance and res restoration of our sovereignty. We need truth and the government serving the people, not stealing from the people. We need to restore personal rights and freedoms. One Nation believes that government's duty is to provide the business environment for investment that brings employment that is favourable to the people of this, of this country. Instead of serving political careers, that requires serving the people. That requires courage and truth, and that requires strength of character. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.